Hey there, Joshua Hanlon here at Brick Fair Virginia 2019, and I'm with Matt. You might remember his massive uh, Star Destroyer from last year with the detailed interiors that we featured here at Brick Fair, but you're back with another incredible new Star Wars ship this year, so what do you have here? Um, well, I built a lot of Star Destroyers in the past, so I figured it was time to build a Rebel ship, and uh, last time I mentioned that I was working on a, a Mon Calamari cruiser. Um, it's not quite done, but it's, it's getting pretty close, um, so this one it's based on the home one, um, but I called it the MC ADA Independence, which was, according to one encyclopedia, is uh, another Mont Calamari ship that was at the Battle of Endor. And this one, like the Star Destroyers, comes apart, actually a lot easier than the Star Destroyers. Um, and it does have an interior, so I'll, I'll try to show you. Yeah, oh, this is great. So where do you start with this one? You can take out these back sections here like this. And we got some like crew sections and, you know this is uh, definitely based on the home one scene and you can see seat pilots there uh, that came off got Mon Mothma and uh, there actually was a lot less interior space in this shape of a ship than I anticipated um, so I wasn't able to include everything that I wanted to um, I wanted to have like diplomatic quarters and different aliens, but there's just not a lot of space up here um, compared to the Star Destroyers. The Star Destroyers just are so wide at the back, it really gives you a lot of space to do um, whatever you want, whereas this was much more limited. Um, the heads of these uh, Mon Calamari crew members are just, they're right against the edge of the ship, so you can't, you can't go any higher than that. Um, You've also got kind of a, a different sh shape in general here with the, so many rounded parts that you don't have with some of the other dis Star Destroyers. Yeah, that was definitely a challenge. Uh, it, that, I mean, it, the ship took a while. It's been, I've been trying different things for a long time to see what's the best method of doing that. And for the most part, I just use hinge plates. Um, I'll show you those in a second. Uh, we got the engine room back here. Um, there's a functional door that leads into the hangar. Uh, the engine room's not quite done. I'm not quite sure if something should go up here, maybe like a walkway or something, and maybe something in the back. Um, but underneath this uh, crew section, we have start of the hangar bay, and it can carry three of these uh, custom A wings. They're a little bit smaller than the uh, sets, about the size of the Junior's A wing. And actually, use that piece from the, the Junior's A wing. And um, got some crew members walking around down there. Uh, this one's a bit finicky. We'll see if I can take it off. So there's the uh, rest of the hangar bay. Even though there's not a ton of space there, you can even fit some of the smaller ships and minifigs in. Yeah, and Rebel, like, there aren't many um, iconic areas of Mon Calamari ships because we don't see much of them except for the bridge, which we'll get to in a second, and hangar bays. And Rebel hangar bays, I think, are one of the most, you know, distinguishing things that the Rebels have. And they sort of always have their ships, like, catty-cornered and, like, little trucks and things running around. So that's what I tried to, to capture there. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, up front, we have... Um, the bridge, which I couldn't quite capture because there's still a little room, but I got the two guys with their little consoles, and um, I decided to make the captain someone other than Admiral Akbar. Admiral Akbar was actually in the in the crew section back there, um, and there is a swiveling chair. He swivels pretty well, which was really complicated to do actually. You're kind of those rail pieces there to run it back and forth. Yeah, there not only are there rails, but if you put tiles under the rails, it becomes way too tight. Um, so there are actually, these are like those one by four panels under there that are like going side to side, sort of snot. It just, that took way longer than I thought it would to just do a swivel chair. Um, and then we can remove that. We sort of have a atrium or a swimming pool because I figured that Mon Calamari need water because they're like water people. Um, and, and there is a cross-sections book that actually shows an atrium with a lake in, uh, in, a Mon Cal in the home one actually. Although it's more of like a pine tree type forest in there, um, in that one. Um, 
I didn't have room enough to include trees, so I went with a tropical theme instead. Um, I like it. It's like a whole swimming pool on the ship. Yeah, and you got uh, you got Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and Princess Leia in there, and I figured that Luke never learned how to swim because I assume there are no <laughs> swimming pools on Tatooine, so he's got all his uh, swimming gear, and maybe Han is making fun of him. I'm not sure, but. Uh, I mean, that's probably my favorite room in the ship, <laughs> even though some of the early feedback I've gotten is that people don't quite get why there's a pool in the ship, um, but I really like it. Um, it's, it's very unexpected when you open up a, a Star Wars ship. So that was, I mean, that was the deal, like deal breaker room. I really wanted some water in the ship. Um, what do we have in front of that? This section's not quite done, but I did get my little uh, poker or sabak table in there. Um, this sort of makes it a little more visible, some of these things come off. It's supposed to come off in one chunk, but here we go. So you got L Lando playing with some aliens and uh, an interdimensional traveler. <laughs> There's nothing up front yet. I might include maybe like a droid repair station, something up there. That's so much, uh, you know, awesome stuff you're able to include in there, even in a smaller space. So, talk about the overall design of this ship, though, with those rounded edges. How were you able to achieve that? Um, there's just tons and tons of hinges. Uh, lots, like if you were to remove this, it's just hinge plates on each of these segments. It has uh, four hinge plates. Um, they stay pretty rigid. There will be something like this uh, cheese slope keeps it rigid. Um, so the ship is. Uh, Overall, pretty rigid, and each of these segments is really strong, so you can't crush it up and down. Um, to transport, the whole ship splits in half, which makes it really easy, compared to the Star Destroyers, actually, because the Star Destroyers, the frame stays in one chunk, so you always have to move that huge frame chunk, which is really heavy and has sharp edges and stuff. Um, but I can fit this whole thing in a big plastic bin once it comes in, uh, once it breaks in half. Um, these things come, I mean, trying to figure out what the easiest way to show how it's built is, but, and these are pretty simple. These are just these regular hinges. And you got tons of brackets all over the place. Right, and you can make it, uh, you know, use all those pieces together, make it pretty strong. Yeah, and you got um, each of these segments is on hinges as well. A lot of snot in there, sort of. You got studs going up top and studs to the bottom. These are generally mirror images of each other, top and bottom. So. And then you have it on the, the nice stand here as well. So do you kind of build all your ships that way so they aren't just sitting on the table? Um, this one can sit on the table, uh, but I just it's the stand is just to make it easier to view. Yeah. Um, unlike the Star Destroyers that have the, the uh, you know, the like tile and plate, uh, you know, panels that go up and down, the, the ship won't be, at, or those panels won't be able to hold the weight of the ship. So it has to be on stands, otherwise the ship would collapse. Whereas this one, the bottom is, pr you know, sort of flat at a certain point and you can, you could rest it on the table. And it's involved in a little conflict here. So what do we have going on there with the, the aggressor over there? Yeah, so you saw that ship last year, that's the aggressor. Um, it's roughly to scale with a Mon Calamari cruiser. And uh, I just figured I'd set up a little battle if I had table space to do it. <laughs> so I threw, um, those are supposed to be shield impacts there. And uh, the aggressor is firing some missiles. But the aggressor is losing. It's a smaller ship. So uh, taking some battle damage. There you go. Yeah, it's awesome to see such big ships like this, you know, actually set up in kind of a battle like that. You don't see that very often. No, certainly not with a Mont Calamari cruiser. <laughs> <laughs> so I know this is, you got the, the Mont Calamari cruiser here is the latest one. Do you have plans to continue in this type of idea with kind of interiors and big Star Wars ships? Uh, no current plans. I mean, this one still is not quite done. There are a couple of things on the exterior that I'd like to rework. I mean, just for an example, like we've got this front section here and it's sort of I've worked on this gap. I've revised that like three times, how that connects that gap between this part and this part. 
and I'm still not totally happy with how it is. Uh, so I may take another crack at it. Um, still got a couple interior bits to work on too. But it'll be done eventually, and then I'm not sure what's next. Hey everyone, Joshua Hanlon here at Brick Fair Virginia 2019, and I'm joined by David Hall and his massive crate build here. Now, some of you who watched our studio tour and interview with David from last year might remember seeing this partly done in those videos, so we'll link to those in the description below. And you can see some of that and get a more in-depth look at uh, the work David has done. But today, David, why don't you take us through the finished crate build here? I know, it's so exciting <laughs> to finally see it done. Um, you were mentioning this earlier, Joshua. This is like a Brick Fair Virginia exclusive. It only comes to this convention, and that's it. Destroying it right after on the, on the Sunday uh, afternoon. So I'm actually excited to destroy it because I really put a lot of pieces in this. Um, estimated to be definitely over 100,000 pieces, uh, maybe 125,000 at max. Um, but I definitely know for a fact that there's at least 30,000 pieces in the uh, what I call the fractal pieces. Um, they're basically just a bunch of triangles that kind of mesh together to, it's like a snot technique, but like also like kind of, I don't know, a pattern at the same time um, to like replicate that. Um, it's like the, you know, the salt deserts of Colombia is what they base this whole um, scene which, by the way, it's the Battle of Crate from The Last Jedi. Just in case you hadn't <laughs> caught on to that yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, yeah, no, they based, uh, based the actual scenery and landscape uh, off the salt fields uh, from Columbia. Or I think it's Columbia or somewhere in South America, I believe it's where it's from. So I kind of took inspiration from that as well as the movie uh, to kind of replicate the ground design. Um, this is just, I threw a lot of techniques into this thing because not only do you have the weird snot technique with tiles and stuff, um, you also have tr a trench that isn't, uh, it, it's not 
not like straight. It's at a very weird angle. It's like a slight 15 degree angle going each way. That was a huge challenge creating that um, and making these these turrets actually fit perfectly. Somehow I built something that just made them straight with the 15 degree angle and it just worked that way. I don't know. Lego can be magical. You just sometimes. get lucky like that sometimes. Exactly. Exactly. So that kind of just that worked in my favor. But there's other like weird techniques in this model. Like um, under this giant wall here, you'll see that I have this kind of um, transition type of thing where I'm going from the salt pieces to like the inner uh, base, I guess. And you can see I like really went weird because you have to have two different like kind of curving, uh, I don't know even what to call it, just curving, you know, plates and such. And to connect the two like was a really weird technique with like um, the one by twos with the middle uh, stuff. What's the exact name for that? Is it just like a modified? It's like one by two modified on BrickLink. Um, but yeah, so I used like a bunch of those and like studs. It's a really weird technique I came up with. It's super fragile. I think when I was rebuilding it here at the convention, it broke like at least five or six times putting it down there. So definitely a bit of a challenge. What's actually funny is when I brought this to the convention, so this whole front part here is three sections. So you have the mountain, this wall, and another mountain. So it's three different sections. When and the, when I put the mountains up and got them set up, they, they were pretty much okay. But this whole wall actually crumbled in half right when we took it out. And thankfully, my two friends, Meredith and my girlfriend, Meredith, and my friend, uh, Matt, the Brickways, you guys know him. Yeah. Um, they actually literally held the wall for 45 minutes while I rebuilt it. Like, I was like, these are my, I mean, my, my, it's my girlfriend. But then, like, Matt just showed his true friendship right there. And I was like bro. That's so nice of you. This so, is yeah. why it's a Brick Fair exclusive and you aren't bringing this to a bunch of different shows. Exactly. It's just so fragile. And I, I, I live two hours from here, so I can't imagine taking it any further than this, what it would be like. Um, it just, you know, I tried to make it as strong as possible, but, you know, it's just so much complicated stuff to like, to reinforce it more, to take it to other conventions, just to be a lot more work. But I'm, I'm ready to to put it in, in the past. <laughs> Let the past die. That's a Star Wars uh, Force, uh, Last Jedi reference. So, um, But yeah, no, a bunch of other features is this whole battle, it is at, uh, like, it's obviously inspired off the Last Jedi's, you know, final act with the Battle of Crate, but it's a more enhanced battle. So you'll notice that there's a lot more snow troopers. Maybe there's a lot more um, rebel troopers. And, you know, the way I have things kind of lined up, everything's kind of pushed together a little bit, mainly because of space and what I what I was kind of allowed to do within, given my constraints of the room that I built this in. So everything's kind of a little bit different than what the, you actually see in the movie. Um, but I like to think of it as like the more epic battle. Um, like kind of beefed the whole thing up a little bit. Exactly. It's like what I wanted to see on film. And don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the battle on screen, but like this is just even more like basically creating what I wanted to see. Um, and yeah, I'm really enjoying it. And then there's all kinds of little details. So uh, right here specifically, there's this really awesome um i'm really proud of this actually there's like this uh like trench that basically goes underground and if you guys ever played like the star wars battlefront 2 game the new one um then you'll know that there are trenches like this they don't show them in the movie but in the in the game there, there are and they're very much part of the gameplay of that of this particular map uh so i wanted to introduce that element so you'll see i have like a whole cave running through here on the side and i've really gone with it and just had a lot of fun. I know the kids coming around here in Brick Fair have just loved looking through this and seeing what's going on, but it's kind of actually really dark in here. You have a uh, flamethrower troopers coming in and just burning these poor rebels. And there's even like, you can't really see it in the light, unfortunately, but there's like a rebel trooper just knocking, just trying to survive, just trying to escape through that one door and you just feel so bad for them. So just little details like that. I, I wanted. I like to how this in. scene is right at the height where kids can see, you know, just get the best <laughs> shot of the, the flamethrower. I mean, they can't really see it. So we're, we're all good we're all good but but everybody on beyond the brick now knows <laughs> a little bit of dark humor um so yeah i'm having fun with that so yeah very fun with the the battle landscape uh, i should also mention that the uh the atm 6s so you have the um the, the atats here are the lego set that came out i think it was like 2010 um, but the atm 6s are custom i didn't actually design them i got it from a, a designer uh, i forget his name it's like michael it's, it's, and it's not even michael it's uh he's like from sweden he's he's uh he's from Europe, I should say that. Um, but he came out with the design, and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful design, and it works so well with uh, with the scale of both the AT-AT and the minifigures. And I'm, I'm also using the Kylo Ren ship. I, that's another thing that people have also asked me is the actual ship from the movie, both The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. It's black. 
Um, and LEGO has made that mistake. Not just the fact that it's the wrong color, but the wings don't come out. I know Jang Bricks made like a modified version of this. Um, but I just, I like the actual LEGO set. I liked it and I wanted to use it. So I don't know, guys, just deal with it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that's everything in the front. If we come back here, I also spent just as much time, I feel like, on the back area. Now, originally, I had planned on just leaving all of this exposed. Um, be behind this, you can kind of see with my arm going down, it's actually very much empty behind the, the wall. I didn't really do too much filler, just enough so that it, the actual uh, mountain would stay up and all of that. You can actually see a little bit. If I t open this door right here, it's a little hidden door. Um, you'll see that it's pretty empty in here, actually. Um, and you'll see I have a little uh, battery bank right there to power the uh, brick stuff lights. Um, and this room right here is kind of the I iconic uh, room where you see Luke and Leia meet again for the first time in the, in the new trilogy. And you can see uh, Luke over here in the cave. Unfortunately, I have Leia out here, and I'll show her in just a second. Fun little thing about this door, I'm just like so proud of this, is like the way it slides in, you can see I use the little disc plates because if you have the tiles, it can get a little stuck when you're sliding it back in. But using the disc plates, makes it so easy so when you uh, when you put it back in it just works the round part just so much smoother exactly like I'm just the little details I'm really proud of that uh, but yeah so you have the room here and then we have this uh, kind of hanger part outside uh, right here this is kind of where a lot of things are happening again this is where uh, a custom uh, Princess Leia figure is this this thing I think runs like fifty sixty dollars because it's pad printed and it's like only a hundred are made um, but it was worth it because it looks really cool on the mock and I, everybody has really appreciated it um, have a little gantry kind of crane thing going on here troops getting ready um, try to just throw in a bunch of little details I know the a wing there isn't accurate but I thought it looked good um, yeah no, I know I think it's a, I think it's a bunch of fun here. And then the last kind of main detail is I also wanted to replicate the, while the Battle of Crate was going on, you also saw uh, Ray and Chewie and the Millennium Falcon, um, and they were going through the uh, the Crystal Caves is what they call them. And I really actually wanted to replicate that in like, uh, I guess this is mid-scale because it's the mid-scale Millennium Falcon set. I think we got that in like 2009, I believe is when it came out, 2009, 2010. Um, so I actually got this set. And it's actually hanging. You can kind of move it a little bit. Um, and then I have these micro TIE fighters that scale extremely well to this Millennium Falcon. Like, it's actually almost perfect scale. Um, and I was able to kind of replicate the cave around here. I used a bunch of trans red pieces and all of that. Oh. <laughs> and uh, it's just uh, come out pretty well. I'm very happy with being able to just, you know, you have all this kind of area. And I'm like, what do I do with this? And so I think this was uh, a good idea because it actually makes sense because it's really inside the mountain, just like how it is in the movie. So... Little details like that, but um, yeah, that's everything. You got any questions or anything? <laughs> that's a great run through, but this is so massive. So what are the, do you have the, like, the dimensions of the whole thing here? Yeah, so it's a four by six uh, gray base plate uh, that transitions uh, to 60 inches by 90 inches, I believe, because uh, I think 15 inches is how big a gray base plate is. Uh, but yes, four by six gray base plates, 60 by 90. Uh, fun fact, uh, so I recommend this to anybody who builds uh, large dioramas and you're bringing it to convention. This is the first time I did this. You can kind of see it right here on the edge. I have this um, MDF board and I went to, uh, I went to Home Depot and I, I just got one big sheet of it, had them cut, them, cut it up because uh, they come in like four by eight sheets and this is like a weird size where you can't just make it all one big sheet. But I highly recommend you put MDF because it's, uh, you know, at these conventions, you have these tables that are kind of like slightly elevated, slightly differently. And we have a giant, you know, especially like a big battlefield like this and uh, something like this type of structure where you need leveling is a very important. Definitely put down like a MDF board. I wouldn't recommend plywood because MDF just is like so much lighter. It's so like basically a particle board from Ikea. Um, but uh, it's great stuff. It really flattens uh, the table out and you're able to get a perfect uh, flat uh, mock on these on these kind of slightly varying uh, tables. So I'm actually, that was the first time and I'm definitely going to do it in the future. Now with, I know you showed us how hollow a lot of this mountainside is, so with that being so hollow, how do you get this kind of structurally to stand up as you're, you've got a lot of different slopes and stuff and pieces that might not necessarily be easy to stack on top of each other, so how do you keep that from just collapsing as you're doing the build? Yeah, so actually the main thing that's keeping the wall up is, the actual wall itself is very sturdy, if I like put weight on the top it's fine, but what's keeping it up is the side wall, and there isn't another side wall on the other side. It's literally just like a big L shape. Okay. Um, and believe it or not, this is holding the whole thing. I don't know how. I just went with it. And I, as I kept building, I was worried. But 
I mean, you can see how tall it is compared to me. It's very, very big, and it, it's fine. It survived the drive, um, and it worked out. So, uh, yeah, no, it's just one side has this wall, which is keeping this whole wall, uh, you know, structurally sound and together. I should note, like, it is densely built back here, because if it wasn't, then it would crumble. Right. But, yeah. So, you just, if you do that structurally, you don't need a crazy amount of pieces, and you can still get it to stand up. Right, exactly, yeah. So I know on your channel you built this, but basically from scratch, showing it as you went along, right? And you would you would uh, stream that on your channel, right? Yeah, shout out to Solid Brick Studios. Um. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just always interested in that process because I feel like that's that's still within the the grand scheme of kind of the history of the Lego community, a relatively new thing with builders yeah. kind of showing their whole build process, which I think is really neat because then you let people into the whole process. So what do you find that's like for you in kind of the process of building while also kind of interacting with an audience? Um, I, I actually really love it because now that it's finished and everybody can see it at this convention, they can go online, they can go to my YouTube channel, and they can see exactly how I started. And the whole process is documented, basically. Um, so if you're curious, you know, how I made one thing or how I got to one point, you can basically go back and see it. Um, and this is my third mock that I've made, like giant Lego diorama mock on my channel. It was Kashyyyk, Scarif, now Crate. Um, Kashyyyk was by far the biggest. It's still slightly bigger than this one. This one's very big. Um, but uh, each one of those have also been documented. And I can actually see now that this is becoming a trend on YouTube. Like, I kind of started this whole idea of, like, documenting, like, week by week your building of, like, large dioramas. And now it's actually caught on. I know a bunch of other YouTubers are, are starting to do that as well, which excites me. I'm glad um, building doesn't have to be you just by yourself in the basement for months on end. You can actually make something with it for other fans to enjoy rather than just enjoying at that end convention. Right. No, that's a great point. You know, that that community process can be, you know, now from start to finish and not just the few days you're at a show with the build. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's something I think is a really cool concept. And I know other fans have definitely shown it can be a uh, a viable concept so I'm happy to see the community is accepting it and it's becoming a bigger bigger uh, thing um, I'm definitely gonna keep doing it because I, I love doing this stuff it, I, I mean it's so cool to make what you love out of Lego so yeah. yeah and then how parts intensive was this section that you build up kind of the, the main salt flat area here what's that like inside so like everything's hollow <laughs> Um, I'm using, um, what do you call them, the 16 by 16 plates, you know, those yeah. ones. Uh, I think they're all like dark tan plates. I got them real cheap off BrickLink, actually. Uh, someone was selling a whole bunch of them. But, yeah, so they're all, uh, I'd just say, like two by two columns with those uh, plates. So it is the majority, but there are some, uh, the older, what were they? They were like 10 by 10 or 9 by 9 of those. You remember those, like, Technic? They had, like, the Technic pens on the side. Like, the Indiana Jones sets used them. Yeah. Um, those, those plates are in here. The, uh, the wider 12 by 24 brick plates are in here, and they all are just supported by columns. Now, I do have a, a wall of red kind of outlining the whole mock, even on the other side as well, um, just so you don't see in any of that. And there are some densely packed brick areas. It isn't just all hollow. Like, around the, this area, it's more densely packed. And also where the walkers are, there's more, uh, more columns and stuff because you obviously have more weight on it. So that, that was important to think about. Um, but, yeah, so it, it's... It's kind of like a column-based uh, structure underneath, and uh, yeah, I recommend uh, doing that pretty well. I, I actually use tiles on top of the plates, so you know if you take take the salt pieces off, you can start to see all of the two by two tiles. There's probably a good ten thousand of those. Um, yeah, so it's a neat it's a neat structure, and you know a lot of people were wondering that it would take me forever to put these salt pieces together here at the convention. Believe it or not, I just kind of dump it down, and they just do they just work. They just, I just flatten it out, and it looks good. They just naturally do their thing, and, you know, there you go. It's, it's all in nature. <laughs> well, great work, David. I'm so glad we could see the, the completed project here. Uh, it's really impressive. So what do you have planned for the future? Another big build coming down the pipeline? Yeah, so um, because of uh, they have the seventh season of the Star Wars The Clone Wars show coming out this, I uh, be, believe at the end of 2019, I'm doing uh, the Planet of Mandalore. And I know LEGO has made some sets based off Mandalorian stuff, and so this is kind of an exciting thing for me to actually build that planet, um, building like this huge elaborate courtyard with this big you know, palace and such. It's a very interesting planet to build. So that's what's up next. Uh, that I'm going to probably spend the next five months on that, so try to finish that up by the end of the year, and then when Rise of Skywalker comes out, I'm going to try to also build something from that too. So a lot of building in my future. And all of this is being destroyed to make that happen. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so just pumping it right into the next build. But fantastic work. We'll definitely look forward to that. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you, Joshua. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, guys. Everybody.
My name is Robert Larkins. Uh, this is our huge Lego Star Destroyer. You can uh, see it on Instagram at huge Lego Star Destroyer. Easy to find. Um, this is a project my son and I started, although it, mostly I ended up doing most of the work about almost two years ago. So in June 2017, we started building it. It it uh, we started building it. We had built all the huge Lego S Star Wars sets, and we're, we're kind of looking for something big to build. And we found these. LED designs on eBay actually so this gentleman Kurt Epperson Peters to give him credit had designed it in Lego digital design the, the Lego CAD program but it was just the facade no internals or instructions or anything so we got those LED files and decided to try and make it so we ordered probably 28 29,000 pieces off of Bricklink and and uh, we I have about four or five thousand left, so we figured it's about twenty-five thousand pieces. Is what it is. It's eight foot, six inches long, and um, that's a that's an incredible project there. So talk about the process translating from just like the digital facade to an actual physical build that it will stay together that you can display at the show. Well, that that was the process. I mean, first we had to build a structure to support it. So we actually got these those wire shelving units, the fifteen-inch ones, and two eight foot, and zip tied those together, and then build like a a wedge structure for it and then we built the bottom plates and then you can set those in the wedge structure and and then once you kind of got the angle right then we started building the internal structure that fit that angle and making sure that was solid and so we kind of figured it out as we went and then uh, once the whole bottom was done I was trying to figure out how everything was going to be connected so the reality is once the bottom was done, gravity became our friend. So the top panels can just lay on top. So with the studs facing in an opposite direction, it was hard challenging to have it all internally connected. So we ended up just kind of more using stack design. So the top panels and then the, the tower structure is more just stacked on top of the, the bottom. So is it possible to take off one of the panels and show the inside at all here? Sure. So you can kind of see in here then a little bit what it looks like inside. <laughs> it's not as pretty inside, but it's still all gray and black. It's kind of a general lot of like cross beams and structural stuff. Yes, yeah. And we did have to use a little bit of craggle, especially on the long plates because they're, they're mostly made with 16 by 16 plates, which you know, once you get longer than three feet, they we, they tend to pop because the stress there wasn't enough the individual cracks to relieve the stress. So we tried to do it without glue, but then anytime we'd get over four feet, the the wing would kind of crumble. So we had to just do, use a little glue on just the the large wing structures, as well as we put a stiff lattice using the Technic bricks all along the bottom structure. And I did glue that down because I needed some tensile strength to keep. Once we took it off the big support, and now it's only on three supports, then that provided enough stiffness and tensile strength to keep the whole thing up. Yeah, you would definitely need that extra support for a build of this size. So, as you can see, you know, it's massive and gray right here. So, sourcing the parts for this, I'm sure, wasn't easy, finding that many parts in gray. Uh, what was that like for you? Was it difficult to find some of this, these parts uh, to get in the quantity you needed? It, it was a little challenging because... The design was an older design, so it it had all the old grays, like the old medium gray, and so I kind of had to figure out what grays I wanted to use, and so I went with the light blue, and then the the dark, the light bluish gray, and then the dark bluish gray for the the sides, but um, some of the pieces weren't available in that color, so I had to use some old gray mixed in, which I debated doing more mix-ins to make it kind of look old and weathered. So I didn't mind a few pieces being, you know, older gray, but uh, it, it was some challenge to find some pieces. Like to find enough 16 by 16 pieces, I had to order from some guy in Germany, and they're like 250 a piece or something. I need it's like always the German sellers that have it. 270 of them. So, but uh, anyway. And then you've also got the stand down here as well. Was that custom built by you, like just just for the exact dimensions? Yeah, I have I have a friend who's kind of a woodworker and. And so he helped me build this, <laughs> and it worked out pretty good. That's like its own project in itself, right there. <laughs> yeah, it was. So that that was part of the two years. So we we finished actually building it probably early this year in 2019, 
And then with the goal of getting it here, kind of had to figure out, okay, what are we going to support it on stands? How are we going to transport it? How are we going to get it out of the room? So that's been the last couple months is figuring all that out. I believe this is the first show you've displayed this at, right? Correct. It is. First and last. <laughs> so what is the, the process like in terms of transporting this, bringing it in, setting it up, a build of this size? What, how does that work? And so I built it in an upstairs bedroom. So then I realized it was too wide to fit out the door. So we had to take the top structures all off. And then I built a wood frame around it to kind of compress it so that it could turn sideways, which was kind of the scary part because turning the structure sideways, I didn't know if it would just fall apart. But it made it out the door and down the stairs. And, uh, and then we had to rent a U-Haul, we got it all here. And then it took me about five hours on Thursdays to reassemble it back to where it is now. But my wife uh, says it's not welcome back in that room again. So we've been looking for a home for it. And, and uh, likely it's going to go to uh, the Museum of Plastic and Bricks in Ohio. Yeah, a great, a great museum. That should be a great home for it. I think it'll fit in nicely there. Yeah, I was excited to, to have it go to a place that where it would still be displayed and, and see. So so I, I was happy to find somewhere that would take it. I'm not sure what your wife could possibly have that's better than this to display in the oh, house. Well. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, she was patient. It, it, it took, uh, you know, it's taken up a whole room for two years now. And, uh, and mostly I just want people to see it because everyone I know has been to her house and seen it. So... It's just so big, there's just no practical place to put it. Like, we had it in our garage for a while, and then one of our cars had to park in the outside. So, so uh, I was, it's kind of sad to see it go, but I'm happy that I can go visit it if, sometime in Ohio if I ever want to. For sure. So, the Toy and Plastic Brick Museum in Ohio, people want to check this out. That's where it'll be headed in the next couple months here. Uh, he's coming today to get it. Oh, okay. So, so I, I don't know how, hopefully, it'll stay together for him and, and uh, it will be up there. Yeah. Well, perfect. Well, I'm glad you went to the effort to build this and bring it to the show here so we could see it at least one time uh, before it's retired to the museum. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Rich Boy J here back again with the Beyond the Brick video. And today I'm here to present to you my Star Killer base build. Before I get into this, I do have to mention this is only 30% of the full build. I have a full walkthrough of it on my channel. So if you want to see all of the amazing details, all the extra rooms, the trench, the oscillator building, forest, all that stuff, I implore all of you to go check that out. Um, I'm officially, I, I, think I, I think I can afford to take the crown of the largest Lego Star Wars fan build that's ever been made. So I think it's definitely worth your time to go check that out. But nevertheless, here we are. So this is a recreation of the stage section of Starkiller Base. We have General Hux giving his propaganda speech to all the First Order. And this was such a joy to recreate. Once I saw The Force Awakens, I instantly knew I got to build that mock. So when the sets were coming out, I went through and I collected every single battle pack I could. I ended up massing over 100 different battle packs to make this massive figure collection come true. So you'll notice a variety of troops here on the platform. We got First Order Stormtroopers, Snow Troopers, Flame Troopers, Officers, First Order Crew, Pilots, Lieutenants, all that good stuff, they're all here having a good old time, and it makes me happy to finally see all these guys just hanging out together, man. It's just a, it's just a good old time here on Starkiller Base. You'll also notice that the platform is lined by a collection of vehicles. I want to thank Brick Vault for sending me the instructions to these Jarek TIE Fighters. They are awesome builds, and I think they make for an awesome accent piece to these minifigures in the middle of the platform. But I also have to mention my own custom ship. I always make it a point in all of my builds to do some sort of custom vehicle. So I have my first order transporter chilling over there in the corner. That is one of my favorite builds I've done. Um, it's one that is fully snot all the way around. So the design is constructed in such a way where I try to expose the fewest amount of studs. And of course, it has a full interior. You open it up. There's at least, I think, 20 minifigures that can fit into it. So a lot of effort went into not just making this a big build, but also filling in all the little details. One of the things that I took most pride in were the um, snot details and the platform here. You can see that we have some snow that from essentially crosses here. And this isn't something that I just made up. This is actually something that's accurate to the scene in the film. So if you go and you look at the platform, you go ahead and pause those scenes, you'll notice a lot of these patterns right here. And I mean, this could have easily just been, you know, a bunch of mini figs standing on a gray platform. But I, I took that as an opportunity to incorporate some details that I maybe wouldn't have incorporated before. So that's why I went out of my way to have such a uh, somewhat elaborate 
detailing when it came to the snow crosses right there. And even with those little elevators up front, you can see that in Canon, they're actually supposed to go into the table. I went ahead and filled them in with black tiles to give the illusion that they're a little bit deeper than they actually are. And I think those came out well. Um, I really do appreciate how they kind of were consistent with the Death Star wall styling in there with those white bars that go across it. And that type of design is actually continued through the bottom half of the stage portion right there. You can see those little um, sections that jut out of the very bottom of the stage. That also has the light pattern on the bottom. So speaking of stage, let's talk about that. That's obviously the main appeal here. It, even though I built this, I sat there and I placed every single brick here. It is still surreal to see the size of this thing. It's like the size of a small couch. It's like, it is absolutely massive. And I think that that was super important to capture with this scene because it's a massive building in Canon. You look at something like this, and I mean, Lego minifigures are pretty small, but they look minuscule when you compare them to the holistic display of the stage area right there. You notice there's a giant first order banner hanging there. That's actually a custom decal that I had made. A lot of people tell me I could have done it with pieces, and I think I probably could have, but I think it was really important to me to have it look smooth and crisp and perfect. Plus, I mean, stickers come in Lego sets anyways. It's not like I'm breaking any real rules here, but I, I'm actually super happy that I did it that way because one, that logo is so recognizable as part of a scene, and I think having that be such a clean part of it um, just makes the build that much better. What is the construction like on that? Are those kind of flexible banners hanging down there? Um, not intentionally in any way. If you'll notice, you if you attach a bunch of Lego plates together, eventually after a while they'll get kind of a curve just because of just how the, the pieces fit together. So that wasn't something I intentionally did. It just kind of happened that way. But it actually does kind of work. It gives them like a, a flowy type of look, which I think was actually really cool. Um, but if you'll notice on the outside of that, the banners are bookended by two large turbo lasers. Those were massive builds. I think those are probably at least 1,500 pieces each. And I want to say building one of them was fun. Building the second one wasn't as fun because it's, it's just one of those big, monotonous, like, repeat builds that, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's all great, too. It's, it's one thing to do a bunch of small assemblies and repeat them, but when you, you know, basically building a 1,500 build twice in a row, it can become a bit much. But to kind of spice up that process, I went ahead and tried to vary some of the greebling on the side. So you'll notice that uh, the detailing on them are not exact in any way. Um, I wanted to make sure that it looked organic in the build. So the snow detailing is different. And there are also some minor differences when it comes to the greebling on them. Um, but they're massive. Uh, getting the cannons to actually stretch out um, and not sag considerably was quite the feat. But I do think that it came out really well. And they're the perfect accent pieces to the big banners in the middle. Uh, if you look at the um, scene in Starkiller Base, the stage actually goes on probably like two more tables in either direction. So it was really, <clears throat> so it was really a matter of me trying to figure out like what details are essential to capture in just this one space right here. So the banners, of course, were the centerpiece. The two turbo lasers, of course, were super important to incorporate, um, and the mountains as well. I think that having those snow-covered mountains on the outsides of the stage just has it includes so much color to this, right? Because otherwise this would be a mostly grayscale build, of course, with the red banners. But having the white there, I think, is just the perfect accent piece to kind of, um, I don't know, surround the, the mostly grayness of the build. So uh, that was quite the uh, ordeal to get here. Most of the mountains survived, but the one on the left side just completely fell apart, which is super unfortunate. So believe it or not, I spent most of my time setting this up just rebuilding that mountain. I don't ever want to be rebuild a mountain again. And shout out to the people who helped me rebuild it. Um, so I have to also highlight the main area where Hux is giving his speech because that's something that I took a lot of pride in recreating as faithfully as possible. Uh, for the most part, the correct number of officers, storm snow troopers, and uh, Phasma are up there. And um, that was just super fun to me because, like, it's not often you get to you know, recreate a scene so, so perfectly. I mean, cause if, you know, at any other scale, this really wouldn't be possible. But the fact that I did build this, this big meant I get to have the uh, correct number of people up there. You know, it's a lot of variation in their faces to insinuate that they are in fact different people. They're all very special people. And um, the, also there's the correct number of troops up there as well. So I, 
this is obviously a massive build and it took a lot of time to get to this size. But one of the things that I always try to challenge myself with is to build something that isn't just massive, but incorporates as much detail as possible. Rather than this just being a big build, I wanted it to be something that people look at. And every time they look at it, if they're willing to look close enough, they'll notice um, a new detail. And that was uh, something I think I've achieved here, especially with the feedback that I've gotten here at the convention. Uh, it's just been amazing. So now let's get to the fun stuff. There's a considerable amount of Easter eggs in this. Um, there were a lot more Easter eggs in the full build, and obviously I couldn't bring that full build here, so I figured why not throw as many of those in here as possible. So if you notice next to the left turbo laser, we have Jar Jar Binks from the Bombat Bounty doing a little bit of a cleanup job. Starkiller base is not easy to maintain, especially since FN2187 left the first order. There's not really much by way of sanitation on Starkiller base, but Jar Jar being the, uh, the the bestest boyo that he can be, he stepped up and he fulfilled the void and he's keeping Starkiller base pristine. You'll also notice, and this is one that I haven't seen a lot of people notice, um, by the left mountain, there's Gary the snail just chilling on Starkiller base, cause why not? If we come back over to this side, on the right side of the mountains, we can see a group of chickens. Look at all these chickens. I was wondering about those. <laughs> yeah, um, there's no particular reason for that. JB Brick Fanatic just said, why not add chickens? And I was like, bro, like, why not add chickens? Um, but wait, there's more. If we come around to the right side of the build, you can see that a few of the interior rooms did actually survive, which was super cool because most of the rest of the build got destroyed. But here up top, we have a hallway and Mickey Mouse is hanging out. He just purchased Lucasfilm. He is cashing out right now. So he's super excited uh, just, just to be living life, profiting $4 billion. That's crazy. Down below him, you'll see there is a trash compactor scene. This isn't something that was depicted in the film, but it is mentioned. So it's super important for me to add that in. And you'll notice some familiar faces in there. We got Captain Phasma in there. We got the Jawa in the background. And then I got to give a warning, guys, because this is not for the faintest of hearts. If you look very closely at the bottom right corner, you will see Bulio's head. Um, rest in peace, Bulio. You meant a lot to all of us. And uh, if there's one thing that's super important to me, it was to commemorate you in this build because you're the reason that all of this is possible. Very important. Absolutely. Uh, and then also we got Yariel Poof chill. I'm sorry, not Yariel Poof. That's a, that's a Yariel Poof. I've been mean, just a generic uh, food server there. Nothing suspicious about him. He's just serving food. No reason to pay him any close attention. Let's move along. Um, and then the final thing is there's just mini kits scattered all throughout this thing. The Lego Star Wars video games are a big part of my childhood. They're a big part of the reason that I do these builds now. And anytime I can try to incorporate some sort of Lego Star Wars uh, like build or Easter egg or something like that, it's always a joy. And um, even though we couldn't have all 10 here, the full build had all 10, uh, we did at least scatter a few around here to give something uh, extra for people to look at. And uh, yeah, oh no, wait, hold on. We do have uh, some sheep at the very top of the mountain. Uh, it looks like they're having a little battle there. That's actually pretty cool. See, look at that. Look, even me, I notice new things looking at my own build. It's, it's, so, it's so cool. When the build is this big, it's easy to lose things. From there. Yes, the, you, it's easy to forget about things. <laughs> Like, I had a lot of help with setting this thing up, and because I did a build series all along the way, a lot of my friends kept up with that, and they kind of knew my intentions for a lot of the sections. So there were some details that I knew I wanted to incorporate and set up at the convention that I didn't really remember, because I set those things years ago, but I had people like, oh yeah, you wanted to pet this figure here, or you wanted to do this scene here. So it's really cool that people can get so invested in, in my build, and sometimes even know more about it than I do. So. Talk a little bit more about that build series. For people who haven't seen your YouTube channel or kind of your work online, what is that process like? Because this, this is a span of years you were working on this yes. full build. Yes, this is a two and a half year build. That is the longest time that I've really been committed to anything. And um, I basically just every week for the most part, every Sunday, I recorded all the progress that I got done during the week. And um, I showed people just how you get to this point. A lot of people aren't building this big and a lot of people um, aren't necessarily privy to how things like this come together. Uh, so every week on my channel, I made it a point to show people, you know, just the steps that it takes to, to get to this point. Because even though this is a big build, there are a lot of small components that help it come together. Uh, so those things, breaking those down, like for example, how I built the turbo laser, or how I designed that first order transporter like that, 
Um, those are all equally components that contribute to uh, this big build right here. And this is something that I'm always doing. Even though this build has come to a close, I will be doing another uh, build series on my channel. So if you guys are looking to dive right into some uh, Lego building action, I got you guys covered. Yes, definitely. Check out the channel there. So talk about kind of the, the structure of builds of this size. How do you, number one, put these together in the first place, but then also moving these to show. As you said, I think part of the mountain kind of got destroyed in transportation, yeah. so I, I'm sure that's a very difficult logistical process. Absolutely. Um, so this build, when I first started it, was not really intended to move anywhere other than downstairs in my house to make a full video. Um, I was very ambitious with the time I thought it would take me to finish it. Um, so when I first started the build, I was like, okay, I just need to build it in such a way where it can fit downstairs. So a lot of the platforms that the minifigs are standing on are just base plate size. So those actually come apart pretty easily. And the stage section actually splits apart into five different sections. And then the big box with the banners on it just lifts right off of it. So um, a lot of it was uh, actually just very modular. Um, it was convenient that I, I did design it that way because I wasn't you know, stuck in the room that I was in. Um, and that did allow me later on, once I realized, oh, I'm not going to get this done anytime soon, to kind of um, sync up the time with a convention to be able to travel with it places. Now, as you mentioned at the very beginning of the video, this is only about 30% of the total layout. So if you can, give us kind of a, a run through of the rest of this build that you had on display at the, the Brick Rodeo show. Absolutely. Um, so the rest of the build is comprised of so many different sections. It's, it's hard to figure out where it's even begin. Um, first and foremost, there is a, a pretty large scale hangar. It represents the scene where Ray is trying to escape the first order base. So she's climbing up the walls in the background. And then um, at the foreground, there is like a TIE fighter as well as some troops just making their way about the platform. On the other side of the interior, there is a um, like a dozen or so rooms. I incorporated a prison room that you will notice from Star Wars Battlefront 2. I also added a cafeteria, which was in a Star Destroyer level on Star Wars Battlefront 2. Below that, we had Snoke's throne room, which was such a joy to incorporate. I actually did bring the Snoke's throne room here. He was one of the few things that survived from the base. Um, but yeah, Snoke is just chilling there. And that was also just one of the most fun things to build. It's not often in Star Wars you get to upsize a minifig. So trying to recreate Snoke, but still keep that minifigure styling was uh, a really fun process. And um, I don't know, I just really had, I had a blast with recreating that just with Lego pieces, no prints or anything like that. So that was super cool. Um, to the left of that, you have some more fun rooms. So at the top, you have the barracks section. There's a lot of just stormtroopers going out their day-to-day -day activities. I had a basketball court in there. I had a weight room in there. Um, and then down below, there were some beds. Below that section, we had a, a rather iconic hallway where there's two stormtroopers walking through, and they see Kylo Ren's having another temper tantrum. So he stops them and tells them, let's go a different way. And then, of course, next to that was the right interrogation room where she uh, finesses a blaster off of a First Order Stormtrooper. Below that, we had um, also another iconic hallway in Starkiller Base. I kid you not, they used that hallway at least four or five different times in the film. Uh, there was a bathroom with a little mishap going on. There was, um, uh, there was the shield generator room where they get Phasma to let down the shields. And um, I think there was one other room. See, it's, it's so hard to remember all this. Man. I, I, gotta, I gotta keep a, a list notated. No, you're now. doing great. Appreciate it. <laughs> Um, so then right behind that was the outside of the base, so that's where a lot of the snow is. We had uh, the first order of snow speeder chase, which is actually the lead it scene, and that was super fun to incorporate. Uh, there's the big oscillator building. It's, it's probably the tallest point of the mock, so, so I think it's very impressive in that right, where you have Han Solo and Kylo Ren having a little family reunion, so to speak. Um, leading up to that is a big trench with some X-Wings flying through it. Um, there's also a dogfight with a TIE fighter and an X-Wing happening right outside the base. Um, and then finally, at the leftmost portion of the build, there is a forest where the, the final meeting between at least Ray and Kylo Ren, at least in this movie, happens. And um, yeah, it's just so much, man. And, and, and naming all this stuff just really reaffirms why I did this build. Um, it's really the best of all worlds because I got to incorporate, you know, the big minifig army on one side. I got to build a lot of first order architecture. I got to build a lot of natural landscapes like the snow, like the mountains, um, and like the forest on the other side. And I got to build a trench with actual minifig scale vehicles dogfighting in the mock. So, like, as a builder, like, it's, it's a dream. You get to build almost every aspect of Star Wars. So that was one of the biggest joys of doing this mock. 
Yeah, I love your your passion that comes through for all of this build and, and building, just Star Wars in general. That's something I've always loved when talking with you about your builds here. One interesting thing about this, though, is you you chose to build, uh, you've built several builds now from, from the newer trilogy, the newer Star Wars movies, which are very controversial. A lot of people aren't as big fans of those as some of the older ones. Absolutely. So what, what about those movies kind of appeals to you and makes you want to tackle these massive projects? One of the things that appeals to me most about those movies is that they're not boring, unlike a certain other group of Star Wars films out there. They do not put me to sleep. They have actors who act. They have lines that make sense. Oh boy, I feel like I'm gonna need to cut you off. <laughs> uh, <I'm, laughs> you might be alienating some viewers right now. I mean, well, I mean, I don't know. I've been alien. Hey, if you guys can dish it out, okay. There's gonna at least be one comment in the comment section. I can, I promise this because it happened on my video. Someone in the comments is gonna be like, the sequels suck, but cool mock. So, I mean, if y'all can dish it out, y'all gotta be able to take it as well. No, it's all love. I mean, I am a Star Wars fan. I do love Star Wars, even though those movies don't really appeal to me. Um, there are still a lot of things that I, I take from those and that I do want to build. Like, the, the, I don't just avoid them, you know, building them. There's, there's plenty of stuff that I'd love to build from those films. Um, but these movies in particular, you know, this is the first time as an adult that I really got to get caught up in the magic of Star Wars. Like, the lead up to The Force Awakens is just one of the most exciting parts of my life because uh, you know, it's new Star Wars, right? It's new characters you have no idea about. Um, it's it's a big blockbuster movie that's coming out. You kind of get caught up in the anticipation, figuring out who's going to do what, um, what place does each person play in the film. And uh, it was just the, the perfect storm of inspiration when it came from those films. And uh, from the, the Lego perspective, you know, with the big marketing push they put behind that you know there's a whole new slew of minifigures slew of vehicles it was just all very fresh and it, it really motivated me uh to build those things at a large scale um yeah, yeah. no I, I can totally see that you're right there was a lot of anticipation so it was, it was an exciting time to have the new star wars movies coming out well this is such fantastic work here thank you so much for all the effort you put into building it and then bringing this to different shows now so do you have any plans for the future in terms of a next build or what you might be thinking my next build is a secret um, but all I'm going to say is that uh, all the people who I may have offended earlier in the video, I think you might appreciate my next build. That, that's all I'm going to say. Okay, it's a redemption tour for exactly. you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's my redemption arc. This is my first order transporter. I believe it's around 2,000 pieces. It's pretty close to minifig scale. One of the things that I take most pride in with this build is that it's mostly snot all the way around. So I spent a considerable amount of time working on the detail on the bottom of this thing. So that was super important to me. We got the landing gears that are actually somewhat functional. The ship can sit on them. And uh, yeah, this was a super fun build to do. Uh, it's obviously very gray, which a lot of people might kind of be turned off by. Um, but I don't know, I think that kind of makes it look unique for, for that reason. Um, that made a lot of the graveling easy to source because it was just all the same color. That worked out pretty well. I'm gonna go ahead and set this bad boy right here down and we can check out the inside. So the top layer here just peels off like so. And then this back part also peels off here. So it's empty right now, but I included those studs on the bottom so you can accommodate minifigures. There's also some clips on the side if you want to incorporate uh, some weapons, just a weapon rack right there. And uh, the main door on the front does actually come down. So you can recreate the iconic scenes where the stormtroopers are just running out of the build. And uh, yeah, this is one of the builds I feel a lot of people don't really know just because it almost gets hidden in, in this large build. Um, it's not one that I really highlight a ton, uh, but I think it's still a really cool build nonetheless. There's also a little top hatch here, so you can set a mini figure up there to man that weapon right there. And then there is the cockpit right here, if I can remember what part of this comes apart. Like I said, I built this so many years ago. Uh, but yeah, the other side, you can see there is space to accommodate a mini fig in there to pilot this beast. I love builds like this that both look great from the outside and then also have all of this interior room. So it's it's very playable from that perspective. Yeah, I think one of the pleasant surprises about this are, is the, the stark color contrast from the inside to the outside. Like I think when you build something like this, oftentimes the walls on the outside kind of are the, the same wall on the inside. But I wanted to make it a point to have the inside be, you know, this dark gray color all the way through it. And I think that actually worked out very well. So you mentioned I think you could fit like 20 minifigs inside this thing. Do you know how many minifigs were in the entire build as a whole? Oh, man. Um, so I think for the, just this platform here alone, there's at least like 400 or so. And then there's probably another 100 like throughout the rest of the build. So a lot of minifigs incorporated in this build. I don't know if I'll ever incorporate that many minifigs into a build. So remind people once again where they can find your stuff online if they want to continue to see more about this build and then just future projects as well. Absolutely. So I am Rich Boy J on YouTube. 
Um, I do lots of large scale builds. I'm not, if, 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 if you're so offended by the fact that I'm building sequel stuff, I'm not just purely a sequel builder. I, I build all parts of Star Wars. I'm excited by all parts of Star Wars. And um, I'm always trying to, to push the envelope, right? Like, obviously building something like this, that's a certain standard for me. Um, and I don't, I don't know how I'm going to top it, but I'm definitely going to try. I'm, I'm going to try to, even if my next build can't be this big, it'll at least incorporate, you know, more detail. It'll incorporate more interesting shapes. Just anything I can do to um, just recapture what I see on screen. That's always the most important thing to me. Um, whatever you felt when you saw these scenes, when you were sitting in the theater for the first time, I want all those feelings to come back whenever you sit down and look at some of my builds. So, yeah, Rich Boy J on YouTube, Instagram as well. I'm always doing some sort of build series. I'm always building something. So I think if you're a Star Wars fan, you're a Lego fan, there's always something to appreciate on my channel. Yeah, very exciting. We'll make sure to put a link to uh, Jay's channel in the description of this video, along with links to the other videos that we've done with you over the years, because you ha have done some fantastic work. So if you haven't seen those before, make sure to check all of that out. Thank you so much for taking the time to give us the full tour today. Absolutely, man. It's always a pleasure. Daryl Clifford. I'm Caden Nordling. All right, and this is our... Clone Wars scene. It's not representative of anything in particular. We just had more of an idea of how we wanted it to look. We built that. We tried to find something that would match it, and there's nothing out there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this more is, Clone Wars inspired than it is actually recreating. It's the double expanded universe. I had to talk to George Lucas personally <laughs> to get these details. You probably won't ever see them anywhere. So we start at the very back here, uh, kind of behind the mountain. What do we have? All right, we've got the base. Uh, this was. Somewhat difficult because we wanted to keep it very open to be seen, but also didn't want it to look unfinished. And I feel like we got about 80% of the way there. It still feels a little yeah, unfinished, we but... We weren't totally satisfied of the combination of getting it open, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Close enough right now. Some yeah. hang-offs and, uh, yeah. Good viewing, though, and that's yeah. what it's about. What are some of your favorite details throughout here? Uh, I like the command center up top. Uh, got all the, the top generals, as many Jedi as I could fit in there. Got the hollow table in the back near the front. Um, that's the first curved bend I've tried to put in a big build like this, and that worked out pretty good. Uh, down below, we've got all the, the troops and the little garage with the tanks and the bikes. Uh, back in here, we've got the back side of a bunker you'll see when we move up front couple of different troop units getting ready to move out and then uh, we have our sushi restaurant because yeah. this is this is one of the nice clone bases with the good food Lots of funding. yeah no, yeah no budget kitchens here no 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 this is top of the line no cheap cafeteria military <laughs> yeah and of course pool table because you got to stay busy and then uh, the Camino inspired beds in the bedroom here with the nice quilts, of course, because again, it's a nice base. You got some good food on the table there. Shout out to Sausage Lug. Yep, yep. <laughs> and then uh, up top, we've got one droid that was relieved of his friends and they're attempting to extract information. <laughs> uh, and then as we come around the side here, in the bottom level, this was uh, basically what we were hoping would look like uh, storage with the crates and whatnot. And then as you move up, you got the power generators running. I hope those lights are working. Okay, good, they are. Uh, and then up top there is the inside of one of the, the gun bunkers. And then as you work your way across the front, you can see the big guns sticking out in a couple of spots, a couple of bunkers just for the soldiers themselves, and then the uh, overhanging front end of the command center there. And you can get a really good look at what you were saying earlier about that rounded technique there. Talk about some of the pieces you use and kind of how you achieve that. One by twos. <laughs> Whole bunch of them and then just carefully bend it as far as it would go without exploding the sidewalls off of it. We did lose it on the way here. I hit a bump and the top came off, the walls oh, came no. off. But, you know, luckily it wasn't too many pieces. So we got to get that together pretty quick. <clears throat> and then move into the... Hollow Bridge and the river there. Yes. Whole bunch of one by one studs again. I, I hate doing it, but I really like the look of it. So I'm. Yeah, it hurts your thumbs a lot. Yeah. It's crazy how deep you guys made this. You can see here on the side, they're yeah. deep, that deep all the way across. 
Maybe. <laughs> no, at two rows in, it, it goes down to five deep. So it still is pretty deep. And, uh, but you, you got to do that to get a good deep feel to it. Uh, if you put one layer, you're going to be able to see it. Right. So then we move on to the uh, land, and Caden did most of that. So we'll move yeah. on to him. So um, pretty much what happened is my dad started with this plate and I kind of got a feel of what I needed to build. Um, the type of structuring inside is mostly Duplo and random colorful bricks. And he also started this, the inside of the cave and I built this over here, which took a few nights. And yeah. What, what else do we have in terms of the, the weapons and soldiers up here? Um, we just have a few droid tanks that we've collected over the years because we've been wanting to put this into a mock, like maybe a droid army approaching clone base. We've been wanting to do this for a year or two, so. You've got kind of different areas here with the, the forest and then sort of the sand and palm trees over there? Yeah, we wanted to give it a nice, busy look without it hurting your eyes because there's too much colors. That's something we always try to go for is not too busy, but not too bare either. It can get overwhelming pretty quickly when you're just throwing like colors and crazy amounts of pieces in there. Yeah, especially when you have both of them battling, there's like stuff all over, it's just too much, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then talk about some of the tree design as well here. What did you find worked well for that? Um, I don't know, he's more of the tree guy. <laughs> Uh, I actually used those trees style a couple of years ago on Endor, and it seemed to work out good. It looks a lot trickier than it is. <laughs> it's really those two by two, I don't know, or no, one by two with the little kind of indent in them. The Western fort pieces? Yeah, those. <laughs> Throw a four by four round on top and then just keep tapering it down. Pack it with leaves. Eventually the gravity actually pulls the leaves down a little, which help, helps make it look a little better. Kind of... It just gives it a more fan look. I don't know, it's cool. And then also something my dad thought of is... Oh, just kind of hanging them there. Yeah. Gives the appearance of maybe it's about to fall off or it's kind of, I don't know, it's cool. When you bring this to the show, what's set up like for the different sections? Um, well, the way we transport it is we split them off in the base plates and then we kind of... Um, put them in it's like a puzzle piece basically and they're not all perfectly uh some tops overhang a little so you can kind of see where it fits and then we board it up kind of uh and then put foliage over the cracks so it doesn't look like conceal that yeah is the the mountain the hot taller part here harder to transport is that kind of you said on the way over you lost the, the rounded section yeah the the taller part, I should have planned better. We have nice wood boxes to get most things in. That was about four inches taller than the box. Oh, no. So we had to pin it in between all the boxes for the way here. It actually survived, so that was the part I was worried about, but that made it. <laughs> right. Well, that's good. I think you guys did an excellent job with the whole layout, and it certainly catches your eye when you walk up here, so thank you. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Thank you. I'm Radek Popik, Radek Popik from Czech Republic and I'm 16 years old. So I'm just taking this piece off and I show you the interior. So this is your massive Millennium Falcon build here. What, what size or scale is this? It's in brick head scale. So you can put these brick heads and you can play inside. So that's quite a large scale. How, how big is this build? It's about uh, 1 meter and 69 centimeters long. Great, and so you've got interior, so yeah, let's, let's go ahead and take a look inside. Okay. So I just open it. Do all the panels just kind of sit on there? Yes. And now you can see the gouge where you can put the uh, brick heads so you can play with them. And there's the Han Solo chair. 
like in uh, UCS Millennium Falcon the Lego set, so you know. So was, did you kind of base this design off of the UCS set and just yes. enlarge it? It's based on the UCS set, but is bigger. Okay. Let's see what else you have here. <laughs> so now there is the hall when the minific uh, bender brick heads come in. I'll open it. Take off the panels in the right order. <laughs> yes. So now you can see uh, the interior. There is the hall, and here is the when the Han. Uh, hide himself from the, um, in the Death Star, from the Imperials. So this is quite the, quite the massive build here. How did you decide to build at this scale? I always wanted the UCS Millennium Falcon since 2007. When I, all, when I look in the internet and I'm watching it, wow, I just want this set, but I don't have enough parts to build it or enough money to buy it, so uh, about 10 years, I'll, I'll um, um, wait a minute please, I build it by myself, uh, this bigger set, so. And there is another hole, <sighs> sorry. You can put here brick heads, so they're like in the movie, in the canon when they uh, shoot into TIE Fighters. I'm so really nervous <laughs> just now. It's fine, yeah, this is fantastic. You've got so many different details in here. So now here is Finn from the seventh episode of Star Wars, which is shooting to TIE Fighters. And now I'll show you my cockpit. You can uh, open it, like here, and you see the four chairs for the minifix, and there is the hole which uh, brickheads can walk into Millennium Falcon. Great work. What what is it like when you when you transport this build and bring it to a show? Um, I can separate this uh, model into uh, five pieces and then uh, put it into one really big box. <laughs> How long did it take you to set up when you got here? Um, about I believe about one year because I have to go to the school and doing hard works, learning to test. So you know. Well, it's very impressive. This is. Do you plan to build any other Star Wars ships at this scale? I uh, wanna um, build the U Millennium Falcon, the biggest, uh, because I saw there is three uh, meters long Millennium Falcon in Australia. So I now I'll take the bricks from the ship, uh, which was in Saturday. So I wanna make the biggest Millennium Falcon ever. <laughs> So you just want to go larger with the Millennium yes. Falcon? <laughs> it's a, I will make it about 3 meters and 60 centimeters long. Fantastic. Is there any any other rooms or anything you want to show us here? Uh, you can just open it here. And put some uh, things right down. Hide some cargo? Yes. Oh, sorry. Well, it's a great build. Thank you so much for bringing it out to Scarebeck and for, for taking it all apart and showing us, showing us how it all works. Thank you.
Mustafar, a volcanic planet on the outer rim that was featured in episode three of Star Wars, famous for the final battle of Obi-Wan and Anakin, of which I have a cameo in this build. But that story is stuff of legend because this is in the future. This is episode eight of Mustafar, Rise of the Sith. The dark side clouds everything. And you can take a look, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, they're making, the Sith are making Vader clones. And they have, if I may say, hidden deep within the mountain, a cavern where the physical clone bodies of Vader are then formed. Using Dark Force Red Crystals and Darth Vader's DNA and heat from the lava, an ooze is formed. And it is sent down through the mountain and the physical form, the physical clone body of Vader then created. I don't know how effective they're gonna be because so far they've only had two that have come out correct. There's been a lot of defective ones and they're busy around the build doing the grunt work. Some experimentation still. Yeah, a little bit. And when if, if one of the defective clones goes bad, then we have a recalibration chamber over there and hidden by the elevator that it's, well, I guess essentially in layman's terms, shock treatment. And we have, uh, the Sith have recruited a lot of Imperial stormtroopers that are unemployed, shadow troopers, and even some final order Sith troopers. They're all being retrained. Hopefully one day their army will rise and they will crush the new Republic. But I don't really believe that's gonna happen. So we've established what happens in the mountain over here. Talk about the, the tall building that we have on this side. Okay, well that's, a, that's I call that affectionately Sith Towers. That is a tower that is the Mustafar Sith facility on the bottom floor down there where you see stormtroopers walking up inside, that is a registration and welcome reception area uh, built into the mountain. One floor up from that is their dormitory where they dine and sleep in really rough bunk beds. The floor up above that is a uh, TIE Fighter Simulator, Sith TIE Fighter Simulator training area, and there's a dozen simulators in there with aspiring TIE Fighter pilots trying to learn how to fly. When they do, the next floor up is the hangar bay, and the top floor is the landing and the cannon battery bay to protect the facility. It's very well ray shielded. You may look at that dome device there, and that's ray shielding. So if perhaps a surprise attack does happen, then if they don't have the proton bombs, no damage done. I think though somewhere in the future, as in the legend, the New Republic has salvaged some X-Wing starfighters and maybe they're loaded with proton bombs and will soon attack and destroy the power of the Sith. Well, that's not going to end well for these guys. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> not at all. But uh, I don't have to worry because even though I'm a retired Sith top fighter pilot, three times rewarded actually... I'm a spy, so maybe I won't get blown up. Deep cover. Yes. <laughs> well, that is a fantastic story we have going here. So certainly one, the thing that catches your eye when you first walk up to this build is just the, the size of it as well. So do you know how many pieces are here, the overall size? It says right there on the screen, it consists of 110,723 pieces and counting. But let's be fair here. Did I really count those things? <laughs> so that's my story on that part of how many pieces it is. I believe that, uh, and you guys well know that every Lego set ever made has on the outside of the box how many pieces it is. So the definitive go-to question is, how many pieces is it? And there, I have documentation, 110,723 pieces and counting. Let me throw another one in there and then I'll have to change my video. <laughs> there we go. No, I like it. I'm sure it was very difficult to keep track. So uh, do you know how tall the whole thing is here? Uh, I think at its tallest point right there, it might be a little over five feet. I do know that the mountain sections are a little over 
22 inches high, the mountain base that goes around there because I put them in boxes that are 16 by 16 by 24 so they'd have some, some headroom, but I, I mostly guesstimate it. Uh, there's actually a club table there that is built 30 inches wide by 60 inches long, and the 48 by 48 stud base plate sections fit on it perfectly. I build a, a mills up on the, the, the base platform, and from there I begin to rise, Sith, rise. <laughs> So that's kind of, talk a little bit more about that structure then underneath there if you can and kind of every, everything that holds this massive build together. Well, it's built solid. Would you, would you like to maybe take a cross-section look at one of the pieces? That would be awesome. Let's do that. Let's see if I've got any, any force strength left. This is five sections. So let me take this one and lean it forward. Just to, Oh, that one's not going to happen. Let's go over on the back side and do that. You don't mind. Uh, I forgot they're pinned together with Technic. So, come here, Band-Aid. Now we'll try this one, and this is the lightest section. It's the centerpiece. And as it slides out, you can see that there's a table underneath there. I'll pick this thing up. And, of course, it's uh, plated off for strength every once in a while, and I use dark gray plates because those black 16 by 16. And look, are there bright colors on the back of that? Oh my. There's a couple bright colors. Fill bricks. It, nobody, nobody can see those. I'm supposed to be able to use that. So. But this is great. So you can see that table you were talking about and then you just push these up against it. That, that's it. And actually I'm supposed to uh, have Technic pins to put in there like I did on the front, but I failed to put the Technic pieces on, well, I put them on the right side, but then when I started building it, I didn't turn the plate correctly, and then I already had it built when I discovered, uh, oops, uh, it, will get, it will get rebuilt in some regard in the future. This is Mustafar Episode 8. It began in February of 2020 as Mustafar Episode 1. As each, ep each build gets added on to it, it becomes a different episode, and I always try to change the little story that goes along with it. So that's yeah. it. I love this current iteration of it. It's certainly a fantastic build here. So if you can, talk a little bit more about some of the, the black pieces that you used to achieve all of this incredible walk, rock work. Did you have those on hand when the build began, or did you have to try to source those from different places I online? Them from a lot of different places, and I, that, that is the one thing that slowed down the build more than anything. It's why it's taken so long, is uh, waiting on pieces to arrive, for one thing. You know when you buy stuff from Lego, it happens slow. Uh, and then I had to look in my back pocket and see if I found any extra money to buy Lego pieces with. And that's the, that's the vicious thing that happens to do that. There's, uh, there's probably six or seven different black, what I call roof slope, components that are used on this. It's got a burp, big ugly rock piece. The actual Lego name is Mountain Bottom, uh, 10 by 4 by 6. And that's each level. And this comes nine levels high. And to do that, I put the mountain bottom piece in the place where I want it to be. Then I back support it with bricks, two by six bricks. They fit right in the notch real good. Then I start putting Lego bricks, two by four Lego bricks in place. And I do a layer of, I mean Duplo bricks, I'm sorry. Uh, I put a layer of Duplo, a layer of bricks, a layer of Duplo, and so on until one level up is finished and then I add on the mountain texture. And I have to constantly think about, okay, what's gonna be going on up at the top? So, because you build it from the bottom up. And you know, if I'm gonna have a lava flow, I've gotta think about what I'm gonna do up at a certain area. And it's fun doing that. I mean, it, every one of them I wanted to be uniquely different and, and they are that. And there's no telling where I'm gonna go, but I'm sticking with Mustafar for now. Now, the lava adds so much you know, color to the build, which is fantastic. So talk about how you incorporated that into the, the black kind of mountain rock work here. Well, rather than use the black slopes, I would, I would begin to use trans orange in there. Uh, different elements with that. Some of them I use that one by two by six long trans orange piece. Other times I would use one by two trans orange plates. And of course, as you can see, a one by two trans orange slope and lots and lots of trans orange cheese slopes. It, it just depends on, kind of like building a puzzle, 
okay, which piece goes here? And I would determine which it, piece fit best and put it there. And then as I got along the way, if something wasn't jiving up above, it meant I had to destroy it and well as some of the pieces and put them back in place again. But that's part of the fun. There's no plans. There was nothing other than uh, a concepted idea. And let me start building this and see where it goes. And that's what I did with this one. That's great to have fun with it. I, I know if I'm not mistaken, we can actually see inside here to see a little bit more of that story you were talking about earlier. Oh, yeah. So I'll, I'll go ahead and point to this. This area of Mustafar is rich with dark force red crystals. And the Sith have harvested them, and they put them in a chamber beside Darth Vader's life force DNA. And, of course, as the system starts, the thermal heat from the lava flow beneath that liquefies it, it's pumped down through these pipes into a secret cavern at the base of the mountain where the then physical Vader clone body is formed. And if I use my force power strong enough, let's see. Oh, I've still got some left. I can remove the side of the mountain. And then you can see what's going on inside there a little bit. Uh, sadly to say, it was a remote section of Mustafar and they had to blow out what they could of the mountain and they only ended up having enough room for three Vader clone chambers, so they can make them three at a time. Uh, so far, only two have come out correctly, and they're busy with uh, lightsaber practice. I think maybe the instructor droids and the practice droids know more than they do, but uh, the Sith are a lofty group. They don't realize that the dark side is not as powerful as the light side. So they run with it and they go with it and they hurry up and then they fail. But they don't learn from their failure, so they try again and then they fail again and that's what's going on here. <laughs> I, lo I love that whole story that's involved. So I know you mentioned, I think, the Anakin fight that's down there at the very bottom. Any other kind of Easter eggs or scenes around the edges? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I, I did that one there because the first time I built Mustafar and I was showing it to the kids and told them that Mustafar is a volcanic planet Featured in episode three, then the little guy said to me, well, where are Anakin and Obi-Wan having their final battle? So I had to put that in there because, I mean, I don't want to get busted by a six-year-old that many times. <laughs> That's right. Nobody wants that. So uh, another fascinating thing with these builds is always what it's like to bring them to a show and set them up. So what was that process like for you? Well, it's strenuous. <laughs> it was... Uh, you know what, it's a labor of love. I drove up here from Knoxville, Tennessee, and brought, this fills up my entire van. And so I've got to unload all the boxes and get them over here where the setup area is. Then I have to unload the table. Then I have to unload the two platforms, set the two platforms up first, set the table in place, and then start to unbox each of the 22 sections and put them in place. I put the top sections on first because the side sections slide in and they lock that in place. Some of the mountainside sections are actually uh, pinned together by Technic pins, others are not because, well, I really don't have to if I want to be lazy. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, I'll speak about the, uh, the, the uh, cavern where the physical clone body is informed. When I first built it, as you see this one side with the bars on the window, they were on both sides. And I looked at that and said, that doesn't look like mountain. So I had to change up everything, and there's a gazillion uh, inverted two-by-two two black roof slopes under there making the archway for the cavern, and then it's plated off, and I'm, I apologize that I don't think I want to do this on film, but it is made modular where if I put my hand under there, I can lift that entire mountain section up for a better overhead view of what's in there, but I'm, you don't mind if I'm lazy and scared. No, that's fine. It's, it's been a long day here, so that's fine. <laughs> Another really cool element of this build is the lighting you had on it. So uh, they had like a World of Lights event here last night at Brick Fair, and this build looked fantastic. Talk about the lighting setup you had here. Well, the lighting setup I had was simply four battery-operated uh, professional stage LED lights, and I can make them a myriad of colors, but last night I used orange. It's good, and when they turned the lights out a little bit earlier, I chose the magenta color, and so it gave a really iridescent neon-like trans to, to the trans orange and a bluish, really eerie cast over the Mustafar mountainside. So one was Mustafar, and the other I call Mustafar at night.
That works. Well, thank you so much for bringing this build out to the show, and thank you for giving us the whole tour of the, the whole story here. Can't wait to see what you have in the future. Thank you so much for that. I will give you a little bit of a hint. Mustafar is going to be an ongoing build. However, another labor of love is me putting together the convex transport heist aftermath from the solo movie. So it'll be tabletop only, and you will see the train going around the mountain, and then the train has exploded, and it's crashed down at the bottom. I will have an Easter egg on the other side of the mountain with the campfire scene where Rio said, tell us about the, your girl, Han. Has she got sharp teeth? And that little campfire scene that lasted about a minute in the movie will be used there right next to an avalanche from where the explosion happened and it blew the avalanche down. And then the other end of the coin is, I'm just thinking out loud about what I'm gonna do. Actually, when I start building and building more and getting down to the story details of it, it's Lego, you can change it any way you want to. That's what I love about it. That's what's so beautiful about it. I love that approach, so thank you. You're most welcome. Hey everyone, Joshua Hamlin here at Brick Fair Virginia 2022, and today we've got this massive Jedi Temple. This was a collaborative build here, so we've got both the builders. You want to introduce yourselves, then we'll launch on in. Yeah, I am Lee Roberts, and I am from Virginia, and I built this with my friend David. Okay. He also goes by Brick Builder Studios on YouTube. Uh, hey, always be plugging. Good job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my name is uh, David Hall. I'm known as Solid Brick Studios on YouTube. Uh, so right now. Uh, this is the first time I've ever bought a, a big diorama build where nobody knew about it. Like, Lee and I built this in secret. We built this in nine days. Wow. Um, we did nine hours every day, both of us building, for nine days straight. Well, seven days, then two more days late, like a week between. So nine days in total. Um, but yeah, this, this was just came out of nowhere. Lee came down. Do you want to explain in, in June like how that started? Yeah, so I just went down David's house. I don't know, to hang out. I'm not sure what we were doing. And then um, David just started breaking out some of these tan bricks, the slopes on the side of them that we use for the, uh, the pyramid here. And uh, he just started building a temple. And I was like, what are you doing, David? And he's like, I have an idea, bro. We should uh, build a Jedi temple for Brick Fair. And I'm like, that sounds like a pretty big ask. But um, uh, that, was right that was right before Brick World Chicago. And then uh, a few weeks ago, I came to I came down for a week, and we just started knocking everything out. Okay, awesome. And I mean, it, look at how big this ended up. So, was it supposed to be this size all along, or is this just kind of how it ended? <laughs> no, no. So um, originally, well, the ways. So when he came down in June two months ago, we built just like a small portion of this little corner of the wall, just to see. Okay, well, first off. You'll notice there's this piece right here, instead of like having the normal corner brick. The reason being, Lego doesn't make the corner brick in tan. And so we need to figure out how are we going to make these tan corners. And so we prototyped this corner in gray, actually. And then we figured, OK, it can work. We can build this. And we thought when we did the corner that this was going to be a 2 by 4 gray base plate mock, where now it's a 4 by 4 so it's doubled in size. So we thought it was only going to be you know, about this wide and only go back two base plates, but now it's going back four base plates. So it, it turned in a lot bigger than what we initially thought. And I mean, I, I think it looks spectacular. I think it's pretty, I wouldn't want to make it any bigger than this. I know, I know a lot of people are going to wonder. It's not minifigure scale. It's not even close to minifigure scale, in fact. The closest it is is the little micro Lego figures. You know, like come in the, the Harry Potter, the Hogwarts uh, set, like those little teeny nano figs that you place there. You place one of those, that's about the scale of the mock. Of course, we have regular Lego minifigures on it, though. Um, and in the front here, I'll let Lee talk about what he's done. Yeah, so the whole staircase area, um, that itself isn't even to scale to the scale of the building. So there's like a few different scales we've got working around here. Um, but I actually built the entire stairs and those little columns in front of the uh, entrance there on Studio, um, Lego CAD program. And I just kind of replicated it um, with the bricks. Well, they, they look great, and you've got kind of the gears holding those up there at the base. Yeah. So um, you can see there's a few different techniques for the stairs there. The bottom part is just a bunch of bricks and uh, plates and tiles. And then you do have a few panels back there that kind of give the, uh, the the longer stair tread, which is, you know, kind of because it's more kind of micro scale, the whole stairs there. So it really helps um, flush it out. So it's not just one kind of dimension there. Lee didn't tell me this, but, you know, he designed the stairs in studio. And this hinge piece, this little, this little tiny piece right here, only came in tan in one Lego set. It was from 20 years ago, and it went, it was going for like 
I think five dollars for one little tiny piece, and I paid, and we needed two of them. So I paid ten dollars for the piece, and then like another five dollars for shipping. Fifteen dollars for two pieces, no bigger than your fingernail. Wow! Hey, this is this is what you've got to do to do builds like this, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you just you go to you go to whatever extent to make it happen, and we, we didn't cut any corners quite literally on this mock. So, so what, what are some of the other architectural details on the outside? Yeah, so. I th did I think? Did I come up with these panel designs? You came up with these. So I did the little uh, medium nougat piece in the middle, and then David basically did everything else on these bottom sections here. Yeah, so they're actually just sitting in place. They're sitting on these cheese slopes down here, and then there's just more slopes underneath this that are holding them in place. And you know, again, we came up with crazy techniques. So right here in the corner, there's a little painter stick holding it in place on these one by ones with this little piece right here, and it's sitting on this new Lego pyramid one by one piece as well um, and it just it works it just first it perfectly fits the two corners together like crazy little techniques like that are throughout this entire build you know up at the top here on the roof um, there's uh, medium nougat heads um, and those actually did come in a lego set they came as uh, coconuts in the pirates of barracuda bay so that's where that piece is from and those are spaced throughout the whole build um, the roof is actually, so yeah, I'm sure a lot of people will ask, this thing does fully come apart. It's sectional, it comes apart in seven sections. Um, the roof also comes off. Uh, we made it completely modular so we could bring it to the convention and surprisingly nothing broke on its drive. Uh, we, it was a two hour drive to get it here from Richmond from where I'm from um, and nothing broke. It took, Lee's, and Lee and I both had full size SUVs and that's the amount of space that was required to, to move this thing to where it is now. That's fantastic. We can kind of make our way around to this side then. And it, is most of this pretty similar to the side we just looked at? So for the most part, it's pretty symmetrical. The temple in real life is basically just four of the exact same sides. There's a little bit of variation, as you can see, with the front and the stairs. Um, but for this uh, mock, we just basically replicated it all the way around. And it is perfectly symmetrical. The dimensions, it's all the same. Um, and at the back, we just cut it off so you can see the inside. And I like this, these supports that kind of stick out here. Talk about how you guys incorporated that kind of into the slopes coming down there. So um, <laughs> I guess originally it was kind of uh, an idea to minimize the slope usage on the mock. So it, and also it ended up doubling as, you know, just to break up the monotony of the slopes. But I mean, it, um, it, it, were, it, served, it serves a few roles there. Um, David kind of did that a little, spearheaded the, the design of those things. Yeah, so. You'll notice we were very keen, so going into the mock, we were keen on a couple things, color palette, and also making this look Lego, because it's so easy to tile it off, make it all smooth, and you don't see the Lego studs, and you don't immediately think it's Lego when you look at it. And so that's why throughout this, you'll see studs everywhere on the side panels, on these side panels right here, even in this direction. We have Lego studs going every direction, just to make sure that everybody realizes that it is fully made out of Lego. We're not cutting corners here. There's no special stuff happening. Um, and so that was that was an aesthetic we both agreed on. Lee and I going into this build, we're like, yeah, we, we want to bring that. It's so easy for Lego Star Wars builders to just make them all smooth and shiny and stuff. But you know, like like the original Star Wars, there is like roughness to it. And even though the Jedi Temple in the movies is very much a smooth you know, sleek structure. We wanted to bring that that Lego texture to the to the building, and you'll see that on the side too. Here, we use the masonry bricks uh, just to break up all that you know brick, um, just to add a little bit more texture where we can. Um, I, I'm pretty happy with the final result. Even out here in the front, there's there's studs here on these uh, on all these tiles. This is always fun. You know, I just randomly place tiles, and you're just filling in gaps. Um, so that's always a fun thing to do, but. You know, this, this thing has an interior. It's not just an external yeah. building, and the interior is quite something. I was just going to say, we get a little taste of that action here on the outside with some of these figures as we're heading around the corner. Yes, so this is, I, I should have said this at the beginning, but this is based off the Star Wars prequel trilogy, so episode one, two, and three. Um, it does also pop up in the Obi-Wan show, which the interior is heavily inspired by. But this outer portion right here, these two figures are actually first popped up in the second season, the first episode of the second season of the Star Wars The Clone Wars TV show where Cad Bane and his little um, robot buddy, Toto 360, uh, basically get inside the Jedi Temple and they hijack or take a uh, holocron. And so that's them going to get their holocrons. I do eventually, I'll, we'll see here in a second. Unfortunately, I don't have a holocron room. That's something I want to add to the mock though. 
So as we move then into this fantastic interior here, which just feels so massive when you look into this, what do we have happening here? So for the most part, this is depicting um, uh, the raid on, raid on the temple during Order 66. Uh, I forget the name of that. What, what's the name of that, David? Nightfall? What? Operation Nightfall or something like that? Yeah. Okay, well basically, Revenge of the Sith when Anakin goes in with the 501st and kills all the Jedi. Um, you know, we have this scene from uh, Kenobi there, um, kind of depicting that event as well, because it's been told from many different perspectives, so we try to get all those in there that we could. Um, we have a little Reva right there. Yep. Reva and Dark Anakin just recreating that scene from the Obi-Wan show. We had to have that, that was important. And then one thing that's really cool, I was looking earlier, is the shot down here, and you can kind of see all the way out to the entrance there, which is really uh, fantastic. Yeah, there's actually, if you get the camera just right at an angle, you'll see Anakin through the through the door at the very end. I don't know if your camera will focus, but there are three doors at the end where Anakin's marching into the temple, just like you see in uh, Revenge of the Sith, which was just, it wasn't planned that way, it just worked out that way, and it just looks so epic. Uh, we were so happy with how that came out. And it was unintentional. Like, most of this build, because it was built, built so quickly, like, a lot of things just fell in place. Like, unintentional things that just worked out. Like, that happened so many times. I mean, do you have any other ex examples? I mean, I guess it all comes down to if you plan a lot of it well, the rest kind of just falls into place, because that's basically what happened, happened there. Um, I think there was something that on the sides here, I can't remember exactly right now, but there was a lot of those moments where, oh yeah, so the, um, these floors here that kind of go in, they're built with the 16 by 16 um, kind of brick plates yeah, that come in the, the, the art sets. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it just worked out perfectly because it's exactly eight of those across. So three gray base plates. And we didn't exactly plan for it to be that wide. It just worked out perfectly. Yeah. And then how did you decide on kind of the interior details here and get that, that plating on the side? So it was actually pretty tricky in the inside because we wanted to make sure we had some different colors that were different from the outside, otherwise it might be a little bit boring. But also we had you know, parts that we had to look at and see what we had to work with there. Um, and also see what was accurate to the source material. So we ended up going with dark tan on the sides and try to incorporate some of the dark red also as well in there. Um, I don't want to say it was last minute, <laughs> but I mean... It was. <laughs> yeah, part of it's the last minute, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think it turned out pretty well for what we uh, had time to do. What is happening in this room up here? Okay, oh, so this is <laughs> oh, the, um, we, we have a little shelf up here uh, where we're going to make some more rooms for it, where the black stuff is. Uh, but, you know, we'll have the library and the holocron room, whatnot like that. So uh, we have, for this convention, we uh, put together, a, or I, I say I put together a council room. Um, you kind of see a bit of forced perspective there because it's not supposed to be in the temple. It's actually, actually one of the towers up top. Uh, in universe, but um, we have the little force persp pr perspective of Coruscant in the background there. You can see the sky, and I think it turned out pretty well. That's kind of our Easter egg room, you know. You got, I, I don't know, I don't know what's going on in there. <laughs> we got we, we got Baby Yoda. We got um, Inquisitor Jar Jar back there. We got long legged uh, Yoda. We got General Grievous. We got Darth Malgus sipping on who knows what. We got General Grievous. We got Watto chilling in here. It, we had a blast with this room because. I mean, technically, in Revenge of the Sith, I believe this is the room where the younglings are, where Anakin comes in and does his thing. Um, so, I don't know. We, we, have, we have down here, we have the younglings down here. I didn't want two rooms with the younglings. Too many younglings. We, we have the younglings, everybody. We have them. Anyhow, um, there is so many different little scenes being depicted throughout here. You'll notice there are lights through this whole build. Light My Bricks came through. I talked to him, like, like literally five days ago. I was like, hey, can you guys get me, like, 35 lightsabers to put in this mock and they're like we got you so they came through light my bricks is uh the the company that does all the lighting here we uh surprisingly didn't find it that hard to add lighting given the short short time base that we had to build this thing um and i everybody that's come by here today has just said that this is the lightsabers just make it because it's it's a really interesting color contrast obviously you have all these you know tan nougat colors and reds and then you have like obviously the the stark contrast the uh, uh, blue and green lightsabers, and that that is what you see in the movies too, as was the Obi Wan show. And so it's, it really evokes that feeling of what you see from the movies with the uh, the lights inside the lightsabers and the overall lighting and aesthetic that we went for in the build. Mm -hmm. um, this whole this whole big area though is we took a picture a screenshot from the Obi Wan show. It's the entrance shot of Order sixty six. It's how the Obi Wan show from this year starts. And um, we literally looked at that and just like, okay, we, I think we can put that in the back of this mock and it worked out perfectly. 
How is this floor, this kind of platform floor held in here? What is that like structurally? So it's using the same brick plates that we use for the roof and the little shelf here. Um, you can kind of see underneath there. But uh, there's, it's in two sections for transport reasons, and then uh, it's actually attached to these columns there, so they do you know, function as columns. Um, I mean, pretty, pretty basic when you, all things considered, when you compare it to the roof, which is a similar construction. No, but it works very, very, very nicely there. Yeah. So were you guys able to keep track of the part count? Do you have any idea how many pieces are in this at all? So I can confirm there is 15,000 two by six bricks at, for the inner structure. After that, I lost count. <laughs> um, I'd say, you know, with all the tiles, the little tiny pieces, it, it definitely gets upwards of 50,000. It might even be 100,000 pieces. I have no clue at this point, but we've, we've gone through so many tiles. Oh my God. Um, but yeah, it, at least 50,000 pieces at that minimum. Did you keep track of the minifigures in it? Yeah, so I know there's 30, 37 lightsabers in here, so there's at least 37 Jedi. For clone troopers, there's probably at least 100, 150 regular 501st clone troopers. Uh, we got some brick arms on them. Uh, yeah, they, uh, we have all kinds of different scenes being depicted everywhere. A lot of the Jedi are random Jedi. There are a few like named Jedi, like Quinlan Voss is right here. We know from the Obi-Wan show that he survived, so I wanted to have him in the mock. Um, but my friend Shane actually came in here, uh, as well as, was it Alec? Alec, yes. Yeah, Alec also came in. Both of them were helping out with placing all these minifigures. They did a great job on that. Um, I love the way everything came out. I don't know how my friend, like, I mean, we put place the minifigures the way the build is, and like, you know, it might be, it might not show as well on the camera, but it is extremely hard to reach back there. I don't know how they got minifigures all the way in the back, but they did it, and I'm so happy with the way it worked out. Uh, they did a great job. Over here, you know, you'll see there's lightsabers going through clone troopers in the back. You know, we we have some pretty brutal shots of things, but I mean, that's what you see in the movies. So, you know, we're only depicting what what we've seen in Star Wars and. You know, obviously, Lee and I are giant Star Wars fans. This is this is a dream come true. Nobody's attempted the Jedi Temple at this scale. This is the first time anybody's done something like this. Um, it's something I knew I wanted to do like two years ago. I was originally going to do this with uh, Jay. You know Jay. He's done, he's done other builds. And then Matt, you just interviewed him for his Raxus build. I originally wanted to do it with him. But like Lee came along. I was like, bro, you know, I, I want to do this temple. What do you think about doing it? And he, I mean, it, it just happened. Um, and honestly, I... This dude is just fantastic to build with. He's, I, t I keep telling him, if we're ever gonna go, if I ever did the Lego Masters show, like went on as a contestant, like I'd only do it with him. He's such a good builder. We're in sync with each other. I don't have to tell him like what I'm thinking. He just knows. It's just, it's that quick snap where like we're on the same page all the time, and that's how the build also just went so quickly. It's like we weren't fighting on each other. Like, oh no, this needs to happen or that needs to be there. We just agreed on everything. Was there ever a time we didn't agree? Well, let me just say, I'm very flattered, David. Thank you for all the compliments. I feel great right now. Um, but it really it really was effortless. I've worked with people in the past and a lot of times there's things you butt heads with, but it was truly a seamless, effortless experience, experience like working together. Um, we just each worked on like a different section and a lot of people ask us like how exactly we collaborated. But I mean, we were just building at the same time and we each knew what we were doing. We knew what the end goal was. So, you know, maybe David was building some of the slopes on the side and I was figuring out exactly how we were gonna put together the interior, you know, I had to measure everything out, make sure it was replicable for all the sides, whatnot. So I mean it was it was it was a very easy um, experience to work with and we didn't really think about it. So that's kinda why when I get asked the question like how we work together, it's kinda hard to answer because it was just it was really easy. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic to hear. So do you guys have plans to expand on this build in any way, or is this is this all done for now? So the uh, the exterior, I think, is, is pretty much complete. There's a few things I might add on the roof, but um, I, th I don't think it'll get physically bigger. If anything, I'd extend the front area, and that would just be like tiles and stairs. I wouldn't make the physical building any bigger than what it is, but I do want to add more room. So obviously these blacked out areas at the top area where the Jedi Council room is, um, those areas I do want to add rooms to. You know, I think there's definitely room if we wanted to add little mini rooms along here on each side. I think that's also very possible. I don't have any plans to like destroy this immediately. I don't need the parts for the next build I'm going to be working on. So it'll stay up for probably the next couple months, next year, maybe more than that. Um, and so hopefully we'll bring it to another show with even more rooms inside the interior. Sounds good. Well, great work to both of you. Thank you so much for all the effort you put into building this and bringing it out to the show here. Certainly looks fantastic, and I'm sure the public has loved it coming by as well. Yeah, we've got a great response from the public and um, exhibitors alike, so I'm very thrilled that it's being received well.
Perfect. Keep up the good work, guys. Cool. Thank you, guys. My name's Corey Langford. This is my build. This is the um, Rebel Space Station StarCraft testing facility. So just like all of my builds, I really like to do something Star Wars inspired, but I also don't want to do something that you've seen in the movies. I like to build something that nobody's seen before, and it's something that may be in that universe, but not necessarily in that particular movie. So what we can do is we'll start here, and then we'll work our way around, and I'll kind of show you and give you kind of a tour of it. Sounds good. So let's dive into this section here. So this section right here is one of the three bays that holds the ships. So each one of them has a bay door that opens up. And inside of it is all the different fighters. There's a bomber, there's a fighter, and then there's a small fighter. And each one of them has a tunnel that comes across. And the tunnel, that's a walkway on the top. And on the bottom, you can kind of see it in there. There's a rail system with one of the Lego roller coaster tracks. And the idea is, is that it brings across the um, pilots into the, into the main um, hangar area so that they can do. But all the custom, all the bombers are custom, all the fighters are custom. I just wanted to do something that, that didn't use any sets. So you're going to kind of see a lot of just original pieces in there. And then the smaller tunnels are what would be for docking. So you would have shit, large ships fly up and they would dock to these docking rings that you're seeing. And then inside of those, are tun uh, the tunnels are um, people that would just be kind of walking towards the ships and would be as part of, as part of the crew and part of um, people going in and out of the space station. Then um, this particular piece is one of the, uh, is the engine to the whole facility. So this particular engine, I really like to use the, um, this is a part usage that I really liked, which was the Lego um, basketball arena set. And the, um, the white ones are from like a Lego snowboarding X game set. I've had them for years and I've never used them. So I was like, I really wanted to use them on something. So this came in really handy to do the engine, but all of these pieces open up as well. To reveal the inside. And on the inside, you have all the different, um, like the power station on the bottom are some of the Lego X-Pods as kind of shield generators. And also another piece that I've had for years that a lot of people have never figured out a way to use are these Lego fiber optics. So I was able to finally use those old fiber optics from like 1994 or something and be able to use them into this to kind of do something for like what may be the hyperdrive. Those pod pieces are great for space builders. I've seen other builders use those. Those are so perfect for building things like that. Yeah, I really like those pieces and um, hopefully figure out a way to stick a light in them um, and maybe make them light up tonight during our, our night event. So that's my plan for that. And then kind of keep and continue our round, we have another docking ring. So in all, you have four major, um, four major tunnels and then the four minor tunnels. And so each one of them is, is kind of built really similar, maybe a little difference on the people that are in them, but for the most part, they're the same. And then um, rolling around to the next big hub. Oh, and, and along the way, we, I have, I've kind of, I built too much, too much maintenance craft and too many fighters. Um, so I've actually kind of had those displayed out as well that this would be the craft that would that would serve the, the um, space station in its maintenance, repair, garbage disposal, whatever you can imagine. These are some fantastic, they're smaller builds, but lots of good detail. Even the colors you use and everything stand out there. Yeah, I wanted something that if you put them in the space station, they're not, you know, the, the knee-jerk reaction is to build something the same color as the station. Because you're like, I want it to be like the station. But what I found is, is that when you do that, it blends in really badly. So what I did is I wanted to build something green and yellow and dark green and, and something that when you put it inside the station that everything kind of stood out there. And then the, um, some of these recon fighters that I made, um, one interesting part usage on the exhaust, I used the Lego hot dog bun <laughs> <laughs> just to try to have something that was kind of neat, a neat little piece usage and all on that. Um, they all fold up, and then again in this one, we'll open up this bay door. And inside of it, we have the next, we have one of the recon fighters getting ready to take off. So they have the droids and the repair ships and all inside of it, repairing it, getting ready for flight. So that's one of those tunnels. And then we'll make our way along to the next one. Again, another one of the small ones with people and all in it with the docking rings. And these are my other new fighter. This fighter right here is kind of like, I kind of wanted something that was small, like the A-Wing, that would be really fast, really agile. And these are kind of what I came up with. One of the things that I'm most proud of on this one is that I was able to get a landing gear on it so that it actually folds up and becomes more um, flat, but making it so that it had a landing gear on it as well. A great sleek looking design there. Uh, yeah, I was challenged with that. Somebody, um, my son actually told me, he said, he goes, man, he goes, this is great. He goes, but you, 
he can't just flop over in the front. It looks like it's wrecked. And I was like, I know. And he was like, you got to figure out a way to put a landing foot on it. So after a while of messing with it and playing with it, I finally figured it out. And it, I think it turned out okay. And then again, we have this over here. We have the those particular, those, those fighters inside of the bay. So all of those fighters are inside the bay. And I actually put a few more of those in there since um, and kind of built the walkway different in this particular hub so that you could be able to see um, on top and on top of that and have the walkway visible. And then finally over there is a um, kind of a Millennium Falcon-esque type freighter that um, would, would be something that would serve the station, whether bringing supplies or troops in and out. That's kind of what it, its primary purpose would be. It would be to get people in and out, but just something that was kind of matching. And that was actually the first thing I built. And I actually built that years ago and just recolor schemed it so that it would kind of match the station itself. So this is such a magnificent build. The scale of this build is just crazy. Do you know like part count or general size of these different sections? So part count is yes. Um, I have no idea how much are in it. Somebody asked me the other day, said, if somebody comes and asks you, do you know the answer? I said, no. They said, just say more than five. And I said, okay, that'll work. And, um, but when it comes to the actual scale, it's right at about 12 feet in, um, in diameter. Um, when I started building it, I actually didn't get to, to actually see it fully built until about a week ago. Um, and I actually had to pull out our cars from the garage and build it in the garage on folding tables so that I'd have the chance to be able to see it fully built before I came here, um, which I'm glad I did. That was a, a learning experience of how you know it best came together. And then one thing I didn't take into consideration, it has about, um, I think it's 18 or 20 USB cords running into that middle hub over there, right under the main tower. But um, in it, I, I was, it's, the problem was, is how do you get to it? And so I actually had to leave one of the small tunnels off so that I could get all the, the USBs plugged in. And then I was able to hook that last, that last tunnel in and it was done. But um, an Easter egg on that middle hub, that red orb that you see, inside of that red orb, um, you'll find Princess Leia, C-3PO, and R2-D2. It's kind of an Easter egg drop inside of it. So is that USB you were talking about? Is that what runs all these lights? Because you've got lights running all the way out in these tunnels. Yeah, so um, I have the USB cords, and there's some Lego lights, whether it be light-up blocks or light-up um, bricks. There's some lights that are um, just different different usage of, of, of a lot of different light kits. And then they all run out in the bottom, and I have um, five external batteries running it all. And we'll see how long they last. <laughs> yeah, it's quite the operation here. Another thing that stands out when you first come up to this build is the color scheme. So it's largely you know, blue and white with some gray in there. How did you decide on that color, and was it difficult to acquire those parts? So what I wanted to do is, is the last build that I did, which y'all featured a few years ago, we had um, a really tall space station that we did, and it was red, white, and blue, and gray. And so what I wanted to do this time was do something that complemented it. So I did white, blue, gray, and dark gray. So that um, my plan is just to display this one and the really tall one together at some shows. So I really wanted to land on that, but really and truly the thing that started me down the path of blue were the, was the engine and using those um, that part, that NBA arena part, because they only make them in white and blue, and the white ones are, very, are actually a lot harder to find. So that's what set me on the path to use blue. That makes sense. Another thing that stands out is all of the window pieces here. So you've got like straight ones for the, the bay areas here, and then the tunnels have the rounded parts. Uh, are those easy to acquire in this quantity? So um, a few years ago, they released some sets that had them in it, and so I bought them directly from LEGO. You know, I was lucky in that in the fact that, that they were there, and also through Lugbolt, um, they had some curved light of, of those as well. So I was able to acquire them, and I'll be honest with you, when I acquired them, I, like, I knew that I would use them for something. I just didn't know that it would be this. And, um, and I thought, I have more of these than I will ever need. And I actually only have one left, one singular window left after this build. So it came in quite perfect on, on that, that I was able to do it. I was getting a little nervous that I wouldn't have enough, but it, it worked out. Sometimes the planning actually works like you want it to. <laughs> yeah, not always, but yeah, it's, it worked in this case. And then um, on the ends of the tunnels, the small tunnels, I used um, the pods and, the, and that part that you see, that escape droid part, that's that white and blue painted piece that's printed on there. And um, I had a few of those, but of course I had to acquire those over several different BrickLink orders to be able to get them in the quantity that I wanted. But just wanted that little pop of blue color at the end. So using those really worked out well for that as well. 
With all of the clear windows throughout this build, is there still pretty good structure when you're moving this to a show? Do things tend to stay together pretty decent? It, it does. There's um, one or two parts that, that probably the middle hub where everything hooks together that I probably will rethink when I get back and probably put a little bit more structural integrity inside of it. But the tunnels themselves and the ends especially, the ends where all the fighters are, they stay together really surprisingly well. I'll put it that way because I thought we were going to have a disaster on our hand when we got here. But they actually stayed together really, really well. But it's the, it's that middle hub that's the, that's the catch because you're plugging everything into it and you're pushing in. So when you're pushing in, it wants to try to break apart. So that building a little more structural integrity in that will be really good. Yeah. Well, it's certainly a fantastic build. It's very eye-catching here. I love all the lights, all the, the ships that you made for and everything and the whole story you're telling. So thank you so much for giving us a tour of the base. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, guys. My name's Anthony Preston. Um, I call this the Emancipation of Endor. It's uh, 100,000 pieces. It's over 130 square feet. And um, it's, it's kind of my, it's, it's, it's my design. Um, you know, I can't take 100% credit for the landing platform. I purchased those off Rebrickable. But everything else is us. Uh, we wanted to do something unique. We wanted to do something fun. Uh, so we've got a little running train track. We've got a working waterfall. And uh, we've got a lot happening here on Endor. Uh, it's meant to be after Return of the Jedi and the kind of uh, things have gone poorly on Endor and the Rebels are returning to fight again. Gotcha. So before we enter deeper into the forest, let's take a look at kind of what you have under oh, yeah, the landing so platform. This is obviously Thunderdome. I mean, the, uh, the, the Stormtroopers are kind of morbid. So they're going to take Frank from the old Orion sets and uh, have him fight some Ewoks. <laughs> and then we've got the next contestants right here. Yep. Got a couple shuttles up here on our platform. And uh, whichever way you guys want to go. Uh, we'll, we'll go around this side. That way we can get a good shot of the waterfall. So as we enter into the forest. This is some lore right here of uh, the story we're trying to tell. Essentially... Um, Kind of combining some retcon and some Knights of the Old Republic uh, and a little bit of episode seven, between six and seven. Uh, so yeah, let's take a walk. Uh, so right here, I mean, uh, a couple kids helped me out. They got really interested with the figures. It's just a bunch of uh, Imperial mercenaries fighting off the rebels that have landed to, to retake control. Um, each tree is over 100,000 pieces. I mean, I'm sorry, each tree is 1,000 pieces, give or take. Uh, there's 29 or 30 regular trees and eight pillar trees. Uh, the pillar trees hold the platform. Uh, we can keep going this way to the marketplace. Uh, I wanted to make this like a functioning Ewok village like before maybe the attack happened. So if you look at the marketplace, like we got our fish sellers, they're selling reindeer. Uh, there may be a character or two you recognize in a cage that may be for sale, maybe Dorothy or E.T. Um, I like the bridges. I like the fact that we use the train track. I mean, the, uh, the bridge tread between the bridges, I thought that was really good. Um, the huts on the side are meant to be Ewok huts from Trouble of Tatooine. Um, we laid every single blade of grass here at Brick Fair. Uh, we didn't travel with any grass with us. Um, it's my dad, Don Hi. Austin. Good to meet you. And uh, uh, we basically assembled everything except the ATATs, the uh, landing platform, and portions of the waterfall here uh, since Tuesday. Uh, basically, hand assembled it all. Uh, what else to say? So this has been a several day process. So you oh, said yeah. you started on Tuesday, and now it's uh, Saturday we today. Last night. Yeah, Late last night. Tuesday. We packed Tuesday morning. We got to the hotel Tuesday. We started laying grass. And then we got here Wednesday to open and started bringing on pallets. Fantastic. We'll keep moving around the display here then. So we'll go to the other side of kind of the, the main central market area there. What else do we have going on? You know, it's it's a lot of just like little tiny Easter egg and chaos battle type stuff. We didn't want to make like some sort of like Pelennor field type thing where there's armies meeting in the middle. It's designed to just be chaos on Endor. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of chaos, you can see a uh, well, tipped over. Course, yes, there's a downed at, -AT and actually that downed at, -AT caused a lot of damage. Because when I went in to fix it earlier is when we had the what I like to call deforestation, uh, the trees collapsing. Um, we've got a little speeder bike chase, a marauder chasing a speeder bike here uh, on a hot wired Lego battery. Officially Lego, just soldered a little bit. Are, are these trees pretty stable then or how have these held up so no, far? Um, as long as you don't touch them, they're stable. <laughs> No, but actually, uh, we'll go look at this one. This one doesn't have any bridges. Oh, this one does have a bridge. Don't touch that one. Um, they're actually just not construction. They're, uh, they're octagonal. They're about 1,000 pieces each. 
and they may or may not have weights at the bottom. Whatever it takes to keep them up. I'm sure they're official Lego weights because no one's going to look inside and find out. So the other really unique feature of this display is this real water function. Absolutely. So take us through the whole kind of design we of that. I've seen it before, so we wanted to do it. I, I called my dad up one day, and I'm like, Dad, I need your help to make a waterfall. So I'm thinking, you know, we put it on a pallet. He saws all uh, Home Depot pond mold into the pallet. We went to Lowe's. We got a waterfall box and some tube. And then he's running up through some milk crates. But of course, that would look ugly. So then those are soccer plates. I'm going to claim the most soccer plates of any individual in the world. That's insane. Those are just piles of those soccer plates piles all around. Of soccer plates and then, you know, vines along the side. Um, I really think they look good. It looks good, especially from a distance. Uh, use some Duplo to, to cover it all up, and there may be some green duct tape. And the sound is a 16 track sound running off Bluetooth from a cell phone continuously. Yeah. And now uh, so let's go around the edge here. You know, uh, eventually the next phase of Endor here will be traps. We want a great ball type contraption where it's throwing bowlers down and smashing into ATSCs. This will be uh, in the works for some time still, but right now we think it looks pretty good. This is only our second show. The first show was Brick World Michigan in 2019, and it will be back at Brick World Chicago when they open up again. Yeah, it's a fantastic layout. So what made you want to tackle Endor for this kind of giant project? I always like Return of the Jedi. I think it's the second best Star Wars movie only to Rogue One. And uh, so I, I like the organic nature. You know, you can, make, you can make big structures, big skyscrapers. You can make them thick. You can make them tall. But there's something about the difficulty of and pulling off an organic display that I really like. Sure, yeah. You know, all of these trees that you have in here, you've got to get all that set up. The platforms, placing all the minifigures. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I, I like the challenge of the organic display. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as you ex expand on this or add things in the future, are you going to add any more like movement, trains, that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. We want rotating GBC-style traps that uh, auto-respond and auto-reset. And, uh, you know, we'll go a little bit bigger, we'll go a little bit taller, we'll go tops of the trees. And uh, you know what? If we can add another water feature, we'll do it. The first one wasn't that hard. We may put a, we may put a river through it yeah. and things like that. And uh, like you said, work off the top. And we want multiple traps that are triggered via light sensors. So as uh, stormtroopers come by on a track, Ewoks will capture them or something. And it's just a question of automating the reset of each trap so that it doesn't require, it'll be event driven. We know that every 10 minutes this one this one clicks and every five minutes that one does. So uh, just engineering the reset without manual intervention that we have yet to nail down. And I think we need the Ewok gliders to circle. Right now they're stationary and uh, they should be spinning. Yeah. So with this water feature then, is there any uh, danger to the Lego bricks with a water feature like that? Can it, can it hurt them in any way? Have you found no, any issues? I think so I mean, you just gotta dry them off. You obviously don't wanna get them wet then freeze them. But they'll dry. They may, you know, you may, may want to make sure they'll dry or else they'll smell or something like that. But no, we're going to cross that bridge when we get there. Um, you know, if you had it continually running over water for hour and hour and hour, I'm sure it could take some paint off. I'm sure it could, it should, it could dull it like the Grand Canyon, you know, but not at this, not at this phase. No, nothing. Not now that I'm aware of. Well, it's a, it's a very impressive layout, uh, not only in size, but all the fun minifigures yeah, and little scenes you've got going on here. So I'm glad you could bring this out to the show here. Appreciate the tour. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Good love you. Good love what you guys do.
Hi, I'm Lego Gavin on Instagram and YouTube. I'm the Lego World War on Instagram. And this is our giant Star Wars battle, uh, Star Wars Battle in Atanes. Um, it's a made up planet, we just kind of took inspiration from some other stuff and just kind of put it all together. Uh, we're into history, World War One and Two, so that majorly influences all the battlefield stuff. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah, you can definitely see that influence, which I think is really neat because it kind of gives that more realistic feel that you don't normally get with a Star Wars build. Even though then you you've got all the Star Wars figs here as well. So I think it's a cool kind of mashup there. I like that. So then, if you want to kind of take us through the the different sections of the build. All right. Yeah. Sure. Let's start with the village. Uh, so towards the back here, we have the village. Um, we kind of have like the two Twelfth Legion here on a flanking mission. Uh, coming in to take control of the village um, and towards the middle here uh, the main portion of the battlefield the main force is attacking from the far side one thing you notice right away when you walk up here is the the minifigs so talk about it. is any of that stuff custom or are these all standard kind of lego star wars minifigs that you've used in here yeah they're mostly so all the base figs are um, normal lego figures okay. and then we got clone army customs uh, helmets and the macros and some figures every once in a while so yep Okay. Yeah. And I want to point out the caves down here. We haven't been able to put the lights in yet, but we'll try to get those tonight for the World of Lights. But yeah, adds another kind of nice layer to, to the build. Yeah. That's that's really neat. And then talk about how you did the texture and kind of the landscape here, because obviously you've got cool trenches and stuff. So how did that come together? Um, what we originally did, uh, we stacked all of the plates. They're 16 by 16 plates, 10 high, and then went through with detail pieces. We started in layers, doing like darker colors towards the bottom, lighter towards the top. Um, we drew a lot of inspiration from, like he said, uh, World War era battlefields. Uh, and then we came back and did some rock work over that. Yeah, I think it, it works really well. And you can see some nice lighting as well there. How, how did you incorporate that into the build? Uh, that was kind of a last minute thing we did last night. So okay. we, we tried to hide, hide the wires the best we could. But yeah, we got like uh, the red flashing ones all inside of here. The wires run through and come out the wall on the other side there. So mm -hmm. it's a nice little extra level of detail. So as you two were collaborating on this, was it uh, in person? You guys kind of worked on it together then? Yeah, so we live in the same town. We've been best okay. friends forever. So we put this at my house, and he'd just come over and just work on it for as long as we could, get as much done during the school year. So, yeah. Yeah, that works really well then. I think it's a great layout. So thanks so much for bringing it to the show, and thanks for chatting with me. I'm Joshua Hanlon here at Brickworld Chicago 2019, and I've got two builders of this massive Hoth base layout here. So if you guys want to introduce yourselves, and we'll launch into the build. Sure. I'm Scott Vandalese from uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Carrie Warren from Kenosha, Wisconsin. I had a Christmas village, and we wanted to do a Hoth collaborative. So I took the mountain and started bringing it together, and Carrie had a base, too. And we've just started expanding on it, added the ion cannon, added the wampa, and this is the first time we're really showing it complete. Um, but yeah, so I had a lot of details, you know, like the snow speeder crash, um, you know, built the trenches in, so we got the war going on. And, um, you know, little force perspective in the back with like the Millennium Falcon. And then, Carrie, you can talk about the inside the base. Yeah, so we have the inside of the base. Um, try to make like a, a cross section. So you have the buildings that are open so you can see 
you know, what's inside and uh, have the Falcon that's open so you can see what's going inside other than just having a, you know, a full set there, right? Uh, try to throw in some jokes and some gags, some uh, things that really, you know, aren't, shouldn't, shouldn't be there. But, you know, it's fun for the kids, yeah. right? Like Olaf dancing in the, uh, in the nightclub is always fun for the kids. <laughs> Exactly. It's fun to have those details. And then for the, the section outside the base here, one thing that really caught my eye that I haven't seen on a lot of Hoth bases is kind of the mountains and everything. Usually it's just so flat. So how would you decide to include that part? It was kind of by accident. Like I said, we did it. I wanted something for a Christmas village, and I built the mountains for that because everything is flat, like you said. And I wanted a backdrop. And then when we realized we could do this, we just started adding to it. Yeah. Perfect. So then what else do we have happening in kind of the main battle scene here? Yeah, so some of the battles, so we got, obviously, we, we shot down this Adat here. He's, uh, he's all tipped over. We got the snow speeder bikes running out. We got all the commanders watching through their goggles while they send the, the stormtroopers all to be shot up front. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. We have, you know, the Tauntaun, you know, laying, laying there with the, you know, his, his blue guts all over the place, which is, you know, that's fun. And then was it difficult to incorporate the train track sort of within the larger build? Yeah, so it's it yes and no. So the tunnel, the mountain is part of it was for Christmas, right? To build a tunnel for the train to go through. And then when we talked about doing this, we're like, hey, what can we put on the train track? And obviously we should have a snow speeder running through. Yeah. Fantastic work. So let's move back into the base then real quick and see if we can point out a few more details and kind of what's happening in here. So uh, I know you mentioned some of the buildings, but what else do we have going on here? Yeah, we have the medical bay with the uh, you know the the hockey uh, the hockey guy who had a, a bad match, and we have the uh, the control room with the uh, you know video game consoles and stuff, and the nightclub because you know you got to have a nightclub. You know. <laughs> then we have the Falcon with uh, uh, Han taking a shower, uh, you know, because you know you get dirty in space. All right, and then we have uh, up at the top we got you know Darth Vader chasing some. Some troopers, and then we have the penguin in hiding uh, over here with some uh, some of his penguin troopers laying around. And then at the back, of course, you have to have you know something happening to Jar Jar with the you know the Wampa attack. So. <laughs> There's always something happening to Jar Jar. It's it's a rule. It has to be there, you know. <laughs> so what is set up like for you guys with this whole display when you bring it to a show? Well, we, the the first thing is uh, well Scott started with his first, and then. I brought mine in, and you know, you know get, getting the track to line up is, is fun, and then getting the uh, the merge between the mountain range and, and and the base because you know they were built at different times, and you know we, we tried uh, remotely to get it to, to line up, but once we got here, you know, you know, some fine tuning and stuff to get to get it to match up a little better, but you know, it's a what a couple days to set up. Yeah, it took it took a lot longer. Uh, carry we, in K Lug, we always challenge each other. We call it wretched excess. So every time we come in, we're like, "Oh, that's good, but it would be better if." So I had to rebuild a bunch of stuff because Carrie gave me a challenge. I had to put all the track and brick, and so I had a lot of stuff I wasn't done with. So I didn't get done till yesterday, just before dinner. Another major element of what you guys did here is kind of the the one by one studs that you use as kind of snow texture. Yeah, I could talk about that. So when we built, when I built everything up on the white, um, it started getting really shiny. And I think you've seen builds before where people have put water out, you know, use the one by one studs. So uh, they were on the pick a brick wall. So I spread some out and it really diffused the light, scattered the light a lot better and it makes it look way more natural. So uh, you can see there's little pieces of, of smooth pieces. That's a lot of the build is I've got to put all those smooth pieces in place and so they kind of stick up, and it, it just doesn't look like, um, like the dots. It sort of looks like a more natural landscape. Fantastic work. Thank you both so much for taking us through the layout here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi there, Joshua Hanlon here at Bricks Cascade 2019, and I'm joined by a couple of younger builders here who brought this great Sarlacc pit build, and so they're going to take us through all the fun little details they've incorporated. If you guys want to introduce yourselves, then we'll dive into the build. I'm Elhanan Hostler. Wow. And I'm Marco McVarish. 
Okay, and you want to give an overview of what we have here? Uh, well, so it's supposed to be uh, what it's like to be inside the Sarlacc's stomach or what you would do during the thousand year digestion of the Sarlacc while you're still conscious. So, so we start with the, the top part there that's kind of the most famous part that everyone recognizes. Uh, so let's start there and talk briefly about that and then move down through the different areas. So uh, basically what we did was try to recreate uh, the scene from the movie with Boba Fett falling into the Sarlacc pit. And we spent, what was it, like three days on the texturing part just for the top. And we actually ended at the top. Uh, and so we, what we have is when you fall into the Sarlacc pit, you will go down into the waiting room over there. And we have a ton of people waiting to get into, what would we call it? Um, the, the Sarlacc Hotel or Sarlacc... Take, take your pick, lounge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the Sarlacc Lounge, yeah. And uh, the red carpet is a nice touch on the first layer there. You know, you kind of get the, the golden, uh, you know, stanchions and the, the red carpet. Very fancy when you first fall into the pit. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, we tried to, like, um, sort of, like, make it, like, waiting to get into a hotel or a ride for a carnival. And, uh, Hannah, would you like to do the... Yeah, so uh, after, you, after you finish waiting, you walk into this cave and you fall down into what would be the, the bar or the area where you can get some drinks and just try and relax while you're in pain of being digested by the Sarlacc. And there you just try and be alive while you're... Being digested in your debt. Yeah. <laughs> so then there is um, a little waterfall that has a tiny sarlacc where there is stomach acid from the sarlacc being uh, transported down to the next area. And so what's the next area? Uh, well, I'm going to move on to the swimming pool down there. So the swimming pool is all, uh, because it's a sarlacc and it's a living creature, it's all the stomach acid inside of the sarlacc pit. And basically when you're being digested for thousands of years, you're going to grow sort of immune to the acid. So these people down there are using it as a swimming pool, but you can see a lot of them are dying. And then if you travel sort of to the left and up, we have tubes taking the acid from the stomach and doing research uh, on the components of the acid and then we will move down to uh, the dance hall. Oh, Hannah? Yeah, in the dance hall you just dance your heart out until you die where you can just try and be happy while the death is coming upon you where there's some music being played by Jar Jar Binks and the Bricks Cascade uh, band and there, you, there's a hole that you can be sucked into down to where you're finally digested in the death pit. Yeah, um, so we should have made more puns for this. Um, so the death pit is where we started. And then we kind of moved over to that little cave over there. Um, the cave, it, it collapsed a couple of times and we had to redo it. Uh, but at the beginning when we had only a little bit of bricks. Uh, we tried to make the cave and it, it was pretty costly on the bricks that we had. But then after it collapsed, we found a better way to do it. Uh, and so we have supports in the back, which you can't see, and they're all over the place. And then, yeah, we basically went up from there. But the most challenging part about this was uh, the back because of the supports. And uh, we didn't, we barely had enough bricks to finish off the top. So it's like, if you breathe on it, it's going to fall over. Um, and, you know, we had school weeks, so we had to take the weekends. And we worked on this for an entire year, anytime we could. Yeah. Most of the time we would just try and make sure that it wouldn't fall over and try and use as many bricks as that we, that we can. So we can get as far as possible in the short weekend that we had.
you had to work with the time you had, but I think your your year long progress definitely shows because you got so many details in there, the fun different rooms and all of that. So I think you can see all the thought you put into it. Yeah, thank you. Um, you can kind of see where we ran out of bricks, and then we kind of so we had to get creative. So we added um, a broken ATST in there, and uh, we had to build around it with rocks. Uh, what we should have done is because rocks are more at the bottom of the surface of the earth and we kind of only thought of putting rocks down in the middle because this was a very ambitious project that we just came up with at school during lunch <laughs> and so you can see where we uh, ran out of bricks and the top we just had a bunch of bricks uh, because we were doing jobs working to get money yeah and there down um, at the death pit, there's a little stormtrooper helmet with a hook in it. And that's um, a little Easter egg for Death Troopers, which is a book, uh, an audio book we were listening to while we were building the, uh, while we were building this and the build. And we just try, we just messed around and we, uh, uh, we've melted a little hole into the, um, into the, uh, the little eye. And then we poked the hook through and hung it down there. So... Just to, to just to be there, which what we um, just to be there as a fun little Easter egg, and then later on um, up 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 and up we were really running out of bricks to the point where the top got done. I would say three or four days before the convention, just trying to hurry and scramble get it done to be ready for the convention and get it all hooked up. And then the lights were also very last minute as well. <laughs> but they add so much to it. I think it really helps you see everything inside there. Yeah, so for the original idea of kind of taking the Sarlacc pit and building all of this here, where, where did that sort of inspiration come from? You guys were just throwing around ideas? Well, um, so Elhanan, uh, it was like two months before the convention last year, and he had built a Star Wars mock. And... Uh, we were kind of talking about entering something, uh, but we didn't have any good ideas. But then we actually came up with one, and it was this. Like, what would be sort of the comedy way of showing what's underneath the Sarlacc besides, well, this is the stomach of the Sarlacc. And so we talked about it at recess, and then we kind of got into it. And then sooner or later, like the next week, we just found ourselves building the death pit at the bottom. And then it just... It really spiraled from there. Mm -hmm. I didn't even expect that we would finish it because it was such an ambitious project for us. I, I really love this so much because it shows what's possible with Lego and you guys have obviously a great imagination and with the ideas you were able to come up here. So you took the, just the idea of the, the simple Sarlacc pit and added so much to it. So I think it's, it's really excellent and a great idea. I look forward to seeing what you guys bring to future shows as well as you continue to build. Hi everyone, Joshua Hamlin here at Brickworld Chicago 2019 and I'm at the Empire Lug Display joined by a couple builders and their Lego Star Wars build here. So if you guys want to introduce yourselves then we'll take a look at the build. Yeah, I'm Lego Gavin on Lego Gavin Productions on Instagram and YouTube. I lead Lego World War on Instagram. And this is our battle of the Siege of Mandalore. Uh, first, before we start anything, we want to give a huge shout out to uh, Tyler from Clonery Customs. He supplied us with all the red Mandalorians and all the 501st troops and the 332nd troops. So uh, this is based from the new episodes from the Clone Wars that are going to come out soon uh, with Darth Maul's red Mandalorians against the blue Mandalorians teamed up with the clones. So we've got the landing pad over on the left-hand side over there, and then you come through the hangar door into the city. So That's a great layout here. So then take us through kind of the, the main action that we have happening out front here. Okay, so essentially we have the clones that have just landed at the end of the landing platform. Uh, they've met up with the blue Mandalorians, and now they're making their first offensive, trying to battle their way inside of the... You know those, like, buildings from the Clone Wars? The Mandalorian, like, like on the planet, they had those big cities that were kind of encased, like, so the hangar doors are the entrances to that. So they're trying to fight their way inside. And then over here we have uh, the start of, like, the city, kind of scaled down. Um, so that's what we have so far. And this, this part with the, the city kind of sidewalks and buildings is really interesting, the way you built that up. So how did you get that to, to all work together? It, it's a lot of technic. Um, set it, it's, the setting up part was hard of it. It's, uh, it wasn't exactly how we had it planned out. Pretty much just major four support beams built all the way up with technic running underneath this whole thing. So it kind of all stays up. Using a lot of the like trans blue pieces throughout it? Yeah, trans blue is a really pretty color. It's kind of expensive. We would have loved to have a lot more, but... 
um, it's a little expensive. <laughs> What, what's happening down here in the, we got like a whole lit up hallway. Yeah, so we just have um, a hallway down here and it kind of leads into um, the bottom of the base or the landing pad, which would kind of be a prison. We have a couple prison cells. So we just got some of the red Mandalorians running through to kind of go into the prison, I guess. And then what's the structure like on that outside section? You built that way up out there. Uh, yeah, so we used a bunch of um, two by 10 support pieces uh, capped off with 16 by 16 plates to add uh, multiple layers for the support structure underneath so it made it very easy for transportation uh, and it breaks apart into like four sections right um, so that was very useful and then we covered the, uh, the top using base plates and then we put uh, our tile pieces over that that works really well so talk a little bit about kind of the collaboration process as you guys worked on this together how did that work yeah, so um, we live in the same town, so we just have the table at my house, and we kind of put our parts together and our money, and we'll come over and build for a weekend throughout the school year. So, yeah. Awesome stuff. Yeah, that's, that sounds like it works well together. Then I'm glad you're able to, to bring the build out to the show here. So do you build for other shows throughout the year, or is this kind of the main location? Yeah, this is the main, this is the main location for us. We, uh, unfortunately, are usually on vacation during Brickworld, Virginia, so we never get to make it out there. But. Well, keep up the good work, guys. Thanks for taking us through the build. Daniel Prilesnik. And Daniel built this awesome Geonosis battle behind me. Dude, how long did it take you? In total, it took one year and ten months. And uh, are you alone on this project, or is that...? I got two other people who helped contribute. One is Mark Puentes. He's my best friend who helped me with this tedious building. There's lots of repetitive stuff. And there's also a guy named Caleb Smith. On Flickr, he's the guy who actually designed the ATTs. You know I have to ask this question. How many pieces? Okay. I can say in little sections. The ATTs are 1,400 pieces each. The union ship is 14,000 and about 600. How many minifigures? Again, in sections, uh, the clones, I have about 202 clone troopers. There is 119 blue super battle droids. And there is about 197 of the Sand Red battle droids. Awesome. And I, I'm guessing the inspiration might have been the movies, the original, uh, the prequel trilogy of Clone Wars. Is there anything else that inspired you to do Geonosis? Yes, there's actually a few. One of them is actually a German creator. I saw his build on uh, Eurobricks, and he actually did part of the Union ship. Um, and this lower section of it, I uh, re-engineered and I modified it to my own likings. And so his mock was one of my uh, inspirations. And there was also uh, the original Star Wars Battlefront, Star Wars Battlefront 2, original Lego game, uh, all that stuff. Yeah. Sweet. So I, I'm just waiting eagerly to get the smoke uh, like a closer look. So we're going to give the microphone to you and we're going to do a tour of the entire battle. I'm going to start on over on the Republic side. I have two of the original 2002 gunships. Fun fact, one of the things that had me start this whole project was this specific gunship. I got it sealed in a box not too long ago, and it was the first thing that started this whole project. Um, I also have the whole battlefield of clone troopers. I have a few custom ones, some with decals and others that were made by uh, David Hull, Minifix for You. He makes some of the amazing custom minifigures and I just had to include some of them in here. Uh, the Galactic Marines was kind of a shout out to the Star Wars Battlefront 2 game. Loved it when I was growing up. The uh, ATTEs here are made by uh, Caleb Smith from Flickr. He uh, is an amazing designer and I saw his designs and I was like, hey, can I use this and just reskin it a bit? And uh, we got these two built for this project. Um, and that was kind of the thing with that as well. There's also a lot of other things, like I have Emmett and Wildstyle over here on a speeder. That speeder is from the original ATTE set in the earlier 2000s. Um, small little shout out. Uh, and of course, Delta Squad, because if anyone has ever played the Republic Commando game, you know that you got to have Delta Squad on Geonosis. So. I also have a whole bunch of different Jedi charging in with their squads of custom figs and other clone troopers ready to battle at the droids. Over closer to the droid side, I have 
many, many blue battle droids and other sand red battle droids that all lined up firing back. Uh, lots of those. And the blue battle droid is actually one of my favorite uh, minifigures ever from Star Wars. And I love collecting them. So I've been collecting them for these past one year and 10 months for this project. Uh, one of the things that I've had before I started this project was that Geonosius turret. Um, I had that set back when I was a kid with the fighter. And that was kind of when I was a kid and I always wanted to create Geonosis. That was another one of the things that kind of helped spark a fire in my heart for this. Um, I also got two Hailfire droids. Uh, one of them was, one, uh, was the model from when I was a kid. Uh, the other one was just an extra add-on. Uh, they are not sadly minifig scale, but they're pretty close. Just because of the size of the wheels, it's, it's hard to find a minifig scaled Hailfire droid. Um, and then closer to the very back corner, I have uh, the Techno Union ship, specifically the Hard Cell Class 2. And it is a monster with 14,000 bricks in short. And it took the longest time. Uh, the Union ship alone took one month of building. Uh, specifically, it was 76 hours I put into it. Um, the hardest part was actually incorporating a Hailfire droid wheel in between the ring and the egg portion of the ship. It took probably a few hours trying to figure out how to do it, but with some gears, I made it work. Um, yeah, it was quite a thing. It was 35 inches tall currently, and it, there's also a mini kit just underneath, uh, just for a shout out to the LEGO Star Wars game as well. A little bit more off the uh, fighters for the stands. That was kind of the hardest thing. They are basically like a ticking time bomb because uh, they are not very sturdy if you want to replicate that. Uh, I would not really recommend it. The fighters themselves I found to be the most nostalgic for my childhood and so I had to incorporate them. I did not want to uh, do any mock of them or anything. Um, but for the uh, gunships, I did do the very classic 1x6x5 clear translucent panels and those are very structurally stable for uh, bigger ships as well. Thank you so much for the amazing tour, appreciate it. Is there any place we can find you to follow your uh, LEGO endeavors? Yes, 90s LEGO guy on Flickr and Caleb Smith on Flickr as well. Uh, we are the two main designers for this whole thing. Is there any other build you have in mind right now after Geonosis? Yes, so Geonosis is not done. There's going to be two more stages. It's going to be probably a four-year endeavor, uh, but I'm also working on an original Kashyyyk, and I'm probably also going to do a Camino as well. I'm Timo. I'm from Germany. Um, Bremen. Um, this is my mock. Um, this is the Tatooine hangar. Um, 94. Um, what are some of your favorite details in here? Um, my favorite details are the troop transport and the stickers um, made by myself and my girlfriend. Okay. And where, where are some of those? Where, where are the, the, the stickers? The stickers okay. are here. And here are the flags mm -hmm. inside on the wall. Like posters and stuff, yeah. yeah. And this little stickers here on the end on the troop transport. And yeah, that's very impressive. So then talk about the big wall and how, how did you, how did you build that? Um, I built it in two steps. Um, the um, floor step um, it's with, made with hinges okay. and it's very tricky um, because it's so um, a rounded shape. Yeah, the rounded shape is um, not easy to make. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the the Millennium Falcon inside there. So is is that one of the official Lego kits, or is that your own custom? Yeah, this is the official Lego okay. set. Um, 
five or four years ago and um, I modified this a little bit. Yeah, lots of, so does this break down into different sections then to set it up? Yeah, um, the um, complete hanger is one plate, um, it's six, um, 48 mile, 48 okay. and the um, front and the back is um, on the on the little plates mm -hmm. and um, the houses b behind and in the front it's built modular it's built modular you can put it off okay. and this is easier yeah well, fantastic work thank you for for bringing it to the show I think that I think it turned out great thank you yeah thank thanks a lot Hi, I'm uh, Owen Cosner or Owen's Bricks on YouTube, and uh, this is my mock, the Separatist, separatist Siege on uh, a Republic facility. Not a Pacific uh, planet, but uh, I see a lot of kids coming out thinking it's a Kashyyyk. I guess it can be. Um, so basically, I have all the uh, Separatist forces coming, storming the beach, uh, and uh, the, Republic, the Republic is uh, coming and trying to stop them, push them back. And I got a few. Uh, uh, squads of uh, droids coming and flanking the uh, uh, Republic forces, um, taking out uh, important defenses and whatnot. Yeah. So yeah, there's quite a large battle happening here. Uh, take us through kind of the the beach scene to start with, in terms of what vehicles you have out here and some of the the characters and minifigures. Yeah, so I have um, some gunships, uh, tanks, uh, spider droids, and I have all the. Uh, Ground troops, uh, B1, B2 battle droids, some destroyers uh, coming. Uh, uh, there's a troop carrier as well, uh, some speeders, and the Republic, uh, they have a gunship of their own, uh, ATT uh, speeders and ATRTs, uh, you know, got their clone troopers coming, and some Jedi leading the battle. And then on the droid side, they got this General Grievous coming in, and he's finding a Jedi. Hopefully to take his lightsabers for his own. <laughs> Lots of different armaments and characters involved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So then as we, we move beyond the beach, then you get into some of the, the grassy area and the, the bridge. What's happening in this section? Yeah, so I have a turbo tank uh, coming across the bridge right now to join the battle. Um, and over here I have some commander droids uh, with a Saj Ventress coming in. They flanked uh, through the hangar on the other side and going through the door to take out um, some of the clones that are over here getting ready to uh, join the battle uh, so their reinforcements won't come. Uh, and then I have uh, these jet droids over here. They're taking out this um, uh, missile uh, 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 launcher type of thing. Yes. <laughs> uh, I just lost my train of thought there. Uh, and they're coming to join the battle on the landing pad over here. And one thing that adds a, uh, some nice height and detail to the build is these two kind of mountain sections yeah. on the side. So this one closest to us here, what do you have inside there? So you have a hangar right here. We got a Jedi Starfighter uh, coming through, uh, going out the hangar and uh, to join the battle. Uh, got a few crates, a mini kit, uh, of course, great Easter egg, as always. Uh, and then a command center over here uh, with some uh, officers uh, kind of uh, strategizing and uh, what the plan is for the battle. And then you've even got some kind of guns and turrets on the front here, especially like the far one there that has uh, the shots coming out of it. Yes, uh, uh, on, the, on that side there's also the explosion which I really like, um, uh, yeah. So, so this is quite an expansive build uh, in terms of like base plates and size. Where did you start with this as you kind of map the whole thing out? Yeah, so the start was the mountains. Uh, just kind of plan what the best uh, parts that I had already, what I needed to buy, and kind of uh, how it's going to look. There's definitely some changes that I needed to make to kind of uh, compensate for uh, some changes that happened along the way and stuff I did not account for. Uh, like originally, I was going to have a bridge that went uh, across from these two mountains, but it turned out that it wasn't going to be tall enough, so I just went with these two platforms. Excellent. So now let's go around to the other side and we can take a look inside that other mountain. Yeah. On this side, I have uh, this armory over here where we got some clones getting some 
uh, weapons uh, to go uh, during the battle. And then I have this kind of reactor room and I actually did incorporate some lights into this side. Uh, I can turn them on for you. So in here, you turn it on, them on, you can see you have some green lights kind of shining down. Um, sadly, it just I couldn't show them really to anyone. Um, I was kind of just experimenting. I've never done lights before, so I just kind of wanted to try something new. And then finally, we have another hangar bay on the bottom. Uh, we have some swamp speeders, uh, and then this tank came out of the um, hangar uh, through this uh, bridge, uh, and they're coming through the battle. I like the use of the blue clear pillars as kind of the, the light bridge idea there. Yes, uh, I got inspired by that by uh, the Clone Wars. There's one episode on Ryloth where they're cro crossing a, a bridge similar to that. I wanted to try to do uh, that uh, in this mock. Now, when you bring a build like this to a show, do you set up all of these minifigures and ships once you get here, and then it's, it's just kind of whatever you feel like doing once you're actually at the show? Uh, yes, I did set everything up at my uh, house in my room. It was very cramped, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I got most of it set up to kind of get an idea of what I wanted to do when I got here so it was a little quicker uh, and then I took pictures of it so I knew exactly kind of what I wanted to do but there was some changes that I did make um, when I got here like this whole area with the mountains I hadn't had set up uh, so that was all I uh, did all that uh, here um, and the mock it transports each uh, base plate uh, there are three by four gray base plates they come apart and are connected using uh, Technic uh, pieces. That's a great strategy making it modular like that. So excellent layout here. I'm glad you were able to set this all up at the show. Thank you. My name's Corey Langford. Um, this is my build, the, the Rebel Alliance Space Station. So what I kind of built here is something based on the um, idea that that some of these people in Star Wars would need some kind of backup. So this particular vessel is something in which um, they would use for logistical support. So if you take a look at the bottom, I have some of the ships that you may see around it. Um, this right ship right here would actually dock to the rings here. Um, up here a little bit further, you have all the engines that um, actually spin and move. So all the engines to actually propel the, the piece of it. Wow. And all of these rotate. And then the other thing, this right here, this ring right here is what like kind of a directional ring. So if the space station, if you can imagine it, it would actually need to spin on a 360. So these would be like the engines that would be used to spin it 360. If you take a look inside of this particular ring, you'll see this, the power station. You'll see the, um, the red power orbs inside of it to actually power the, the, the deal. And then one section up is the living quarters. All the living quarters have beds, they have a sink, they have a shelf, they have everything you could possibly need, and there's a person in every one with lights. Then one up is the fuel tanks. The fuel tanks are some um, actually Lego X-Pods, which is I think kind of a neat part use, and they all have the trans, the trans yellow, um, neon yellow um, lights in them to look like fuel, and you can see the fuel lines running up past there, and then what the idea is is that a ship would dock here and then these lines right here would come out and actually refuel these ships. So kind of the idea behind that. And then finally, you have the, um, the, the layers above, which is kind of the central hub. And inside of each of the hub is kind of all the repair craft and all the pieces and parts to repair any ship that may happen. So all the doors actually open on every one of them. So you can actually take a look inside. And then you see you'll have all the kind of the idea behind it is you have your, your mechanics and your mechs and all your equipment and things like that and crates for them to be able to take and, and repair with. And then on the very top is the actual command center with all the different parts, that the, all the people in there and all the computers and all the, all the pieces and things that they use to control this entire massive structure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is insane. Do you know how tall the whole build is? It's a little over nine feet. Yeah. <laughs> And much more fun to build than it was to transport here. Um, but it, a lot, a lot of fun. A lot of fun to do and build. Um, I always get asked how many pieces, and my answer is yeah. <laughs> because I, <laughs> I lost count right about here. <laughs> right about here as I started building up. I lost count somewhere in that deal. Um, but, yeah, and the other question that you always get asked is, is it glued? No, it's not glued. No craggle. So, um, Have yeah. there been any major incidents as you were working on it? Obviously, oh, it's, it's yeah, not yeah. a real you know, wide base here. Right. So um, the, biggest, the biggest thing about it is I started on this in November. So a lot of people think, oh, you started in November and you built the whole thing and, and it's just kind of finished. But the idea that you really have to remember is I built this in November and this right here was built in more like December or January. So when I got here... I hadn't seen how this hooked up since January. So I got here and I started putting it together and I thought to myself, 
I don't remember how to hook this up. So I had to play with it for a little while to actually get it hooked up. And then, um, and then one, and then like one piece up here kind of fell off and it hit something on the way down and I was like uh and you know it's not a big deal easy fix but it's just one of those deals when you're building something this tall and it's kind of like the star on the Christmas tree if if the star falls down it what's it going to wreck on the way down (laughs) (laughs) exactly so you showed some movement earlier talk a little bit more about how you incorporated that into the build and how that works so um all of them are just kind of this is kind of my first build with the um just the power functions I just use the basic remote and two channels so the bottom channel actually controls the um it controls the base ones and then um the top channel controls the top ones so i kind of just did that based it on that and then um the battery boxes are actually hidden inside of one of these panels so the panels pop off and the battery boxes are right inside so i didn't want anything you know to be seen or anything like that so i just kind of hid them inside there and then, um, then after that, it was just some LED lights behind some of the red orbs and inside of the inside of every one of the builds. Mm-hmm. And if you can talk a little bit more about the main structure, I think you've got an example here of some right. of the pieces you so use. This right here was the main structure that I kind of based all of this off of. And then the big piece on this was after the rod went through here, and you kind of made sure that you put something in place so that it doesn't wiggle. It's how do you hook it? to you know the next layer up so this is not a perfect 12 studs across so what I did is I put jumper plates right here and I hooked it and the weight of this particular build will actually keep things pretty steady so yeah that's how I've kind of done it is just hooking those up and then just stacking the layer on top of layer but the big deal was is is kind of one of those deals of proportion so the, the toughest part of this build was is that you build each section separately and then you bring it and you set it on top of the next one well what I had happen was is that I would go and I would build a section and I would come and I would set it on top and then I would say hey and I'd be talking to my girlfriend and said hey babe come take a look at this and see what you think and she would roll her she'd roll in there and she'd look and she said it's too it's too wide it's out of proportion I'm like ah yes you're right it is so then I'd have to shorten things up or change them up because the idea was is to build it all in kind of proportion and look so that was one of the tougher parts of the build and just making sure that everything kind of had a good proportion to it that it doesn't look like a pencil the whole way up so you want everything to kind of flow and look like it naturally and organically belongs to the build yeah and as part of that planning do you kind of do drawings or sketches or that sort of thing or is it pretty much just kind of build as you go up build as you go that's okay. that's kind of my style is build as you go you know um, I didn't use the, any of the L draws or anything like that to, to, to concept it out I will tell you that if I would have drawn it out it would look about 10 times different than it actually <laughs> turned out looking because um, in my mind I had something completely different and as I started building I said you know I really want to add living quarters I hey I really want to add fuel tanks so it would have been completely different if I would have drawn it out so I kind of just take it level by level and start adding to it and then you know at about the time I finish I think of something else that I wanted to add to it so if I ever add on to it or build something else I'm sure it'll change from year to year as I start thinking of more things to add to it or just kind of detailing on it yeah well it's a great build thanks so much for bringing the whole thing out to Brick Fiesta here and appreciate you chatting with me thank, thank you. you so much my name is Kevin Warner and I built a uh, Star Destroyer bridge and this one here, I decided to do the bridge for the Superstar Destroyer Executor. And I have Admiral Piet diving into the command pit just as the A-Wing is about to crash in. Um, I spent a lot of time working on this, trying to keep stuff smooth and getting the curves, particularly on the front end of the command centers, and then putting all the consoles in there using a lot of uh, trans tiles so I could put a string of LED lights behind so you could see the uh, screens on the consoles kind of light up and stuff. Um, The thing that I found interesting when working on this, as best as I know, on the set for the movie, there was no way for the Star Destroyer crew to get down inside the pits. (laughs) So I have created a little walkway stair steps that go down and then theoretically there's a tunnel beneath the main command walkway because it just seemed like something that needed an explanation but as best I could tell the actors probably had to hop down and climb out of those pits. (laughs) Yeah, a little, you know, imagination there never hurt to figure some things out. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it was just kind of like one of those things I wanted to make it, have it make a little bit of sense. Um, 
And I was watching Empire and Return of the Jedi like over and over, and there's also some dis number of discrepancies between the movies. But you know, it's just uh, it's just fun kind of looking through and trying to figure out all that stuff. And so then, for you've got a bunch of the consoles, control panels, and everything there. Is that all regular Lego parts, or is any of that custom printed or anything like that? Um, it is all regular Lego parts or Lego stickers. Some of the stickers have been cut. Okay. Um, I particularly was using some stickers from Maz Kanata's castle and a few other things. I also, um, some of the parts I use to achieve the curve are uh, eight studs long and they're on their side. And I just needed a, slin, a thin sliver of it in dark gray. So some of that is covered in sticker to keep the border going all the way around with the curve. There you go. So talk a little bit more about that curve and kind of the, the technique and the parts you use to achieve that there because it, it looks very nice and it really fl flows nicely in, in the whole front of the build. Yeah, so um, the main key piece of that there is uh, eight long, six wide, uh, one brick tall slope um, that's used a lot of time in roof pieces and I've got it on its side and I'll just kind of gradually build out from that, put another slope, build out from that, put another slope and then there's hooks on the outside and then it's all clipped in using the flex tubing that's connected at the uh, at both other ends and then each individual section to help kind of keep it in that shape. And it works very well. You've got a lot of gray here. So are any of these parts things that were hard to find in gray or just a lot of nice greebling and stuff you had on hand? Do you like working with kind of one large color palette like that? Um, it was definitely unique. Like I usually uh, have a little bit more color variation in this here. Uh, than I do in this one here. Uh, most of it wasn't too hard to come across all the pieces in. Uh, there was a few uh, slope pieces that I had to get quite a few of that I used for the angled uh, support beams for the windshield and uh, had to get one of those on each end and slide those in. Um, so it was kind of hard to find, I don't know, there's like 40 of those in that build and they're not super common in that color at this point. But other than that, pretty much everything was fairly easy. There is also a interior roof and an exterior uh, ceiling section. Uh, that's not on it at this point because then you can't see any of the inside, but it gives you some cool details and stuff. For sure, well, excellent work. I think it's a, a great Star Wars build. It's also something different. You don't typically just see like the command center like this. So I think it's a cool, uh, different take on a nice Star Wars build here. So thank you so much for bringing it to the show. Alrighty, thank you. Josh, I'm the other part of Lego Archaeologist. Um, Bespin was always my favorite scene in all the Star Wars, so Lego never really made what I considered a good Bespin playset. This isn't just a mock, this is a playset. It's all modular. It all comes apart to be played with. So it can be played with. I made this originally for my son to play with. Because like I said, Hasbro hadn't, or um, Lego hadn't made a decent playset for Bespin. Um, it's got pretty much every aspect, every decent scene in the whole Bespin. I mean, you've got the uh, where he finds C-3PO down below where he's all blown up. It's got the carbon freezing chamber, um, the duel. you got the cloud car. you got um, the main walkway when they're taking um, Han Solo and Carbonite to the Slave One. I initially had planned it to have another landing platform for the big Millennium Falcon because that should also be in it. But then I decided to do the living room on that corner instead. And I really like the way the living room pops. So that's what I went with. Um, you even got Vader catching the laser blast from Han Solo in the dining room. Um, the cloud car is my own custom mock too. It, it's not uh, Legos. Um, and if you come around here, you can actually see the torture chamber where they tortured Han Solo. Um, you know, when they said he didn't even ask me any questions, so it even has that. Um, there actually is another piece to it we could not display. There is the um, thing that Luke hangs on when he's missing his hand. We actually have that on the roof of our Lego room. It's Velcroed to the roof and it comes down and he's sitting up there missing an arm. We couldn't figure out how to display that here, so we just didn't bring it. So when you're building modular like this, how does that work? Do you just do each individual section and then just join them up? Well, actually, when I first built it, it wasn't supposed to be modular. I built the landing platform back. Like I said, if you look, it splits here. It also splits directly down the middle. So the first part that was made is this part out here. 
and I just decided, okay, well, I could build something to go on the back of it. And then I was like, well, you know what? I could attach something here. And then it just kept going from there. Um, and then the uh, carbon freezing chamber was just an afterthought after the fact. Um, you even got the guy in the orange there with the weird like yeah, ice cream yeah, maker. The ice cream man is running down the hallway. Yep. Yeah, I made him put that in there. I made him. I'm like, you got to put the ice cream man in there. You got to put the ice cream man in and there. And like I said, this is totally playable. So all, whoops, all the doors work. This wasn't meant to be just, you know, looked at. This was a toy. My son got a lot of play out of this. So every door works. Even the main door. Um, the elevator works. This is an actual elevator that works. There's a door there, there's a door there, and there's a door there. Um, this was my passion. So, I mean, this was my opus, I could say. <laughs> Have you done this with other Star Wars scenes, that sort of thing, where you kind of make it, you know, much more impressive and playable? Um, the landing platform comes apart as well. All those pieces that is, is attached on it. It was mainly made for display, but it can be played with as well. Um, I have, do have some other ones that are not here. Most of the ones that I've brought today have been made as mocks. But like the detention center over there, all the doors in the detention center works, and even the elevator door spins open and close. Um, yeah, I mean, everything's kind of made to be played with, but lately I've been mainly going with mocks. Well, it's great work, and I think that's a really cool idea to actually be able to play with the different sections and everything, and not just have it sitting there on display. So thank you for bringing it out to Brick Fair. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Couture. Uh, this is my uh, Rise of Dark Talent mock here at Brick Rodeo. Glad to be back in person. So what we started with here was uh, trying to design a Sith temple for Dark Talent. So Dark Talent has expanded uh, universe figure for Star Wars. But what really um, kind of piqued my interest with this was George Lucas said that if he had done the sequel trilogy, he wanted Darth Talon to be the antagonist. And so I started with making a Hall of the Sith here. So you've got some of the Sith that I posted basically on these statues. I had some custom guards made uh, and printed by uh, Big Kid Bricks. You see those uh, guards there with the uh, Sith tattoos on their uh, capes. And then you've got Darth Talon there in the middle. Um, got some decals on here. Figured that those were okay, seeing as Lego sets have decals. So, you know, of course, uh, some of the tattoo prints there uh, that you see are just... Uh, uh, made by a local uh, uh, place that I go to in, uh, in Belton. So uh, these towers here, um, that was the challenge in transporting this, was to make sure the towers didn't fall because they did crumble some during transport. I had to rebuild this part uh, when I got here, but um, uh, did some uh, work as far as uh, adding the lighting afterwards. So when I was making this, the plan was to run the lights through, so I had to make sure that I left space as far as to run the light. So this is just an LED strip light. And so ran that through the whole place, tucked it in somewhere. Um, and once I made the Hall of the Sith, um, I wanted to come back here and then make a dual room. Uh, that was the next room that you see over here. So you can see the, uh, the dual room in the center. It's a true trial by fire. So don't move too far back, you get burned, right? <laughs> so um, I've got a little uh, tower I made there. Interestingly enough, I was away on uh, vacation and I had the Lego chess set. I made that tower out of the Lego chess set. So uh, not a complete set anymore, but you know, it, it, it served its purpose for the, t the, uh, the throne. Um, made a couple of uh, kind of sit statues over there, uh, ran the pillars up, and then I made um, two rooms. One on the far side over there is for the, uh, the throne room. So those doors actually open up. Um, and then as you come back to the other room over here, uh, you've got an entrance to uh, the Sith Alchemy Room. So um, a lot of times when you look back uh, at some of the uh, previous Star Wars stories, they talk about Sith Warblades instead of lightsabers, and so that's what you see Darth Talon with here. She's got a couple of her custom guards and some other custom weapons. There's some Sith Holocrons you see here. And uh, that uh, ugly Palpatine uh, figure that you see over there, uh, if, as far as for my story for this, is that Darth Talon just four siphons off of him to draw force off of it. So that's the only role that Palpatine plays in, uh, in my trilogy. So um, uh, if you go back to the, um, the dual room over here, you've got a lightsaber crafting table there. Those are meant to be kyber crystals uh, on the table. Um, and then if we go, I guess, back over to the throne room there, um, we've got Darth Talon sitting on a custom throne. And then uh, I wanted to make sure that the, uh, the center lit up, so I ran the lights through there. And uh, that worked out pretty well. 
So. What type of lighting were you using throughout this? So it was actually a uh, just a it was like a I want to say it was like a six foot uh, strip light from uh, I got off of Amazon. So I've used uh, brick stuff in the past, uh, which works great. But because of the length that I had to run into, I wanted to get a longer strip. So uh, just runs off of uh, uh, the one cord right there. But um, you know, I planned for everything to kind of just run through. So I had to not only build an inner wall, but a little bit of an outer wall so that the, the strip was kind of buried, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, it works very well. It really lights up really nicely. Thank you. So as we come back over here, I wanted to make a um, Boba Fett starship. We'll be politically correct these days. Boba Fett starship out of uh, red and black and then uh, kind of a, uh, a Sith flair to it, right? So I had a uh, custom builder called uh, MicroMe make this uh, custom Mandalorian that you see to the side. Um, specific, I, we came up with a design together, and uh, so that's actually a custom Mandalorian, and um, he, he turned out, I thought, uh, pretty well. I got uh, custom uh, Grogu sitting by him over there wondering what he's doing, basically. Um, and so uh, we've got that ship. Um, and then as we come forward, past the temple, I want to basically make a, a battlefield so that uh, uh, this is encompassed more than just like the dark side, right? So in the front, what we see over here are these uh, uh, supposed to be dark side force nexus. So this is supposed to be dark side energy kind of coming through on the, on the ground in the snow. And I want to have a good contrast with the snow with the white and the black and the red so it popped a little bit more. Um, got a custom of a uh, couple of custom uh, Sith troopers over here that I designed. Uh, with a um, custom decaler uh, named Teos, and then I've got a custom uh, guy that uh, decals for me called Airport, and did a real good job on those custom uh, uh, figures there. I um, wanted to make sure in the front of the temple that uh, had that uh, uh, triangle that lit up in the front too, so uh, making that on the inverted side to uh, cover that was a little bit tedious, and I kind of reverse it, but uh, kind of different building techniques. It's actually held in place by Technic Beams, to make sure that uh, you know top stays on over the top of that. What what types of pieces did you did you use to make that with the red there? Yeah, so those are just the cheese slopes, and so um, you know if you keep angling the cheese slopes up, it's going to be as big as uh, what it's going to be there. So it actually worked out pretty well for centering it as far as the length, and then you just cheese slope it again, and you know just invert it down on top of it. So uh, it, it works well. Yeah, right. It uh, with those Technic pins, it stays in place pretty good. So as we uh, come forward again, I had actually built this um, orbital cannon separately a while ago. I just wanted to make it part of my mock. So uh, this is a custom cannon that I did. Uh, just like the Rebels, that Rebel base is meant to repel anything, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, ship-wise. And so you can see the uh, generators just like uh, they had on Hoth. So I made those custom. And then uh, I thought the cannons turned out pretty nice over here. So, uh, so this one was actually built before I even... Uh, had up with this concept, but I was like, when the battle feels like I got to put it in here. So I think I made it work. Um, I've also done a uh, gunship here. Uh, I'm in red and black, uh, Sith colors. Uh, just because it's like timing for episode seven, if you think of it around the times from Mandalorian, you know, Luke is still around with Grogu. So as we come to the uh, battlefield, you'll see Luke out over there against Darth Talon. So, um, and I've got an apprentice for Darth Talon over there, Darth Malavel. Uh, that's a custom by Big Kid Bricks. He's fighting uh, Ahsoka out over there. Um, right. And so uh, out on the battlefield here, you've got um, the, the custom Talon Troopers. You've got some uh, Galactic Shadow Marines from Clone Army Customs. Um, we've got some um, 332nd Legion uh, Troopers here, 332nd Commandos. Uh, and then I've got Hound leading the Tiger Shark Arfs. Um, and so, uh, of course, the, the Rebels are outgunned because, I mean, you can clearly see that uh, between an orbital cannon and the, uh, the Walker and the Republic gunship, they're probably going to take a beating. So, I mean, uh, you know, you've got a, one, ex one small explosion over there from the ad at but um, the battle just kind of started here. So, Rebels are making a push. How are they going to make it? doesn't look so great, right? So, <laughs> hope, that, hope that my trilogy isn't ended after one film, right? <laughs> Do you have plans to expand on this uh, in the future? I think I would like to. I think I'd have to think about things a little bit more because, of course, you start to run out of white base place to connect things, right? Because, I mean, you want to leave the battlefield out for view. Um, you know, and then, of course, what I want to do on the, uh, the battlefield here is I want to tile it off. I didn't want to just leave it as studs for the majority of it just so that it um, looked a little bit cleaner, right, with the snow. So if I would expand it a little bit more, I think that, uh, you know, we tile a little bit more off here and maybe have it run back and maybe expand the battlefield, maybe it's progressed a little bit, right? 
But I incorporated uh, not only the, um, the white tiles on here, but then some of the um, trans clear uh, slopes, uh, just to kind of make it kind of a uh, um, you know, snow, ice, and then of course some of the uh, dark bluish gray bricks to kind of create a rock effect. And so one of the things that I enjoyed doing about the battlefield before I even laid all this out for the troopers was I made a wampa cave over here. And so if you look at the wampa cave, you've got a uh, wampa down there with uh, some fish and some bones. Uh, there's even a uh, skeleton from an old Republic trooper down in there, so he's been around for a while. But he's actually pulling down one of those uh, uh, troopers there, um, you know, through the uh, the top of the cave. So uh, that that trooper is unfortunate; he's not going to make it. But uh, I love the look on his face. Right. I had I had especially look for that face right there. I was like, I need one of of panic, and I'm not going to make it. So I think that caught it. So. Well, it's it's a great layout. I love the battlefield and all of the buildings back here so the lighting everything about it works really well look forward to seeing more from you in the future thank you my name is rich mays i'm from liberty lake washington uh, and this is the sarah jane uh, venator uh, it's a republic attack cruiser and uh, i built it with my son uh, somewhere i think around 2012 i think is when we started it took us about two years to get it done um, weighs about 100 pounds and i don't know like how many bricks or i don't know how much it costs uh, my marriage like totally depends on me not knowing the cost, right? Uh, but yeah, this was like a total, you know, just a project that my son and I we could like just kind of bond on and stuff. And and so now, you know, we've got a couple different ships, but this one's so big, I don't have room to to keep this at the house. So uh, Sarah Jane has been on display at Fig Pickles in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, for. Uh, six, seven years now. About six days ago, I got the wild hair to come to BrickCon, and so I got her out of the hawk and stuff. Uh, you know, and so she's a little sun-worn from being in the front window, but it kind of gives her, a, I think, a little battle-worn look to her, you know? A uh, little dusty, but yeah, she still holds together, man. Uh, this is a great ship. For being that old, it looks in very impressive condition. So do you know the overall size of the ship? Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm going to guesstimate. It looks like about a six or seven foot, six foot. It's about three feet across uh, and two feet high. Yeah, It doesn't travel well. So, you know, that's probably part of the reason why she hasn't been to BrickCon and, you know, since 2014. How, how does it move around when you bring it to a show like this? Uh, it So it separates uh, into a couple pieces. The plates come off. The engines are all separate. They kind of come apart. Bridge comes off. Uh, and then, you know, you're on the road. Things are bumping around. It's, the big deal is that once you start setting it back up, you got to put all the greeble back on. And she never goes together the same way twice. <laughs> Yeah, it's just she's going to do what she's going to do. And, and I don't know if you noticed, but she only balances on a single pylon. So if you look at the underside, it actually looks like it's levitating, right? And there is a there is a, a, a ramp that can come down. And uh, a couple years back, we had a bunch of stormtroopers marching down. We had a little Starbucks uh, with a zombie attack kind of thing going on and stuff, you know. And, and so, you, you know, obviously now it's like just simple. I was just trying to get here, you know. So that's that's pretty much it. That works. I love the detailing in the back here, so we can focus on that section a little oh, bit. Yeah. Take us through some of the details here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Griebel, right? So, the, the yeah, we love Griebel. These engines, you know, these have been rebuilt a couple times, just trying to get the exact stuff. The, there's, uh, what is it? Uh, I think it's from like a 1970, 1972-ish semi-truck. Uh, exhaust pipes and stuff, you know. Uh, there's the hoses, so many parts. I've literally got a bag of just crap <laughs> that I can throw at this guy to, you know, to make those engines look the way they do. Uh, the upgrade that's going to happen, though, here in the next couple months is I've I, uh, designed some uh, RGB circuit boards that will go into the, each of the engines, and uh, they've got a little Arduino controller. They'll flare, so it won't just be blue. It won't be white. They will be like oscillating, like they're on and stuff. Um, so that's the big deal. And I've got a Bluetooth speaker that we're going to put in uh, to it as well, because they kind of want to be able to have it to do some music there at the store, maybe. So, yeah, yeah. Very cool. It's great that you're continuing to improve the build even this many years later. Oh yeah, yeah. This is yeah. This is my favorite ship. I and mean, I've got a couple other things that like are in process right now. But if anything ever happens to this one, I just come running to to work on it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. It's a crowd favorite. It's my favorite. It's it's good. 
How did you achieve the rounded shape back here to kind of make these engines? Oh, okay. So uh, those engines actually have uh, uh, are hinged, right? So so there is a hinge, and uh, and the folks that are into Lego will know it, right? It's like uh, you you'll adjust them, you can get basically an octagonal shape out of it. And so those octagonals are then loaded with plates around the outside, so they're almost hollow for the most part. Uh, and then of course on the outside is a wheel. You know, you'll notice that that that's uh, you know a, a standard wheel. But then, here's the big deal, uh, uh, those engines are so far out, they're cantilevered on a bunch of 1 by 16 uh, bricks, okay? And so that, in, that, that cantilever rail goes like halfway through the ship, right? So, so that engine looks like you see this much of it outside, it's like this long. Okay, and that whole thing, that's what actually supports that engine where it's at you know, there. And the rest of them, because they're so short, you know, they're, they're actually a lot shorter, but those ones that stick out, they go almost all through the ship. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure that, that structural integrity is very important with a build of this size. You've got to have something holding up everything in there. It does. And, uh, you know, the it, this is the sad part is that the plates themselves, they're, they're on there, they're decorative, they're hung, and they're, they're slatted, but they're also the weakest part of the ship. So this thing is not swooshable. If I tried to pick it up, those plates would would crumble right um, but the inside of it is pretty darn sturdy this is the it's just the plates at some point that would be the miracle of science is figuring out how to make those plates actually like i can hold that sucker and that they'll stay together right yeah. so, so as we move around towards kind of the front of the ship here we come to the middle section you've got these turrets on the side yeah so uh, uh those turrets i cannot claim the credit for the design of those uh i i, I found a guy uh online who the, he had focused on, you know, he had built like several iterations of these things and I was looking at them and, and looking at some books and looking at the uh, movies and I was like, wow, this guy has got it. He had it nailed. And so I literally just took what his work and, and, and replicated eight of them. Uh, but yeah, those things are beautiful. They do articulate. Um, so you can see that they'll swing around and they are axled, right? So they'll, they'll, they can aim and stuff. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're quite a cool little cannon. No, it adds some great firepower and details to the build overall here as well. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. To that, the the you know what you see here is like the classic Venator, but it's not just based on the movie. It's based on uh, there have been several books like with Star Wars ships, and this is always featured in those. Uh, there's graphic novels, uh, comic books, uh, and this has elements that from all of those sources so there are things that on this that you don't see in the movies but you see in the comics there's things that are in the movie that are not in the graphic novels so i don't know from our perspective it's like it's a classic venator you know that tries to meld all those things that people did and i love to see the building techniques in this section here and you you mentioned hinges earlier you can see a great example of oh, that yeah, to yeah. create that slope there yeah so studs not on top building right is is what all this is so uh that whole uh, assembly is based on on uh you know pegged hinges to some degree uh and then this outside part you know it's a separate piece but it basically connects uh as a you know as a rod into a brick right so so they come those actually come off like really easy they come off in three seconds the other parts, you know, like the, the panels and stuff, those are snap-in on hinges. Uh, and so to get those off, you you know, you pop a screwdriver in there to kind of wedge them apart. And they, they're held on like in three or four places. I, when I first did it, we had a gajillion hinges, too hard to put on, too hard to take off. And so just enough so that they don't come sliding off on you when you don't expect, right? That works perfect. And then... What pieces did you use to create kind of these top section okay, up there? So those are mostly plate design. You'll see that there's some wedges on the front and the back. Uh, again, these were built, uh, I would say that when I was building those, we had the least amount of detail you know, of, of what was said to be up there. Uh, but like those, you'll see that when you swing around that there are blue discs on the top. Those blue discs, uh, I don't believe appeared in the movie, but they were in the graphic novels and they were in the, the book designs. Um, and so, so we ended up, you know, hey, yeah, let's. Let, my son and I are like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna put those in there. But yeah, it's mostly plate design. There's a couple uh, clear, uh, light blue aquas in there and stuff, uh, and then just a ton of greeble on top. That works perfect. Yeah. 
And as we move around to the side here as well, you've got tons more great greebling. Uh, you can even see kind of a little bit of a, a door opening there. Yeah, so I, you know what, I probably can't reach it, but those doors do articulate sliding uh, left and right. Uh, the uh, I've never actually seen any usage of those top and bottom sections, the, the archways. I, I, I'm sure I've got to go find where those were actually used at. I don't know what kit they were from, but these were the part for for this door right they were made for this and so you'll notice too that studs not on top design there's you know effectively a, a, a singular piece that has studs on two sides and so that singular piece is the only part that's actually connected to the ship and everything else is you know based off of that and circulars around it great example of the type of building you can achieve using those sorts of pieces yeah yeah and and you know having that you know i don't want to claim that i had vision to figure it out because i i think i stumbled on that one by by sheer luck you know and it's like man i've got these things man i really should be oh you know well you know and so then we fought with it to figure out how to get them on there right you know because like yeah we're, this is going on there <laughs> So that's about it, yeah. Now, of course, another iconic part of this ship is the red strip that kind of runs through the middle of it. And so oh, you've yeah. got to be able to combine that up with the big gray panel. So how did that come together? So I love the, okay, so there's all sorts of things I love about this ship. I love red in general. Uh, and so, uh, but I think, you know, I'll, I'll say it's also the shape of the ship, but I just love red. And so when I had an opportunity to do this, I was like, man, I really want to feature that, right? Um, so that piece right there is an interim piece. We, um, when we were doing this, we wanted to originally do the sliding door. The, the Venator has a, a door that parts in the middle and to allow ships to come in mechanically very challenging to do so uh, we ended up building this singular slat piece that's held on there it's really just held on by gravity and there's a forward catch that keeps it from sliding off um, and uh, when you swing around to the very front which uh, you'll see that there's the little 4x4 disco ball uh, at the very front of that ship not in the movie in the graphic novels in the uh, some of the Star Wars books right so that's that's how we got to that front end right yeah, uh, but yeah, red. I, if I if I could put more red on this ship and not have people call me on it, I would be doing that. Yeah, yeah. you've got the great little accents back here on the kind of the wings as well. Yeah, doesn't that look right? I mean, I don't know if you how familiar you are with this ship, but I mean, when we were doing this, we were just having, you know, it's like, man, this looks right. You know, it looks right. So uh, we just started feeling it after a while, and and you knew when you were on the track of the Venator, right? You know, and, and it, was, it was like, it was done, and we are like, man, there is no mistaking what the hell this is, you know? So, so do you find the, the kind of plate stacking technique works really well to create some of that structure, like on these big gray sections, obviously, you've got to yeah. be able to make that strong enough to, to hold together. So, so they are, so they're, they're strong enough to hold together, they're not strong enough to bear weight. Right. And uh, and uh, was one thing that I discovered was that as we built plates bigger and bigger, uh, motion causes them to come off because, uh, you know, if you got two plates together, that's not a lot of room for motion. But the bigger the plate gets, you can get that twist and that twist will cause them to come off. So one of the first things that I check when we start unpacking is, you know, squishing all this together and making sure that the plates are, are, are looking good. But, yeah, strong as I'll get out does not travel well. Right, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So do you have any other plans for other Star Wars ships on this scale in the future? Is this something you're continuing to do? No, I'm not. Actually, I uh, started writing a book, and, uh, and and that's going poorly, but I swear I'm going to get it done. But in the book, I, I uh, this species has uh, an orange fish, a goldfish ship. And everybody's always asking, well, why does it look like a goldfish? And they're like, well, all planets have fish, you know. <laughs> so, so it blends in. And so at some point later in the story, they come across some race that they're in a cave and they're looking at these cave dweller drawings and they've got this big giant fish on the wall. And they say, well, it just symbolizes the importance of the fish to the species, you know, to these people. And it's like, no, he was literally painting this giant fish that he saw, you know. So anyway, so yeah, so now I'm doing big giant goldfish. Uh, and it's got um, in the center of it, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Contact with the ring, the machine that they built. So it's it's a it's an articulated ring that has a ring that spins on the inside, and on the track of that ring is also motion. And so I've actually built one of those. I've got like a mock-up of that, very noisy, but it works and it runs. Um, and that's going to be on the inside of the goldfish. So as you see it, you're going to see this thing that's kind of got this weird motions to it. Yeah. 
So lots of orange. Oh, that sounds very cool, though. Yeah, lots of orange. Yeah. Oh, and it's going to, of course, have big freaking engines, too. But I want it to be organic, right? So in some ways, you could say that these look a little organic with the, with the hoses and stuff. And so I want to get that kind of going on as well. But I want to have multiple engines, but no two looking alike. I want it to be like, you know, big engines, but I want them all to be different. And I want to have a lot of more hoses and I want to focus more like on just getting uh, organic textures and things like that out of it. So where were th will this ship continue to live then after the show? Are there other conventions okay. planned? or? Okay, uh, maybe. Uh, it is a real bear to transport. Right now, this guy lives most of its life. It's been uh, at Fig Pickles in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho for six or seven years in their front window. So if you ever you know, happen to make your way out there, you're going down Main Street, it's like at the main toy store, just uh, taking up space. Uh, and I'm very grateful for them for hosting it because I don't have room. And in fact, if I had it myself, nobody would ever see it, right? Yeah, and so instead, it's sits out there. I've got a Facebook page. People like the page because of that. Uh, Rocky Hill Shipyards, facebook.com, Rocky Hill Shipyards. Yeah, give us a like. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's where this thing's on display most of the time. And uh, five days ago, I got a wild hair to come to BrickCon, ran over there. They were gracious enough to let me take it out of the window and take her on at least one more tour, you know. I love it. Well, thanks so much for bringing it out to the show here and for taking us through the whole build. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I'm Nephi Wolf, and I did a Hoth layout for uh, Brick Slopes. And uh, I started out working on this uh, this Adapt um, Walker. And uh, it's it's the, for the, for those of the people that are really involved with Lego, it's Cave God's um, design that, that, I, um, that I built. And uh, it, it's a beautiful, like, it's a really cool Adapt Walker, but... Uh, Unfortunately, I, I built it about 18 months ago, and unfortunately I didn't find out the legs weren't strong enough to really keep it up until like the day before the show. And so it would, it, it's beautiful, like if I'm holding on to it, it's beautiful to see it standing up and I just couldn't get it to stay there. So I have it crashed and blown up and the, uh, the snow speeders are coming in and attacking it and blowing it up, but it's a beautiful, um, yeah, beautiful set. I, I love his, his design the way he did it. It's also just a massive scale, this build here as yeah. well. It's much bigger than most AT-ATs you see on a uh, Hoth-type build. Oh, yeah. It, it's minifigure scale. So, like, when it's standing up, I mean, the legs are, are, you know, like this tall. And so, I mean, you see Luke just dangling underneath that. It's just amazing how, you know, how big it is. But uh, next year, next year I'll get a chance to, to figure out how to make it stand up. Is there an interior on it at all? No, it's, it's just it, um, to, to make it strong enough, there's a lot of Technic pieces just holding it together so uh, so I can just pick it up and carry it. Great. Well, very nice. So we'll keep moving then on to the, the rest of the battlefield here. What do we have going on? All right. So so the next part, uh, just a whole bunch of slopes and, uh, you know, just building up to um, the, the snow speeders. Um, the snow speeders, they are motorized. Um, so I did spend quite a bit of time trying to, you know, figure out the right gear ratios to get them working, but uh, they are motorized, and, and so that's why everything's so tall, why it's, why it's such a tall build is so that all the gears are hidden underneath that. Um, but, uh, yeah, we have all the the uh, Imperial troopers, snow troopers are coming up the mountain and, and uh, coming at the at the base, and uh, so just have a whole bunch of them coming in. And then, uh, and then, then just a few, a few fun things. Uh, have the the snow troopers and, and Han and, and uh, some of the people they're having a snowball fight up there and uh, you know so I just threw that in for fun and uh, unfortunately it's like it's one of the farthest things away from everybody so they probably don't see that and then I have Yoda using the force to you know clean up the the driveway so he can get all the snow out of there um, yeah I've got that but then uh, you know then, then there's the the trench um, so I got all, just a whole bunch of troops in there the the you know the uh, Rebel forces are, are massing up, trying to keep them out of the, keep them out of there, and that was really fun, you know, building that area. Um, a whole bunch of, of fighters in there, and the, the the guns, just a lot of a lot of cool stuff. So I had a lot of fun with that. Um, yeah, and then I have the the uh, the tr transport ship. I built that. Um, so yeah, the tra there, there's a lot of it's 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 detailed on the bottom as well. It has all the storage containers. Um, you know, it, it in in the movie they don't ex like. You don't, they don't explain it, but there's a whole bunch of storage containers that they just um, attach to the bottom of the vehicle so they can carry all their stuff out when they're escaping from the from Hoth. So have that there, and uh, yeah, that's coming out. And on the on the front end, I uh, did did a few small things where uh, uh, Chewie and Han are shooting at the probe droid, and uh, you know they're blasting that and trying to you know trying to destroy that. And then I have uh, Han cutting open a tauntaun there so that Luke can uh, stay warm, so they can keep him alive. And uh, 
unfortunately, like, like at home, I actually had a flat surface, and this all came together really well. And there's like a half-inch gap, so the tables are like, it's all cracking apart here in the show. But uh, It's the struggles of convention display. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh it, you know, it just drives me crazy. It's like, it's like it was so beautiful before I, before I put it up here. But uh, no, it, but it, it, it's still, it's, it's really cool. I just, I really enjoyed, you know, for, for the mountains, when I was building the, the mountains, I, I spent several weeks, like, just designing, like, different techniques to try and figure out, you know, how I could, you know, how it would look best. And then I just try something, and then I put everything next to each other, and finally was like, okay, that's, that's the technique I'm using. Because, you know, I, I tried using vertical bricks, um, you know, for, for the right side. I tried using vertical bricks to see how that would look. And I tried laying them down on the side to see how that would work. And I tried one by two, or the, like the two by two bricks and, and slopes and just, so it, it was fun just to try all these different techniques and, and uh, figure out what, what, what worked best. Yeah, and this, this kind of layering of the different slopes and pieces there for that kind of studs not on top type building works really well. Yeah, yeah. It was, and it was a lot of fun to do that and, uh, you know, just to play with that over several weeks and, and come up with a technique and and it comes apart in pieces so it's easy to transport the, the hill is is like three different pieces so i mean a lot of you know learning a lot of fun things there and uh un unfortunately like I, I so i built a cave here with luke you know iced up on the ceiling and there's a womp in the back and it's like it's on the back side so like nobody in the public can see it so for anybody watching this video that came to the show it's like well, now you can see the the wampa cave that was back there it's a little bonus scene for them <laughs> that's right it's like the, the, the hidden stuff, the, the Easter egg that nobody will get to see. <laughs> and uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead. So then we're, we're entering the base here. Does the, the gate actually open and close? Uh, it, it does not. It is just wide enough to not be able to see the edge of it. I, I have a lot of Lego. I, I think I have a lot of Lego pieces. And then I went to get the, like, the black bricks, and I didn't have any black bricks. Like, and so I had to go to the store like the last minute and get enough pieces to just barely cover cut, like. So you can see the, the door, but that's as far as it goes. Gotcha. So then we, once we move inside here, what do we have happening in the big open section? All right. In, in the movie, um, there's, a, there's a, a pen where they have the tauntauns. And so I have a, a tauntaun pen in the front there. And, uh, and then uh, along the, uh, the left side of the interior, there's um, some snow speeders. They had a scaffolding. Um, so I have that all there. And uh, then the Millennium Falcon was front and center. And uh, I've got the, the troop transport vehicle they have carrying the troopers around. And a whole bunch of, of greebles and things that are in there, just pipes and things to, to make it look more interesting. Um, there, and then there's some X-wings along the, the backside. Um, well, there's there's one X-wing along the backside, but uh, yeah, and just and a whole bunch of little details. There's pipes and and uh, contain storage containers and things. And uh, and, and I, yeah, I I put the the glass edging around it, thinking it was going to be like right in front of the public, and then it's far enough away that it's like yeah, I probably should have left that off. And then we've got these rooms here as well? Correct, yeah. Um, I don't know where that one came from. But uh, so the, the, there's the, uh, the control room. When, uh, when they first find out that the Empire has is, is, uh, come into orbit, there's the control room there with all the, uh, the troopers and the, and the screens and uh, the computer devices that are on the walls. So, so I have that, that room. And uh, they're, they're, throughout the movie, there's lots of like wires and tubes and stuff on the walls. So I tried to get some of that in there. And then uh, built another room where, you know, when, when Luke gets hit by the, the Wampa, so I have the medical room with uh, some beds and things and the medical droid and have all that put together. And uh, so, so there's that room there and it, and it connects to that one. And then I have another room, just another smaller control room area, and uh, which, which leads into like when Darth Vader is invading, invading the base. So he's coming in with a whole bunch of snow troopers and they're coming into the base and, and uh, coming in to attack everybody there. So have that last room with, with some greebles and things and you know some cool stuff and in, in the, around the edges. <laughs> yeah, I, all of those great fun details always help make the build pop here. So uh, you mentioned how difficult it was kind of setting it up at the show with the different tables. What was transporting this to the show like? Because there's a lot here. Um, it actually wasn't too bad. So I, I know some people travel like all the way across the country to come to these shows. I got a five minute drive. So I just, I. I have some other stuff here where like train stuff where I have to pack it up really nice and compact to get it here. This one, I was like, I just put it on the seats of my car, drove over, like laid it out and was like, all right, there's a tiny piece. Drove home, got more stuff, came back. Too easy. That's not fair. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like I cheat, like I'm cheating because it, it was just like, 
a layout this big, somebody would need a trailer and lots of time. And it's like, yeah, I just, I went and got lunch and came back. It's like, it was no big deal. <laughs> no, that's great, though, that you're so close. You can bring a build of this size. Do you have any idea how many pieces are in this? Uh, I don't know how many pieces in there. I know that I have at least 2,000 um, slope pieces in the mountains. Because um, cause I, know, like, I know how many I built and I know how many left over. But uh, I couldn't even begin to guess. I have no idea how many pieces in here. I, I've been buying pieces for three years with, with this in mind. And so I just buy, you know, a handful of pieces here, a handful of pieces there, and then they go on to the build. I have no idea. <laughs> no, that's fine. So you've been working on this for, for several years now. Do you plan to continue expanding Hoth or maybe go in a different direction with Star Wars? Um, that's a question for my wife. <laughs> We, uh, we have an air hockey table in the basement, and I put up a whole bunch of uh, plywood on, on top of the air hockey table so I could, I, I could finish this up. I don't know that she's going to let me go back and put this all out. And so if I can find a corner of the house to store this in, then I may get it out, and you may see a bigger layout next year. But my wife may just be, uh, yeah, she's, she's been wonderful to let me do this much. We'll see if she lets me do more. <laughs> there we go. Sounds good. Well, it's a great layout here. Thank you so much for bringing it all to Brick Slopes, and I appreciate you chatting with me. Hey, everyone. Joshua Hamlin here at Brick World Chicago 2022, and today we're going to be talking with some builders who did a massive LEGO Star Wars video game collaborative layout here at Brick World. So we've got Jay, who we featured a number of times on the channel. He's going to intro the whole layout, and then we'll take a look I'm at all out. the builds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello, boyos. Rich Boy Jay here back in with another video. Super excited to present to you guys our collaboration from the original LEGO Star Wars video game. For a lot of us, our fandom of LEGO and Star Wars started with this game. Uh, so we all came together, uh, I think me and about nine other builders, and we wanted to commemorate it in a big way. So uh, we're basically going to start off with um, a build of the main hub of the game, representing some fun characters as well as some fun builds that you kind of uh, collect throughout the game. And then we're basically going to progress through every single level of the game. We have a build representing it. So it's a pretty massive collaboration we started about three months ago and honestly I'm still a little bit of emotional about it because this is the first time I've seen all this together this is also the first time that I've seen some of these people's builds because they didn't do them until like a few days ago um, but it all ended up working out so super excited what year did this game come out this game is from 2005 okay. um, so I guess yeah like some of us you know like I said started with this game some of us kind of picked up with some of the further iterations of the game but I think everyone a part of this has some sort of uh, attachment to you know whether it be this game or some of the future iterations of the game it just this is where a lot of us you know gained our love and appreciation for Star Wars mm -hmm. so who do we start with here at the very beginning then yeah so my man Playmation <laughs> right here He's going right. to go ahead and tell you about this freaking awesome hub that he created. I'm going to leave it up to you guys. Perfect. Thank you. So, yeah, again, my name's uh, Ben. I'm Playmation Shorts on YouTube, also on Instagram. I do a lot of animations on YouTube, but my Instagram mostly focuses on classic Star Wars stuff like this. So I built the main hub here. It's a pretty sizable mock. It's over 5,000 pieces on its own. It's like a full, proper, scaled mock to the game. Uh, it's got a few custom printed parts inside there, like above the counter where Dexter is, and it's got Dexter running it, which is also a custom figure. You'll see if you look out throughout the whole layout, um, lots of custom figures. Some of them are even more rare than some actual LEGO minifigures, which is super cool, uh, really collectible. And um, also, if you see throughout um, in the diner, and as well as all the other dioramas, you'll see at least every playable character in the video game. How, how many characters is that? Uh, there's 56 playable, and there's also some NPCs, like uh, you'll see later down the line on the Guggen sub, like we have Boss Ness over there. He's not a playable character in the game, but we've still got him here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so take us through kind of the build process, some of this, obviously a lot of tiling out here, kind of creating those patterns. Yeah, yeah. So the diner I had actually built on my own. Um, the exterior here with all the mini kits and whatever else, though, that was actually built at the convention here. So we set up for the first time ever here. It's got a lot of the uh, larger bricks that came in the mosaic sets underneath with lots of tiles underneath. And uh, yeah, so the mini kits are set up. There's episode one, two, and three over there. And they've all got these little borders up around them. There's like a laser field that goes up around them in the game. So that's kind of what's containing them all. And then there's the Tant of Four, which isn't prequels, but that's the super build you get for getting True Jedi and all the levels. And then you unlock a cool bonus level of Episode Four in the game. 
And then it's kind of a little teaser for LEGO Star Wars 2. <laughs> yeah, the mini kits here, um, something notable about them is that some were official LEGO sets, but lots of them were custom just for the game, like a lot of the Episode 3 ones here. This game actually came out just before Episode 3 even released, so there weren't that many LEGO sets for it. So we've got lots of different ships there. There's a droid, a uh, gunship, the very odd uh, fire ship from Episode 3. It like puts out... Uh, the burning half a ship flying in it. It's, it's so random that they include it in the game. And then there's Anakin's Jedi Interceptor, the Wookiee Catamaran, Arc-170, and V-Wing there. As well as, uh, do you want me to talk about the yeah. episode? So, yeah. Well, yeah, you can point out some of your favorites here. Oh, some of my favorites? Um, actually, the Gungan sub, I think, is a really cool mini build over there. Um, uh, that's another one that's custom for the game. Like, that's not a Lego set. So there's also the... Republic Cruiser, which is the red one there. The Royal Starship, which is another custom. Saboba's Pod Racer was a Lego set. The N1 Starfighter is another custom. And the Sith Infiltrator is also an official Lego set. And then uh, Episode 2 here, there's uh, Obi-Wan's Jedi Starfighter. That one's a set. Same with the Droidica. That's the classic 2002 Droidica that a lot of people are familiar with. And there's also a mini gunship and ATTE. And the only custom one for episode two is Count Dooku's Solar Sailor there, but that's uh, another kind of interesting one. <laughs> very unique. Very, very unique. What do we have here in the, the back of this building? So yeah, the diner, the way we have it so people can see it better, it's split in half right now. It actually all comes together as one full assembly, but in there is just like the actual dining area. So it's got a lot of chairs and tables and whatnot and something that's cool is the environments in the video game aren't made of lego but there are some little bits that are so that's something i captured in the mock most of it's uh, no studs unless there's actually supposed to be a stud there in the game so like we got the classic lego chairs making up the booths just like they are and yeah the nice tiled floor in the game it's nice shiny and reflective so that's got to be smooth and yeah, lots of cool building techniques in that uh, build overall. <laughs> I mean, you captured the look of it so nicely there, and I think a lot of the public, I'm sure, will be coming by and recognizing it from the game. Yeah, that's uh, that's the goal, really. <laughs> so this is uh, the first level of the game that you play. This is almost like the tutorial level, and probably one of the more iconic ones, just because anyone who's ever touched the game had to go through here. Whether or not they continued is up to them. So first, starting off over here, we have the main room where our two heroes Obi-Wan Kenobi and Qui-Gon Jinn are um, almost gassed to death by the droids, but fortunately they are Jedis and they make their way out of the build. Um, I really wanted to represent this section of the build because like I said, like whenever I first kind of took my dive into the game, this is the first part of Star Wars that I saw. So it was really cool to uh, kind of relive those moments and um, recreate that first scene. Uh, I'm particularly proud of the table design here. Uh, it's pretty angular, surprisingly. It's for sure the most work I've ever put into a Lego table, uh, but it worked out. I got some like nice snot work here with those uh, arches that are um, basically reversing each other and just sliding a uh, tan two by two tile in there. Uh, these chairs are also somewhat iconic because you use the force on them and it plays a very famous Star Wars song which is weird to think about because first time I played this game I probably didn't even know what that song was <laughs> um, but yeah we also got some of like the breakable elements of the game over here I think one of the like design philosophies I took with this was like in the video game um, usually the breakable things are actually built out of Lego bricks whereas everything else is just kind of like um, smooth and just designed like it would be in the real life so that's kind of the philosophy I took. I try to use a lot of like snot work, not show too many exposed studs for the realistic elements of the game. And then for the brick build stuff, I pretty much just try to build it exactly what it looks like in the video game. So if we make our way on the outside of the hallway here, this is where you uh, encounter your first enemies. You notice some loose pieces on the build. No, the build is not unfinished. That's actually deliberate. Um, you have to basically use the force on the door on, on that side, and then they push uh, the door through, and then there's just a bunch of like loose pieces that land on the floor. And I think later on, you can use the force to move them around. Uh, so that was kind of a cool element of the game to incorporate. We got some loose studs there, so you can you know rack up your money, get some of those collectibles in the game. And uh, they're being confronted by a bunch of security droids, which, as we know, our problem for these guys. I, I love that though because yeah you captured the authentic look of the game so it wasn't just another Star Wars build it was very much capturing the this the look of the game itself in the Star Wars world. 
Yeah, no, that was uh, a pretty uh, common theme throughout the entire collaboration. Like, we were pretty anal about sending people reference images from the game, not from the movie, from the game, and also from this specific game, because, you know, a lot of people grew up with the complete saga, which was like kind of like, I wouldn't say remaster, but they did go back and change some things from the original game. We were like, no, we got to be consistent with the original game. Um, so there's just small little details you'll notice throughout it that maybe aren't necessarily movie accurate, but are for sure elements that you would recognize from the video game. Hello, my name is Francis, and this is my part for the LEGO Star Wars collab. So I built Invasion of Naboo, which is pretty much the level where Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Jar Jar run through this little rocky structure. Um, you know, so I included Jar Jar, obviously. You got Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon being the iconic characters of this level. Um, shout out to Shane, or Cult of Christensen, for those chrome hilts, which I did not have in my collection. But um, very thankful to have those in the build. And then, just to finish it off, I have the battle droid. Um, yeah, you know, I just had like some rock work going on, have the leaves up here. And then, probably my favorite part of this build is the Jar Jar mosaic, which is pretty, it's like, it's a staple of this game, you know? Uh, we have some other mosaics um, throughout the collab, so you'll get to see that in the other builds. The big Jar Jar head is just iconic. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. And you've got the little mini kit there as well, right? Yeah, I, I wanted to include that just to make it feel collaborative with the entire build, just so it's like a staple of this game. And then some of the studs on the ground there in front of the characters? Yeah, those represent currency in the game. Um, there's a variety of colors, like gold, silver, and purple. Um, each has a different value in the game. If you played the game, you would know. <laughs> what do we have in front here as well? Um, honestly, those aren't mine. I don't know, but they're pretty cool. <laughs> I'm here to present to you a build by a guy named Comic Bricks. Unfortunately, he couldn't be in attendance this weekend, but he was super awesome to be able to actually contribute a build to the collaboration. I literally drove to his house right before we left to this uh, convention. So this is representing the third level of the game. I think it's called Escape from Naboo. A lot of people will recognize the uh, targets that you have to shoot on the game. That's the only way you can pass through this gate. And um, I, I love those little just small things that just evoke so many emotions from people when they look at this. Like without the targets, people would just be like, oh, it's like Naboo, right? But the targets just like like take them back to a very specific moment in their life when they were playing this game. Uh, so Comic really like knocked it out of the park with that. Uh, I think that the wall design is also very nice. For one, it's all snot. And um, he has these little indentures in there that use some uh, dark tan just to give it a little bit more texture, which I'm always preaching with Lego. Like, you're going to build a wall. Don't just build it straight up. Like, give it some texture. Um, don't just kind of, like, have to do it. Make it something interesting to look at. Exactly, yeah. I mean, you have to spend the time building anyways. May as well, like, enjoy it, right? Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, we have some of the crushable elements of the game. So we got these recognizable guys right here. They give you quite a few studs, which is cool. And then we got a, a, another one over here that you would destroy in order to access this um, racing platform. Another thing that I have to highlight is this gate back here. Um, it's made use of some pretty cool techniques with candle pieces and, like, you know, reversing direction with the, the jumpers. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on there. So um, I think Comic did a really good job. I think lastly, uh, this one is probably the first build that really like effectively uses custom minifigures. Because like I said, um, we, we want to be very particular about representing the game in its proper way. So all these minifigures are things that LEGO has made some for another. But at this point in time, like LEGO, for example, hadn't made a Queen Amidala or they hadn't made a Captain Panaka. So there's people on the secondary market. Um, I think this is like Magna Built Customs who did these, um, who are basically like recreating the video game versions of it. Because, you know, when they were making the video game, they just had to kind of create what they thought the characters looked like. And sometimes that results in a figure that's pretty similar to what LEGO has made up until now. Sometimes it is drastically wrong um, but it still has a certain charm to it because like this is like I said a lot of our first introductions to these characters now we have the most Espa pod race I think for a lot of people in episode one this is probably like one of the more favorable scenes that they have um, unfortunately this is one of the least favorable missions in the game I kid you not me and my friend were playing this level last night and we had the hardest time with it I swear like this level is a straight-up menace and if you're listening to me and you're like oh like the level's not that hard you've probably played the complete saga version of it and the complete saga they actually make the level easier which I think says a lot because if you have a Lego game and you're having to make levels easier then yeah there's probably something wrong with it because those levels are supposed to be for all ages right um, but I basically did a pretty simple build with some recognizable elements from the game I have a little booster on the ground as well as the gate with the arrows that let you know I guess in which direction you're going uh, this is the first time I experimented with this particular rock technique um, using like all the um, slopes kind of on their side representing some of the layers um, of the rock work it actually worked out pretty good um, um, it's always a dream of mine to do a big pod race mock at some point. So this is a nice little teaser for me, I guess, to see just how much I'm going to enjoy uh, 
uh, endlessly stacking these slopes. One other thing I do want to highlight um, is we have, like I said, some builds from the cutscenes as well. Uh, this was actually done by Playmation right here. And uh, this is like the scene where Qui-Gon walks into the thing and for some reason he doesn't have 500 cents to avoid the hyperdrive. So then uh, Anakin hops off the counter and shows him, hey, look, uh, pod race going on, bro. Let me in. We'll get that money for you. This is a great build, and you, you captured the arch very nicely, very reminiscent of like an Arches National Park type of natural bridge area. So I think you, you did really well there. For people who haven't played the game, what makes this level so difficult? It, it's just a menace. Um, I, honestly, I want to say the level is just broken in a lot of ways. <laughs> like there's sometimes you'll just be flying, and the game will just like like make you like swing against the wall or something. Like I, I'm not one to complain about video games cheating, but I'm fairly certain like they, they cheat on this video game. Um, there's one part in particular where you have to drive through a bunch of boulders, and it's just like the most impossible thing ever. Like it's pretty outrageous. You're also being shot at. There's also a timer. There's also another pod race you have to beat. Like I said, this is a Lego game, right? Lego games usually don't require like time limits and things like that, but for whatever reason, they really they turned up the difficulty on this particular level. I love it. Well, I'm glad you could capture with Lego. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yo, what's up? My name's Shane. I go as Cult of Christensen online, and this is one of the many builds I did for this amazing collaboration. I'm um, starting off. This is my build of the level retake Theed Palace. This is a pretty simple one. Um, basically, the floor is just a snot pattern, and uh, the only really complicated thing about this build was this um, this control panel right here. Where basically uh, the context of this uh, this part of the level I made was, um, you have to free uh, six Naboo royal officers to get to these control panels on these three N1 starfighters in order to end the level. And so I built one of these uh, right here. I'm pretty proud how the control panel turned out. And this beautiful uh, N1 starfighter was provided by Playmation uh, to uh, to use in this mock. And as you can see, uh, this is actually a modified um, version of the 2002 UCS set where it actually has a cockpit where you can fit a minifigure in. This is actually accurate to the game. I kind of wish the set was honestly like this. So it's a pretty simple, pretty simple mock. I'm really happy how it turned out. Um, as for the figures, um, this custom torso for this guy right here was provided by uh, Magna Bricks Customs on Instagram. And this, uh, this Padme right here was provided by Fig Fab Labs. And uh, yeah, pretty simple mock, and I'm really happy how it turned out. Yeah. Great figures, and the chrome is always amazing. The chrome is really what makes this look so much better than, than it really should. So shout out to Playmation for letting me borrow that. Hello, my name is Ian, or Axidroid on the internet. And here we have my Duel of the Fates mock, or the level from uh, that's called Maul in the game. And I'm super happy with it. I really like that I used a snot technique, which is stud snot on top. Um, and I really wanted to get all of the features into the game. As you guys can see, there's a health bar, and that is very, you know, very, uh, very, oh, sorry, and that's a very, you know, original thing to the game. And a funny fact, actually, is these red hearts don't exist in this color. They only exist in a printed piece, and that's um, from the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. So I had to rub all of the painting off with a rubber, and that was, uh, yeah, that was something, but I'm really glad that I did. Uh, and these are also sticker pieces, uh, stickers that I made with glossy sticker paper. And that came out really nicely. Uh, nicely. And also use Light My Bricks, which is a company that has uh, lights. So I used some lights over here and over here as well. And um, this is also something very, this is probably the most recognizable thing of, of the whole level is having the Qui-Gon with the X eyes. And that I had, to, I had to piece, so and it just all came out nicely that I was able to make this mock and I think that's just uh, one of the best parts of the muck. I love how it feels immediately like the video game with the health bars up there. You've even got the mini kit on the wall. Yeah, that was the most important thing is just having that instant uh, recognizability because if you, you wouldn't have this, it might just feel like an episode one muck and this just really finishes it. Finishes it. You got Darth Maul's legs yeah. just sitting up there. Yeah, exactly. That's from the cutscene actually, where he, the legs just you know keep standing there and <laughs> he's just hanging out there. So talk about the build technique with kind of the rounded sections because you got those angled pieces in there. That I'm sure that's not easy to achieve. Yeah, that's not easy. Actually, most of the time I would just use plates for this, but I wanted to go a little bit more out there and uh, it uses these um, these pieces. I'll just show you guys these pieces. And that way you can ha have the nice angle, but you need, uh, like every other way, you have to put an, a half a plate in. So it, it's not super easy, but it's also not that stable. <laughs> but 
I really like how it looks and it gives that really nice smooth technique with some texture as well. Mm -hmm. And then how about the wall sections? How did that yeah. come together? So the wall sections actually came out very nicely because they're really easily removable and that makes it also very uh, easy to transport and they're pretty stable and uh, this is actually something that's really just straight out of the games and it's just built piece by piece the same way um, you know the game did and these all just pop off and it's very easy to remove. Perfect great job with the building congratulations on nomination for best yeah. Star Wars of the I show. Just, I just woke up with that you know like with a message that I got nominated and that's just insane uh, to, to wake up with that so thanks thank you so much. All right, now I'm going to present to you guys my build from Discovery on Camino. Uh, I knew I was going to be building a large-scale Camino box, so I didn't want to do something that was going to be like repetitive because I was going to have to do those things anyway. So I opted for a little bit of fun with this build, and uh, we got the disco dance floor. Uh, the build itself is pretty simple, just kind of some arches uh, situated in there using snot techniques and some uh, round 4x4 white plates. But obviously the allure of this particular build is the fact that we have uh, the animated lights in the floor. Um, this is pretty cool. Um, actually, I'm going to reset this because after a while, for whatever reason, it just starts blinking all red. But once you get it restarted, you'll get the, I guess, full uh, animated effect of it. These are just some random LEDs I ordered from online. Um, but yeah, no, pretty fun build. Uh, just very reminiscent of the video game, obviously. We got the custom uh, Kaminoans right there, which is pretty topical because LEGO's just happening to release some this year. So shout out to LEGO for doing that because I'm <laughs> currently building uh, a big, large-scale Kamino mock. So, so when you order lights for a build, is it just kind of random stuff you find online, a specific company you look for? Um, so typically it's just random stuff I find online. The most important thing for me is just finding a voltage that matches up with my power source. These in particular I had to do a lot of research with because they're animated. Like usually I just have static lights, but with this one uh, I specifically needed the lights to, you know, flicker on and off. So um, I really just look for, you know, any type of like automated blinking light. I didn't want to have to do any programming or anything like that. I just wanted something simple to plug in. Uh, these actually kind of worked out pretty well. And the nice thing about this is, you know, when this mock is done, this is something that I could transfer to my larger Camino mock as an Easter egg uh, down the line. Uh, a couple other things I wanted to point out because these are some recognizable builds. Uh, we have these pesky little droids right here that are pretty never ending in the video game. So those guys are hanging around. Um, we also got Django Fett right here. Um, and that's actually a custom Django Fett. That's not the original one. For whatever reason, in the video game, um, they gave him like really purple arms and legs and a white helmet rather than a gray one. Um, so that's actually a custom made one. And he has that uh, iconic rocket shooting out of his back. For my next build, uh, we have the, uh, this is based off the Droid Factory level. Um, this was co-created by myself and Lewis, a.k.a. The Last Brickbender, who is a very talented builder. You should definitely check out his Instagram. And I am the quote-unquote co-builder in the loosest sense possible. So basically it was, I had a bunch of these, uh, I, I uh, had the build. I, 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 it was my fault. I put all this work on myself. But anyway, um, Lewis was unprompted kind enough to design this whole build for me in studio he not only did he make uh, the parts list for it but he made custom instructions that's dedication yeah and he did this in like a week and a half he's absolutely cracked at building and uh, and uh, yeah um, the one thing about this build uh, uh, was interesting to construct just like a last breakbender build it's very detailed but it can also be really fragile at times so Thankfully, I had help actually constructing this at the convention, so shout out to Big Bricks, Axie Droid, and Dalek Bricks for taking the time out of the day on Wednesday and helping me construct this, so I appreciate that. So this part of the level is right after the starting room, where basically, just like in the movie, there's this big hallway, and you fight a bunch of Geonosians, and you, you come out of this door, and then you see the droid factory right here. So this, this conveyor belt looks awesome. We just use some... Um, these uh, trans, oh, really old trans, uh, trans yellow pieces for the uh, kind of the, uh, I don't know if there's like a grate, it's like a holographic grate. And these like chains that come together look really cool. And then this crusher also like turned out really, really great as well. Like Brickbender did an amazing job on this mock. And just, this, this, this door technique is just absolutely just incredible. It was really tricky trying to get that in there. Like, he, he, in, in studio, like he designed it, where like it, it was like an illegal technique and didn't really work in real life. So we had to kind of like cram it in there. Um, but yeah, this build is just absolutely like just awesome. I'm so thankful to to Lewis for for making this for me. 
And uh, lastly, for the figures, so this uh, flesh tone Anakin head was from SJ Bricks Customs. I think that's the that's the name of the store. And this Padme is from Fig Fab Lab. So it really ties the whole mock together. So I'm really thankful for all the guys that helped me construct this at the convention because I, I didn't have time to build this at home. And of course, shout out to Last Brick Bender for making this amazing uh, mock for me to use um, in this collaboration. So. Shout out to Lewis. Thank you so much. So much great collaboration happening here. I love it. Exactly. Like people who weren't even here contributed. <laughs> so it's really awesome. Like this, this whole collab is just is so freaking cool. It really is. I'm Alex, also known as Dogma54 in the internet. And I built a level Jedi battle for this great collaboration. So first, thank you to Shane for providing all those figures to me. So I didn't have to buy them because they are pretty expensive now. Yeah, um, with this level I really wanted to go into great detail with all the wall details and like the broken parts of it. So I used the uh, different uh, brown colors, the old one and the new one, to uh, show some weathering. And also the cracks in the wall with different uh, tiles, plates and slopes for that. Yeah. And yeah, what all minifigures do we have represented here? Oh yeah, so basically it's all of the classic minifigures from the game. So we have the, the old battle droids in the sand red color, really cool. Also one of the rare uh, blue super battle droids, very fragile figure too. And then a, bu a bunch of custom figures like this uh, uh, Django and uh, the Kid Fisto custom figure. They're yeah, custom made to look like in the game. Fantastic work. How, that wall is just kind of like one stud thick, so how sturdy is all of that? Uh, well, it's not that sturdy and it breaks apart very easily, but that's great for transportation by airplane, so it's not too bad. <laughs> We're back again uh, with my third build. This is uh, based off the level Gunship Calvary, and uh, in a very similar, it, it may seem cool that like, oh man, this is a level where you pilot a gunship, uh, Republic gunship. This must be really fun. Uh, no, not in the original LEGO Star Wars. Um, it might not be as frustrating or as broken as the original pod racing level, but this one was really, really weird level. It was like isometric and it was all scrolling and ugh. But anyway, how I represented this, I kept it pretty simple. We have the, uh, the mid-scale models that used in game. These are not, the ac not actual LEGO sets. Um, they don't, it's, this is like a weird model. It's in between the full size version and like the mini version. This is what they use in the game. So, and they look both really, really cool. So this red one is the uh, the one with the red highlights. It's the player one version, and the one with the green highlights is the player two version. Um, these uh, models, um, the instructions for these models was were created by Andreas Lego on Instagram. So if you want to build these yourself, you totally can. I will say that um, this this model right here was physically built by Playmation, and I built this guy right here in this turret. Um, these are slightly modified uh, to be a little bit more accurate to the game, so just, if you want to copy these exactly, you know, just, I'm just, so yeah, just, just letting you know. Um, and then this turret right here, um, this level is very infamous for having all these lasers that you have to somehow avoid in this auto-scrolling level. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy how this turned out. You know, I just kind of made this uh, dark tan base um, which the ground kind of looks dark tan, so that's what I've chose. And this, this turret, I think, turned out pretty dang accurate to the game, except these should be uh, light bluish gray. And uh, there's actually two versions of this turret in this game. I built the one with the exposed red tubes, and then there's another version with just a light bluish gray kind of shield over this part. And then I just made a couple quick stands for the gunships. And I think that gets across the level pretty well. And uh, it's really cool seeing, like, both of these gunships, the player one and the player two gunship, in the same place. I'm pretty sure I'm the first person to actually build Andreas's model, like the player two version. So I'm really happy how that turned out. And uh, also, yeah, of course, again, shout out to Playmation for letting uh, me borrow one of his uh, one of his custom models. So yeah, I'm really happy how this one turned out. Hi, I'm Nick or Heartbreak on Instagram, and this is my part for the collab, the Count Dooku level. So basically it's the, the part where Anakin and Obi-Wan are already defeated and you just fight as Yoda against Count Dooku. My main focus was on the pillar because uh, I feel like that was the most iconic part of that area. So I started with that and then went on from there. So what's uh, really hard about it was that the candlesticks don't stick in the one by one round plate with the hole. So it's just held up by pressure from, from above and yeah also 
this uh, I was really hard to do. I did many versions to get it right, like with the different levels and how it's round. And uh, yeah, but I'm really happy how it came out. And what all minifigures do we have represented here? I love the, the hand missing as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Obi-Wan and uh, Anakin down there and then Count Dooku and Yoda. But Yoda is the only actual Lego figure because all the others are custom figures. Because the Count Dooku only came with a yellow head, but we, we had to get the, the flesh tone, tone figure um, for, for this part. The rock wall in the back is very nice too, just kind of connecting a lot of those slopes. It looks like a little precarious back there. Yeah, it's it's not it's sturdy, but it, it's not connected that much. Like only this part is connected, but most of it is like with with ball joints and uh, yeah. But I, I'm happy how it came out. I had to transport it here all the way from Germany. I'm from Germany, so I kind of build it with having in mind that I need to pack it in the suitcase. So it's a bit hollow back there, but I'm happy how it came out. Now it's time for the build that isn't actually really a build. Um, this is from uh, episode three, level one. This is the battle over Coruscant. Um, really, when I saw this build, I just kind of envisioned having uh, a pretty decent collection of all the ships. Because like, when you're younger, you know, you see all these sets kind of crossing paths in the game, and you're like, it'd be so cool to have that many of those ships. So I really just tried to assemble as many of them as possible that would fit kind of in this small space on the table. Uh, so we just have the uh, original Anakin's Jedi Interceptor set, which is actually really cool. That was my favorite. Or my first Lego set as a big Star Wars fan, so a lot of memories are held with that set. Uh, here we have Obi-Wan's version, uh, which is actually quite surprising because, like, the actual Lego set they made of this, like, the colors are swapped, but, like, the video game, I think, is consistent with this one. Um, so it's just weird little differences like that that you find with some of these builds. Uh, we got an uh, array of... Uh, Sand Blue Vulture Droids as well as Tri Fighters and in the video game I guess they were being sneaky they snuck in this uh, brown Trade Federation Vulture Droid so there's people like why is the brown one there but if you play the game you actually notice that there is one that flies across and then uh, finally we got the ARC 170 over there uh, it's just cool to see some of these Lego sets that were some of my favorite things to play with as a kid uh, here as an adult and in a pretty decent quantity. A good attention to detail there with the brown one as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I said, like, we got to have everything correct. Got to have every single thing correct. My name is Hunter Bailey or Forever Lego Studios on social media. I have Chapter 2 from Episode 3, Chancellor in Peril. We of course have Obi-Wan and Anakin pretty much trying to ca uh, recapture Palpatine who says he was uh, pretty much taken by Dooku. I don't think so. I think he uh, kind of orchestrated it. But uh, you of course have Dooku on the terrace with his Super battle droids kind of on the side getting ready to blast at them. You've got the battle droids. You have the uh, little blue container that if you hit, it exploded. Um, for this, I wanted to make sure that the flooring was fully snot and very smooth looking because it's inside of a ship. So you got to make sure it's all flat and nice and clean. So I really like how the floor came out as well as uh, the stairs and the terrace. It's uh, really exciting for me um, as well as with Dooku. Probably my least favorite uh, villain to fight because it was so annoying to fight and switch back and forth whenever he shocked you. So, uh, but I'm really happy with how this came out, and I'm very happy with how the collaboration came out. Yeah, talk a little bit more about the the stair technique in particular. Looks really fantastic. I appreciate that. So, what I wanted to do, and I was kind of going back and forth from uh, clips from the video game, I wanted to make sure that it seemed like uh, all the stairs were floating and. Uh, I was able to incorporate that with just stacking uh, or making a bunch of these layers right here uh, with tiles and just stacking on top of them, giving it that uh, floating kind of look. And then, of course, the uh, little pillars on the side kind of holding up everything. Um, those two pillars are holding up the entire uh, terrace and the stairs. Um, but, yeah, I really like how the stairs came out, um, as well as all the little details that I tried to add in from the original video game. I'm Techno Union, and this is my General Grievous mock from uh, LEGO Star Wars, the uh, Revenge of the Sith section of the game. So first, I'd like to shout out Cult of Christensen for the Obi-Wan and Commander Cody figures, uh, and uh, Playmation for that custom General Grievous from the game. So it's, it's a relatively simple mock compared to some others from the collab. So, you know, we've got some, like, the snot technique for the rocks over here, as well as the small circle, which, you know, isn't entirely accurate to the game. But I was just kind of trying to make a quick mock, you know, and I think it gets the job done. Uh, it's relatively simple, and I think it's just pretty effective. But, I don't know, that's about it. Yeah, I mean, great kind of snot building there, and you can really see the different layers of the rock and how you're able right. to achieve that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was, I was very happy how that came out. 
All right, it's me again. Talk about yet another build. This one is based off the defense of Kashyyyk level. Uh, specifically, this part of the level is right after you free the five Wookiees that go on the little buttons that lower the bridge. And you jump down on this beach, and there's just like clones and droids just coming out of the water, invading the beach, like just D Day style. And the droids and the clones are working together to try to kill uh, Yoda and uh, Chewbacca and Tarples. So, you know, they're just fighting for their life right now. Yoda is about to two hit this uh, this commander droid into bits, and uh, but yeah, for the build it's it's fairly simple. Basically, for the sand, I decided to make it dark tan because it was it was pretty dark in the game. Uh, basically, just using uh, one by one and one by two tiles and some some plates interspersed to kind of give it uh, some texture. I, I, I'm I'm happy how it turned out. It looks all right. Uh, this bomb right here, I decided to make it kind of inclined. Uh, into the ground. I think that looks really good and just FYI if you see these on the beach and you see the coins Don't go near the coins. It's a trap. You're gonna die instantly. Just just don't even try it pro tip pro tip um, For the for the for like the darker sand. I decided to use um, Dark bluish gray. I don't know if that was the best choice But like you know trying to match the colors in the games can be kind of tricky sometimes So that's what I went with. I think it looks okay. And then he, as for the water uh, I decided to use trans black. Uh, maybe it's a little dark than it should be, but I think it, I think it looks, also looks all right. Um, but I, I am happy about the, the figure placement, you know, just seeing all the, the clones coming out of the water and the, and the droids fighting Yoda looks really cool. As well as this, um, this, uh, this original clone scout walker. This is an actual set, um, but I tried to make it as accurate to the game as possible. As you can see, uh, the game has the two translucent blasters on each side, and these things are sticking out for some reason as well. And this guy's taking aim at Chewbacca, and uh, if I had to bet money who's going to win this fight, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the Scout Walker. And ain't, ain't, ain't looking good for Chewbacca. Um, all these figures are um, are official Lego figures, except for these two blue boys right here. These are actually um, blue 442nd troopers. Um, so in the, in the original game, they were blue, but in Lego Star Wars The Complete Saga, they were fixed to be green. Um, but yeah, these two are customs uh, by uh, DK Collectibles, and they look really awesome. And uh, yeah, I think this, this mock turned out all right. I'm happy with it. Uh, my name's Aaron, or 327 Bricks. Uh, this is my uh, Rune of the Jedi mock. Uh, it's the level where you are going back in the temple to find out what's happened, obviously. And it's, uh, you're playing as Yoda and Obi-Wan. And you encounter a bunch of clones, obviously, and some uh, clones in disguise, which uh, Cult of Christians nicely gave me. And um, this is actually my first ever mock, so I've never built anything remotely like this at all. So it was definitely an experience to learn a lot of it. I, I did it all digitally on Studio, and then um, just translated it. And the pillars were probably the hardest part. My friend Lucas Projects really helped me with that. That was a, a multi-day process that, that luckily he was able to help me with a lot there. But um, I mean, so far it was a fun experience. The doing the collab was just a really enjoyable time. And thanks to Jay for organizing it. And I think I'm looking forward to you know what I do next. It, I, I'm happy with it turned out, how it turned out. No, yeah. th this is great for your first build here. Those pillars, especially. I love how you've got kind of the variations in size as far as the the sections that are kind of like torn down there and just showing that inner exposed kind of blue core. Right. I mean, the blue, uh, unfortunately, it, it's with Lego, it's hard. The blue core is supposed to be on the same level as the rest. But I mean, at that point, the pieces just don't exist. Yeah. And it's like, you can't make the connections happen with the same shaping. And the rest of the pillars are, unfortunately, I wanted to make them all pillars, but the level, they're all destroyed already. And then those red bricks annoy me because they're just kind of tacky. But they're part of the level <laughs> design where you, you build a force bridge up to the, uh, the shattered area up in the top there. But yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with how the pillars ended up turning out. I love the action there as well with Yoda and yeah, <laughs> lightsaber. It, it may not be game accurate, but I, I think it's a great scene from the movie, so I was glad to translate that to the scene here. And then the, the sort of tile carpet look is, is really great too, so using all those different colors and making that pattern. Right, so originally the dark red was regular red because the game, it looks regular red, but honestly, like, Lego red is so bright, it just doesn't work at that point. So I had to, um, in the last few minute, few days of the mock, I had to buy a bunch of dark red tiles and make it dark red. And it just looks so much better, I think. I mean, the red made it look so, um, I, it wasn't even bad. It was just like tacky, I guess. 
So I, I'm really happy with the, the, the way the colors go together. And the medium blue with the regular blue, I think, blend really well. And it looks a lot like the level, which I didn't realize I could like translate that well into Lego. And I'm really happy with the, the snot sections that like destroy the carpet. I'm pretty happy with how that turned out as well. Now we have my final build. This is from uh, the last official level of the video game. This is uh, the Mustafar level. So uh, this one was one that I was pretty adamant about taking just because, like, I don't know, when I think about the LEGO Star Wars video games, some of the moments that I enjoyed the most, I think that Mustafar level is super fun because uh, it's the one level where you kind of, like, are simultaneously working with your partner but also fighting them at the same time. Um, and also just as a kid, I thought it was just one of the coolest Star Wars locations. So the part of this level is, like, you know, you end up kind of, having to traverse this giant like mechanical fork thing or whatever it is and uh, you basically jump across these platforms and you will probably die a lot spent lots of my time um, in my life just dying at this particular part of the level uh, but it was pretty cool so we got obi-wan right here uh, chasing obi um, chasing anakin anakin's doing his little somersault uh, from one part of the fort to the other this is one of those builds where, like, you know, the, the focus of it is really just the platform that you're walking on, but I still wanted to give it a nice backdrop. Fortunately, because it's like a fork that kind of crashed into the lava, I was able to basically make, you know, the base of it uh, some, somewhat detailed and uh, have it, you know, be a nice little backdrop to the build. So, once again, employed a lot of snot techniques to just have this, you know, be reminiscent of the more realistic elements of the game. One of the most difficult things about this build is if you kind of pull back, you'll notice there is just an ever so slightly, like, arc to the build right here, which is, you know, super a super subtle angle and not something easy to achieve with LEGO. Um, and it's pretty, like jank like <laughs> if i tried to lift it up right now it probably would fall apart uh, but it ended up working out like it was just you know just a another level of detail i could give to a build that wasn't super complex you got the great lava with the lights underneath there yeah yeah that was also another cool thing i wanted to do um, as someone who's just you know kind of gone crazy with lights in lego recently i was like why not do something with the lava so i literally just kind of made a base i had lights um wired into the base of it and just poured a bunch of those trans orange cheese slopes and kind of had like the lights intermittently shine through it which has actually worked out because you know with lava you have some areas that are uh, much brighter than others so uh, i think it actually looks relatively accurate all right, it ends with your boy. So, uh, I'll talk about these three first, and then we'll move on to this. So this guy right here, so yeah, this is this is actually um, based off the final cutscene of the episode three levels, where Palpatine finds poor Anakin without his legs or one of his arms, and he calls in the uh, the uh, storm uh, the uh, excuse me the clone troopers with the stretcher, and I actually tried to recreate one of the shots from that cutscene as best I could. Um, and as for the lava, basically I, um, I put a, a layer of uh, trans orange and trans yellow pieces underneath and then a layer of trans orange and trans yellow and trans black tiles. So it really kind of pops that make it really translucent. And I got to tell you, I really stretched the amount of uh, trans orange and yellow pieces I used for the lava. So I just barely got that done. I also think the rock work looks looks decent enough, and I'm I'm pretty happy for this with this. It's kind of it's kind of a funny build, you know. I mainly wanted to make this just so I can include the, the two clone troopers with the with the stretcher because that's kind of what people remember from that cutscene. All right, so next we have you know you know Padme you know Padme, but uh, we have a uh, Dead May. So this is uh, so this is right after this in the cutscene. So this is the same cutscene. So uh, little baby Luke and little baby Leia were born. <laughs> And then, um, and then Padme just randomly dies, you know. And the game doesn't really give an explanation. Like we kind of see her pregnant in the beginning of the Mustafar level, and then she just kind of just dies randomly. So um, that's weird. Um, but anyway, this chair definitely an illegal. Uh, this bed right here is definitely an illegal technique. So basically, like these are two car hinge pieces, like for for like the rims or whatever, and I like. Loosened them slightly, and I put this uh, one by two tile on each side to make it more round. So it's a little jank, but for a meme build, just for a, just a funny build, uh, I, I I think it's I think it's pretty good, and and people have gotten a kick out of it, so I'm really happy. Uh, the, the black X's on the eyes. <laughs> yeah, the black X's. Uh, you can actually get that face print from um, from Fig Fig. Big Fab Labs as well, um, and also shout out to uh, Playmation for letting me use his uh, his Emperor Palpatine figure. Um, uh, next up, we have 
um, Darth Vader's transformation. This is this is also next part of the cutscene. This is the final part of that cutscene. This is like extremely simple. So I literally just borrowed Playmation's um, uh, original 2005 Darth Vader's transform transformation set and put it on a black plate with some black tile, and that's it. That's that's all I did. So very simple. And then lastly, we have the Tantive 4 Episode 4 Secret Level. So if you didn't know, if you get True Jedi on all 17 levels of the game, which basically means you have to get a certain amount, you have to collect a certain amount of studs in each level to a true, tr true Jedi status. And if you do that for all 17 levels, you unlock the question mark door. And inside the question mark door, you get to play as Darth Vader and a Stormtrooper in the Tantive 4 in the beginning of Episode 4. And you get, a bunch, you get to fight a bunch of smiley face, um, a bunch of smiley face fleet troopers who are just so happy to get gunned down and cut down by Darth Vader and the stormtroopers. So this hallway, I'm pretty happy how it turned out. I tried to make it as accurate as I possibly could, you know, with this, this six pattern of like uh, two by three uh, tiles, which actually didn't exist at the time when this game was made. There's actually a lot of pieces that didn't exist at the time uh, back in 05. So TT cheated a lot when it came to the custom parts and parts that weren't made yet. As well as these black parts, I tried to represent as best I could. They're technically supposed to be more indented in, into the wall, but like, I'm not spending like three hours trying to like freaking uh, align this in the wall. I was like, ah, oh, screw it, whatever. And then for the floor, it's pretty simple, just uh, snot technique. And then when these uh, these little bits that jut out, there's these two black lines that kind of border them. And then uh, as for these guys right here, um, these guys have custom printed heads. These are from SJ Customs. Uh, just the uh, Lego Star Wars 1 Somali face uh, Rebel Trooper heads. And as you can see, Darth Vader is force pushing him. Uh, what's funny about that level, when you force push the, the Rebel Troopers in that level, they do like a somersault tumble, uh, which is really funny. So I tried to kind of recreate that as best I could. So uh, so yeah, that's, that's the final build. And I just want to say that um, this collab has gone better than Jay and I would have ever expected. We came up uh, with the idea for doing this uh, like back in December, and the fact we were able to get all these amazing builders to make do all these um, awesome vignettes and to do this like and especially like the fact we were able to complete the outside of Dexter's Diner. We, we I started working on that like the night before at at Jay's house, and we built the rest of it at the convention, and it's just so like awesome just seeing it. Just this this collab is just so it makes me so happy and and Jay feels the same way so just shout out to to Nick and Techno and Francis and and Alex and and Axie Droid and and Comic Bricks and Last Brickbender who built stuff you know for this convention who weren't even here and a shout out to Playmation of course just like like and, and to Hunter just this this whole display is just so awesome and just. Yeah, and I love I love that people are coming up and like, oh man, I remember this part of the game, this part of the game, and just like looking at our builds and looking at my builds and being so happy and asking questions and stuff. So this is this this has just been so cool. I'm so happy with this. No, a big shout out to all you guys for taking taking on this collaboration. I love builds like this that the public can recognize and really gets them involved with the layout. So exactly. so many great scenes representing such a great part of Lego Star Wars history. And I know Jay mentioned it earlier, but this is the way that a lot of people got involved in the Lego Star Wars fandom is through these games. So I love seeing the whole collaboration here. Thanks to you and the rest of the builders for taking yeah. us through it. And I want to just shout out one more person. He didn't build anything for this, but I want to shout out Lord of the Bricks. He provided the TV and the PS2 so we can laugh lounge around and play the original game and he provided drinks and stuff any extra parts we needed he he got for us um so he's also been like a big a big support in this as well so shout out to nate and just shout out to everyone <laughs> who made this collab possible thank you guys so much perfect thank you